Chapter 21, Getting Out Regina cursed her luck as she looked around. The castle buzzed like a kicked beehive, but the activity had a frantic edge. The gate was half hanging off its hinges, and already the first few monsters had forced their way inside. Soldiers and knights were swarming to the gate to hold it, but the walls were being pressed too, and a wyvern still lurked at the top of the keep, sending broken tiles and pieces of stone showering down. She didn't see Tim and Tia, so Regina closed her eyes for a moment to check on them. She dove into Tim's mind right away. It took her a second to process the view of the castle wall and buildings she got and extrapolate his position. When she did, she opened her eyes again and glanced at the two drones with her. Let's go. Max stuck close to her as she started running, his blade arm held at the ready. Mia trailed a step behind her. Regina wove her way through a group of agitated people without armor, then rushed down the side of another building. Tia almost crashed into her as she and Tim rushed towards them. Regina smiled at them and squeezed the worker's shoulder for a moment before she started walking again. She felt like they needed to keep moving. Seamlessly, Tim and Max fell into guard positions at either side. The battle had only gotten worse in the short time she'd been distracted. Fuck, Regina muttered, glancing at the circling monsters in the sky. Some of them looked like oversized birds of prey, but there were also the wyverns and what looked like a flying serpent as well as a twister of condensed wind that had to be some kind of elemental. Some of the soldiers she'd looked at had been at her level, but most seemed to be higher. She didn't think there was much her little hive could do here. And she didn't particularly feel like throwing her life away trying to save the castle, anyway. She just wanted to get out. Any ideas? She asked her drones. I'm not sure how we can make it out of here. They shared a look. Then Max said, the worker's ability. Good idea. Regina couldn't help but smile briefly. She'd almost forgotten about that. I don't suppose you can dig through the castle wall, Mia, Tia? Tia shook her head. No, my queen, that would take much too long. That figures. If there's a back door, we could dig under it, Regina said. Let's go and look, at least. She glanced at the gate as they went. It was just about splintered in half now, with more and more monsters trying to force their way through and sometimes succeeding. A few had gotten past the soldiers at the gate, probably either flying or climbing the wall at a spot that was less guarded. There would be no escape that way, in any case. And even if they left the castle, they'd still have to contend with the monsters outside. Why are they trying to get in so badly? Max asked. No idea, Regina said. There's the center and power source for the nearby enchantments of that defensive line here, Tim answered. A soldier I talked to said so, at least. The concentrated mana attracts monsters or something. Regina shook her head. She'd sensed that the castle was built directly in the middle of that line. Right at that moment, the wyvern atop the tower moved. She reflexively ducked and covered her head as dust rained down, sprinkled with heavier stuff. Something creaked and cracked as the shadow of the wyvern moved from the keep and landed with a thump on the roof of another building. Soldiers started to pepper it with arrows, and it roared, making the nearest ones clutch their ears. She looked up just in time to see a flame-tongued wolf pouncing at them, a tongue of fire shooting out towards Tim. The warrior ducked and it crashed into the side of the house beside them, but didn't manage to catch anything on fire. Max jumped at the monster and Tia followed, swinging her work limb at its snout like a hammer. It yelled and retreated, only to run right into Regina's magic missile. She hit it in the eye, making the monster visibly shudder. Then Max's blade ended any threat it posed. It wasn't the only monster that had made its way inside the walls, and she could tell that their number would only increase. They needed to get out as soon as possible, or they'd be overrun along with the castle defenders. Maybe they could take shelter in that village, some defensible structures had to be better than nothing. The group kept walking, moving along the wall. Regina resisted the temptation to turn to look at every roar and crash she heard. They only got a few meters before they were attacked by the next monster. This one jumped out of the shadows at them. Regina barely ducked away in time. Max's blade limb jumped out and caught the monster, some kind of dark lizard-looking thing, in the gut. It screeched, 
Then Tim caught it in the snout with another blow. Mia and Tia stepped up and swung at it as well, while Regina exhaled and looked around. What she saw made her swallow hard. There was a breach in the wall, not all that far from them. It looked like half of the battlement was missing, and monsters were climbing over the wall. Human defenders were frantically trying to get there to close the breach, but they were being harried by other monsters, and the gate wasn't faring any better. Already, Regina could see and smell quite a few bodies lying on the ground that wouldn't be standing up again. Screw it, she said, let's get onto the wall. There was a staircase at a corner tower not far from them. Soldiers were clogging it, but at least it was intact and they still moved. Regina hurried in that direction, taking a moment to check that all of her drones kept up with her. Max stopped beside the prone figure of a fallen soldier for a moment. The guy had what looked like half his chest caved in beneath his chainmail, but Regina didn't feel much looking at it. She shoved that observation to the back of her mind for later. At the moment, she couldn't afford to be distracted. Max took the sword lying beside the dead soldier and passed it to Tim before grabbing the axe that had fallen a few meters further. Regina nodded and kept moving at a faster pace. When they had the opportunity, they should look for more actual weapons, but they couldn't afford to get bogged down. Getting up the staircase was easier than expected. She squeezed herself past a human man and hurried up the stairs. It looked like reinforcements were slowing down, not a good sign. She glanced around, trying to ignore the noise of the battle coming from everywhere, then hurried along the walkway to the left, away from the spot where the fighting was fiercest. My queen, let me go first. Max pushed himself past her and took the lead. Another monster jumped at him before they could take more than a few steps. Max bashed it against the wall, and Regina fired a magic missile into its face, point blank. The monster, some kind of harpy-looking biped with scraggly feathers, screeched and shuffled backwards a meter. Then Tim and Max grabbed it and heaved it over the wall, before Regina could even launch another attack. They made their way along the wall, occasionally dodging humans and pushing off or cutting down monsters, until they reached a spot that Regina judged the best they could get. They were almost directly opposite the largest breach, and there weren't as many monsters around here. A glance down the wall showed that the river looked clear and the riverbank, which was only a few meters away in this spot, remained empty. I'll go first. Tia grabbed one of the vines they'd managed to take along and passed it to Max Tim grabbed on, too. Then she threw the rest of the rope over the wall and followed it up. Belatedly, Regina grabbed onto the rope as well. Tia started climbing right away, but her weight wasn't too much for them, especially split between three people. Regina knew the vine rope wasn't large enough to reach the bottom, and after what felt like a very short time, it slackened as Tia let go. You go next, she told Mia, then I'll follow. Mia hesitated for a moment, before she grabbed the edge of the wall and pulled herself on top of it. Regina looked around, watching a bird monster that looked like it was coming too close, then clenched her jaw as Mia began climbing. Quickly, the rope was free again and it was her turn. Regina took a deep breath, but started moving right away. She couldn't put the boys at more risk. Climbing was awkward with her claws, but she managed. There were some small clefts in the stonework where she could put her feet. Regina resisted the urge to glance down more than once and just swung her legs over the wall and let herself drop, catching herself with the rope. She climbed down until she reached the end of the rope, then let herself dangle from it, pushing off with her right foot as she let go. For a moment, she fell, the wind whistling past her, before cold water closed around her. Regina kicked her feet and struggled until she broke the surface, gasping more from the shock than the need to breathe. She started swimming for shore. Luckily, her endurance and strength were more than enough to contest with the rushing water. Something warm brushed past her right leg and Regina instinctively jerked it away. She redoubled her efforts, her pulse pounding even faster. But despite what she half expected, she managed to reach the river's shore without encountering any aquatic monsters. Regina stumbled out of the water, taking a deep breath and looking around. Mia and Tia were waiting not far off. When she turned to look at the river, she saw Tim just behind her in the water. Max was climbing down the rope, presumably having tied it down somewhere. 
she resisted the temptation to anxiously watch his progress and instead kept an eye out for monsters. She almost missed the slightly darker patch in the field just a few meters from her. But when she looked at it just a moment longer, the system gave her a notification. Field Mimic, Level 7. Regina cursed and loosened a magic missile. The green field jerked, letting her see it as the monster it was. Its beady dark eyes were very easy to miss, and the knobs on its underside looked faintly ominous. Mia pounced on it quickly, using her little blade to cut it and spill bright green blood. Then Tia joined in, hammering it with her work limb. Regina grimaced and stomped its head, feeling something deform beneath her foot. Tim joined them a moment later and when she looked around, Max was just staggering onto the shore. Thank fuck, she said. All right, let's go. The warriors straightened up and moved to guard positions, their metal weapons held firmly. When Regina started walking, they stayed in step with her. From here, she could see that while there were a lot of monsters on the plains, they weren't exactly blanketing it. It wasn't immediately obvious, but she recognized a large-scale movement towards the castle. Mostly on its other side, which held the main gate. But the river curved here, so they were actually on the same shore of it as well. Smoke is coming from up ahead, Tim said. Regina followed his gaze, frowning. He was right. Sighing, she adjusted her course to head more directly for the village. Are you sure this is wise, my queen? Max asked hesitantly. We're not going to survive long out in the open with the monster horde about, she replied. Let's at least check it out. If it's too dangerous, I'll think of something else. The others didn't say anything, but she knew they weren't happy about her heading into danger. Too bad for them that we're all in the middle of it already. Chapter 22, Still Alive From outside of it, the way the monsters all seemed to home in on the castle was a lot more helpful. Not only did it mean that there were fewer monsters in the fields outside the forest, but it allowed Regina to extrapolate their movements. She could see the patterns in the way the monsters who were outside moved, which made it easier to guide her hive to avoid them. Their trip away from the castle were the most nerve-wracking one of her life. At least in the forest, you couldn't see all the monsters in the area, even if they might be waiting behind some trees to jump you. They were also in the middle, instead of at the edge of the monster horde now, which meant she could probably expect to encounter more high-level monsters. The further they traveled from the castle, though, the lower the monster's level seemed to get. She only managed to get a blue box for some of them, those who were closest. But while they were mostly question marks at first, after leaving the castle behind them, she could read the level about half of the time. They couldn't completely avoid meeting some monsters, unfortunately. A few of them simply moved away from her hive, probably sensing that they were outclassed or at least outleveled. Regina and the warriors managed to scare away a few others. But that didn't always work. Max pulled his axe out of the hide of a young hill troll, probably about level 10, and wiped it in the grass as they finished their latest fight. Regina shook her head at how much of a difference a proper weapon made. They could have defeated the troll before, but it had gone much faster now. I was hoping I would level up again, he muttered. Soon, Regina consoled him. It's obviously getting harder at higher levels, but given how much we're fighting compared to before, our next level shouldn't be far off. She certainly wouldn't mind if Max and Tim reached level 7 too. She glanced at the down troll, then hurried away quickly. Already, she could see what looked like a vulture monster circling overhead, and a few dark shapes were also approaching. They needed to leave them the free meal and get gone. She could see more of the village as they came closer. It looked bigger than she'd expected. She'd estimated as housing at least a thousand people, rather than the little hamlet she'd imagined. Of course, that was only by medieval standards. Smoke was rising from several houses and the wind carried the faint sounds of combat. It also smelled faintly of ash, which covered whatever other scents there might have been. Regina spared a moment to be thankful that this direction was downwind of the place. It looked like the monster density was higher here, too. That didn't bode well for any defenders, even if there weren't nearly as many as at the castle. Regina looked around, picked her steps carefully, and fell into a jog. The sound of the drone's steps behind her increased like hers did and made it harder to hear any quiet noises, but that was worth it. 
she dashed across the field onto a dirt path leading into the village. The village's houses looked to have sprung up wherever there was room, without much in the way of organization, or straight roads. The outer houses all had gardens extending into the fields around the village. One of them sported a few small fruit trees. Regina barely noticed a shadow moving behind one of them in time to stop. A small fireball flew across the road right in front of her. A second later, her own magic missile responded. She managed to curve it slightly, and was rewarded by a small scream as a figure stumbled out from behind the tree. Regina was already readying another missile when its appearance registered. She cancelled the spell and took a step forward, holding out her hands. Stop, she barked. The woman across from her started, but Regina hadn't really been talking to her. Max and Tim stopped right away, and she saw Max slowly lower his blade arm. But Regina didn't take her eyes off the woman for long. Janice, level 7. The human woman was maybe 20 or 30, it was hard to tell. She wore some kind of cloth head covering Regina didn't know the name for and a dress of rough spun material that didn't look to have been dyed. There was dirt on her face and her dress, and she noticed a few rips near the hem. Not what she would have expected of one of the first human magic users she met. There also didn't seem to be anyone else with her. Calm down, Regina said, unable to suppress all of the exasperation in her tone. We're not your enemies, but you're lucky the boys there didn't get to you before I could stop them after you attacked me. The villager frowned. She looked Regina up and down. You're actual people, then, not monsters, she mumbled, as if to herself. Begging your pardon, I'm a little jumpy today. Of course we're people, Regina replied. Obviously, there was no need to tell the human that they actually were monsters, even if she suspected that would be accurate. Then maybe you can help fight the monsters in the village? The girl asked, now sounding hopeful. Regina was starting to realize that she was younger than the grime made her seem. She sighed, considering it for a moment. They did intend to enter the village in the first place. They're not strong, really, Janice hurried to say. I don't think there's any over level 10. I reckon the strong ones all went and tried to get into the castle. It's just we don't have many fighting men here, since they're all gone to the fort, too. That did sound like it would make for good experience, if nothing else. All right, then, Regina said, looking around again. Guide us to the monsters we can most easily take out. And maybe if you know a good defensive spot, too. We need to take shelter from the horde, but I'm not averse to helping out with killing a few monsters. Thank you, milady. Jana smiled. Right this way, then. Despite how they'd met, it appeared she did know her way around, at least. Janice led them into the village, through a back alley. It took less than a minute until they saw their first monsters. Regina crept forward carefully, watching as Max let Tim go on ahead to peer around the wall of a house, before she did the same. This one looked a bit like the troll, but with a squatter frame and four arms. It also had a wide maw that gaped open to show an uneven row of teeth. Rockborn abomination, level? Regina withdrew and nodded at the others. Tim nodded back before he visibly took a deep breath, then got a running start and jumped at the monster, using his charge ability to cover the ground quickly. His sword bit into the abomination's side, but it didn't seem to do much damage. Regina attacked with a magic missile, trying to target the same spot, but she missed and only managed to hit its shoulder. The monster rocked back slightly, but seemed to regain its balance quickly. Max attacked from the other direction, his axe crashing down on another arm. The monster withdrew a little, and Tim immediately followed it up with another cut. Careful! Mia called. There are more coming. Regina looked around and stepped closer to Max. Two other monsters must have been attracted by the sound of the fight and were running at them now. They both had question marks for levels and names she didn't recognize. One, a flaming fox, looked exactly what it sounded like while the rolling grass seemed like a bigger version of the mimic they'd fought before. She took a deep breath. She didn't have much mana left, but this wasn't the time to be stingy with it. So she sent a magic missile at the second monster, which stopped it in its tracks for a moment. Tia swung her left work limb at the fox, then snatched it back. Tim pivoted from the rockborn and slashed at it with its sword. 
Mia didn't miss her cue and stepped into his place immediately, taking a swing at the monster's head. That left the grass free, which was clearly angling to get at Tim's side. But a moment later, another firebolt roared out, throwing it back. The air started to smell of burnt grass. Regina glanced at Janice, who looked paler than before and had one hand clenched tightly into her skirt, before she turned to the fight against the Rockborn. It was clearly their toughest opponent. She'd lost her spear and didn't have any proper weapon, or even natural weapons like the drones. But she did still have magic. Regina focused on her mana and held the spell she wanted in her mind, shaping its details meticulously. A few long moments later, she had a little bit of lead in her hand. She'd sensed instinctively, with the knowledge the spell gave her, that it was cheaper in terms of mana than steel or even diamond. It was a simple shape, oblong, and coming to a point at one end. A simple dart. Regina centered herself and waited in her hand, then let go. With her relatively high speed and dexterity, the projectile flew true, with more power behind it than any rock she'd thrown before. The short range helped. The monster let out a shrill cry and clasped one hand over its right eye. Blood was starting to pool under it. Max didn't give it any time to gather itself, but darted in. His axe bit deeply into its knee, where its defense was clearly weaker. The monster stumbled and fell. Then, while Mia cracked it over the head, Max swung at its neck. It gurgled and stopped moving. Regina turned around and smiled in relief as she saw that the fight was over. Tia was standing over the burnt corpse of the grass monster and Tim had given the other one several deep slashes. Apparently, the flames were only surface level and it had a flesh and blood body beneath that. How did you learn how to cast that, anyway, she asked the villager. Janice ducked her head and glanced to the side. I just figured it out, she mumbled. Regina raised an eyebrow. Considering her experience with the presumably much simpler spark, that meant Janice was probably either talented or a pyromaniac. Let's keep going, she said after a moment. They moved through the outer parts of the village at a slow pace. She learned from the last time and only engaged monsters when there were no others close by. Once, they missed one and had to fight two at once again, but the monsters were both under level 7, so it wasn't a problem. Max and Tim both reported leveling up after their third and last fight, against another rockborn abomination. With this part of the village cleared, they started to move into the center. Regina decided to keep to the main road. While it might be more exposed, it also offered better visibility and let them fight side by side more easily. This street was actually paved and reasonably straight. Strangely enough, they didn't encounter any more monsters in the next few minutes. Regina frowned, taking a deep breath of the air. It smelled of fire with the scent of various monsters mixed in, but it was hard to differentiate which of those would still be alive or even nearby. The street opened up into a small open yard, which probably functioned as a town square or marketplace on specific days. She saw several people standing there. Two of them appeared to be in plate armor. Then the last one turned around, and Regina frowned as she recognized the local baron. Apparently, they weren't the only ones who'd abandoned the castle. He must have moved quickly. Hive Queen Regina and companions, Narelt drawled, shaking his head. Thank you for escorting them, Janice. Then he looked from her back to Regina, his eyebrows drawn slightly together. I am glad to see you still alive, although I admit I did not expect to meet you here. I wouldn't have expected to see you here, either, Regina answered. I take it the castle has fallen? He grimaced. Unfortunately, it has. My duty compelled me to return here quickly to defend those I am sworn to protect. Or he just didn't like the high-level monsters who had probably overrun the castle. But it wasn't like Regina minded. We already killed quite a few monsters infesting the village, she said. I am prepared to help you defend it going forward, but not for free. The noble sighed. With myself and what remains of my men here, I think we stand a decent chance of defending the village without any further casualties. But you are welcome to stay. Regina crossed her arms. We will need supplies and weapons. She glanced down at herself. Clothing. As well as food and such. Further compensation for our assistance can be discussed later. 
He stared at her for a moment, but she met his eyes calmly. She knew that she was negotiating what had to be mercenary work. Even if there weren't exactly many other places they could go, he wasn't in a position to turn away help. Fine, he finally conceded. I will arrange for a bath first. Chapter 23 Primitives and Monster Bloods Wearing proper clothing for the first time was an interesting experience for Regina, a relief, but also a little annoying. She'd gotten used to not wearing much, and her shell as well as the high temperatures of summer had made it tolerable. But now that she had the option, she'd jumped on it. Regina ran a hand down the front of her dress, frowning slightly. She wasn't wearing a bra, since they apparently didn't exist here, but her chest was small enough that it shouldn't be much of a problem. The dress was a drab brown and made of a heavy, slightly itchy cloth. It went down to about halfway past her knees and only had short sleeves. She would have preferred to get some sturdy pants, but a woman from the village had brought this instead, and she'd been too eager to get into the bath to argue about it. She glanced around the room one last time. She wouldn't have expected a bathhouse in the village. But it was apparently a fairly prosperous settlement. For obvious reasons, the building was situated directly on the riverside, with some of its water diverted into its pool. There was a fireplace to heat water up, but Regina hadn't wanted to wait that long. The cool water was refreshing, anyway. She'd left a lot of accumulated dirt and grime drifting down into the river. I really hope the village has a clean water source. Wasn't there a well earlier? Regina shook her head and made herself move. She was exhausted and felt drained. It took more effort than it should just to walk. While the fighting could have been enough to cause that, she knew the real culprits. Regina glared briefly at the three eggs sitting on the floor of the wooden room. Now that it was over, she could tell she might have been a little too influenced by her hive queen's urge to lay eggs. If nothing else, it might have been better to wait for a more suitable place. But she was now warm and safe, had had enough to eat, and was much below the limit for her hive, this wasn't surprising. It had still been her decision, and she didn't regret it. The monster horde could last up to a week. Even if they would start at level 1, getting reinforcements might be vital. And she needed the strength of more drones after that, too. She cracked the door open and glanced around. Mia and Tia had let her go first. Luckily, Max and Tim were already back from the men's section of the baths. Boys, give me a hand please, she said. They entered the room and carefully took one of the eggs each. Regina picked up the third and they carried it outside. Max raised an eyebrow at the coloring, but didn't comment. These would be two warriors and one worker. Maybe she should have gone for three warriors, but workers could also be useful in fortifying the village and gave her a different kind of clout for the situation beyond the fight. She'd settled on having three warriors and a worker, but three eggs was the limit of what she could do in one sitting. Clearly, creating them did take a toll on her body, and even if the process worked with magic, eggs probably still used up nutrients or something. They quickly put the eggs into the bags they'd been given with supplies. The boys would just have to carry those directly. Luckily, the eggs were still small enough that this worked without problems. Regina glanced around, but there didn't seem to be anyone watching them. Then she straightened up, frowning at the side wall of the bathhouse, little more than a wooden shack, and squashed the impulse to lean against it. She couldn't help her lip curling as she looked around the village. It seemed so, small. Dirty, chaotic, battered. Human. Nothing at all like the cities of gleaming skyscrapers in her memory, but not inviting to the monster side of her, either. She knew that had little to do with the way they were built, really. Her hive would be lucky to manage something like these houses, at least for now. But they weren't hers. Regina sighed and resolved to get moving. Tim, you can join me. The rest of you, get some rest. Yes, my queen. She hadn't been inside the empty house the Baron had assigned them yet, but she didn't feel the need to right now. She was still quite low on mana, not to mention the effect of her recent production, but she didn't feel like just curling up yet. So she left the bags to the other two to watch over and took off with Tim in tow. The boys had been given pants, she noticed with a bit of grumpiness. Tim was wearing a short off-white tunic over them, 
but he'd cut holes in it to allow for his blade limbs. From the way he walked, she could tell that he didn't like it. She suspected that if she let them, the boys were both going to end up going shirtless, at least. Well, she could care less. Regina had planned to wander around a little and maybe ask people she passed, but that turned out not to be necessary. As soon as they stepped onto the part of the main road leading to the town square, Janice came hurrying towards them. Well met again. She smiled. You look much better. Then she clapped a hand before her mouth. Oh, I didn't mean it like that. Pardon me, please. Regina waved a hand dismissively. You're fine. I need to impose on you for a minute, actually. Janice looked surprised, but quickly mastered her expression. She glanced around. From the way the group of fighters gathered in the square were looking at them, Regina guessed that she was hanging around where she supposedly didn't have a reason to be. All right, I'd be happy to help, milady. What is it I can do for you? Regina tilted her head, looking at the human. She'd been fully prepared to bully her into it, but Janice looked genuinely willing to help. That's good. She can come in useful. Maybe I could even learn something about magic. I should have enough to entice her, too. Show me around the village, she answered. I need to know the lay of the land if we are to plan defenses. Of course. Janice set off, with an unsure glance at them as if to check they were really following her. Regina smiled and walked down the road, looking around curiously and assessing what she saw. Unfortunately, she didn't find much to contradict her first impression. The village was probably pretty fortunate, for a medieval shithole. They could walk all over it in just a few minutes, and Regina took note of the position of the houses. The narrow streets would probably help defend against the monsters, although she didn't think the houses would do much to stop them if some of the stronger monsters decided to go right through them. Still, with a few strategically placed ditches, and maybe some spikes, they could do a lot to prepare the ground in their favor. There aren't any monsters around right now, thank the gods, Janice explained. They're probably swarming what remains of the castle and fighting over whatever they find there, Regina commented. The other girl shuddered, and Regina realized too late that that category probably included the bodies of the defenders. She'd been thinking in terms of whatever you might get from beast attracting mana enchantment materials. How old are you, anyway, Janice, she asked, partly to divert attention from her last words. The human gave her a sideways glance. It's my 18th summer this year. Regina raised an eyebrow. She really was younger than she looked at first. Probably the conditions of life here. I see. And how old are you? When Janice noticed Regina's look, she hurriedly added, Milady. Regina nodded. The villager had probably settled on that address because of her class, or whatever you called the system identification it showed. Regina had no qualms about getting respect from these, well, primitives, was a little unkind. Probably poorly educated and weak strangers? She quickly thought back over the time since her awakening, trying to count the days. I'm fifteen, she answered, simply neglecting to mention that she meant days, instead of years. Janice nodded, not looking surprised. So she really did look like fifteen for a human, then. Good to know. And you, young sir, she asked Tim. Excuse me, but I don't think I've heard your name. Tim, he answered simply. Pleasure to meet you, Janice responded. She looked at him for a moment longer, then turned back to Regina. Anything else I can help you with? Regina glanced around. She'd already seen enough of this settlement. Do you know any other spells? Janice shook her head. Afraid not, milady. Just spark. I'm not a real mage like you. That spell you cast, was that magic missile? Her eyes brightened and she looked at Regina with unbridled enthusiasm. It was, wasn't it? Yes, Regina confirmed with a small smile. That was easy. It's a pretty simple little spell. You basically just gather your mana and press it into a simple form. She explained how she cast magic missile for a few minutes while they walked slowly down the road. Janice hung on her every word, while Tim's eyes darted around, looking for any potential hidden dangers. 
He was probably listening too, though. After she was done, Janice frowned, looking like she was trying to do a difficult calculus problem in her head. Regina watched attentively as mana flickered around her. Her own sense for it had grown, but it was still difficult to tell what went on inside someone else. Still, she found it fascinating to see someone else trying to do magic. Janice didn't manage to cast the spell, but Regina estimated that with some more time trying and maybe a few tips, she'd get there. Why don't you have a class, she asked. Huh? Janice blinked, clearly ripped from her thoughts by the abrupt question. Oh. I, well, she tugged at her head covering. I was holding out, trying to get a better one. I want to be a mage. She looked almost defiant as she said that. Regina just nodded. She didn't particularly care about whatever social taboos they might have regarding someone's station and class. But it was interesting to learn that humans did apparently choose their classes, and could even level without having one, although probably not as quickly as with a good class. Presumably, there were prerequisites to meet before the system granted you one. Well, you couldn't say Janice wasn't being proactive in chasing her goal. How do you cast Firebolt? Regina finally asked what she'd been leading up to. The human chewed on her lip. Well, you also push mana into a shape, but it's a bit more, er, restive for this one. They stopped at a corner of the town square while she tried to show Regina how the spell worked. She could see people watching them, but ignored them, focusing on the lesson. Firebolt really was more complicated than Magic Missile, although it seemed like some elements were the same, and it had some of the properties of Spark as well. When Janice demonstrated how she moved the mana for Firebolt, Regina had trouble seeing it, but she still managed to get an idea of how it was supposed to move. She made Janice repeat it until the human girl was looking pale, with drops of sweat dripping down her forehead. Finally, Regina took a deep breath and tried to copy her. Moving her mana this way was hard, and she felt like she was straining muscles she didn't know she had, trying to bend something into a shape it didn't want to go. But she persevered, and it got easier. After a few long seconds, she even managed to draw the form into her hand and let it bubble to the surface, causing sparks to flicker from her skin. The protospell fell apart after a moment, but she knew she'd made progress. With a bit of experimentation, she'd be able to learn it, she was sure of that. Regina ran a hand through her stubble of hair and looked around. A few villagers who had been watching turned away as soon as they caught her gaze and hurried off. Some of the men in armor standing ready in the town square frowned disapprovingly at them. She shook her head and started looking for the baron. She'd discuss what they needed to do to get the village ready for defense, then retreat to the house her hive had been given and get some rest. Regina didn't see him around, so she set off towards the largest and fanciest house in the village, which actually had three stories and was mostly built of stone. Janice trailed along behind her and Tim. One of the soldiers stepped out of the group and almost directly into their path. You should be careful, girl, he said to Janice. You know how the Delvers feel about people trying to go beyond what they should. Or associating with monster bloods. He glanced at Tim. Janice frowned. So they are really coming here, Alan? The fighter nodded. They're gonna be here soon enough. Just take care, Janice. He shook his head, going back to join the rest of the group. Janice looked a little bit paler suddenly, Regina noticed. Her fingers were hidden in the sleeves of her dress, fidgeting with the edges. Regina sighed. Their arrangement had been working out well. She was not looking forward to dealing with this. Chapter 24, Against All Threats One day. The monsters left them in peace for most of a day. Well, more like a night and some change, really. As Regina stared out at the group of monsters approaching the village now, she couldn't help but feel that it still wasn't enough. But she hoped she was wrong. It wasn't like she only had her hive to fight them off. And they'd used the time they had well. The morning sun was only just cresting the horizon, but thankfully it came from the side, so she still got a good look at the pack of monsters drawing closer. They looked like overgrown, rabid dogs, except that there were odd spikes and plates of bone growing out of their bodies. Regina leaned her arm on the earthen rampart they'd built and glanced around for a moment. Quite a few of the baron's men covered this post, the main road leading into the village. 
they had, with the help of her workers, built a palisade together with a ditch. It was rough and quick work, but it should hold for a while. Or so she'd heard the commander saying, at least. Her hive had used the night to recuperate, although they'd had one or two members at a time out to patrol the village. Regina took the last shift and didn't move much from here until the others arrived. The evening before, Mia and Tia worked hard with the locals to build their improvised fortifications. They'd both hit level 5 yesterday and, although Regina had missed it in the commotion, they'd gotten a new ability. According to Mia, it was called Meld and Merge and it basically glued things together magically. That would be very useful for crafting and had even come in handy with building the palisade. And even better, unless she was greatly mistaken, they would both get experience for that work. That was one of the things she'd been able to confirm by watching and listening to the villagers. Combat wasn't the only way to level, even if it was by far the fastest, and classes with a non-combat focus, especially, gained experience by doing tasks that pertained to their class. In her case, Regina suspected she'd get experience for doing queenly things, leadership, presumably, and perhaps for growing her hive. She shook her head and focused on the coming fight. Behind the horde of dogs, which she could now see were called spike dogs by the system, very creative, other monsters were moving closer, too. This wasn't the occasional stray monster they'd faced in the night, but a significant part of the horde in the area coming for them. Suddenly, one of the human fighters in the group opened fire. Regina resisted the urge to turn and stare in surprise. She didn't think they were in a reasonable range already, but his arrow shot out like a bullet and hit the closest dog right in the throat. It collapsed where it stood. The rest of the pack started to howl, but they didn't change course. Other fighters joined in, everyone with a ranged option unleashing it on the monsters. Regina resisted the urge to fire a magic missile. She needed to conserve her mana today. Even without the eggs, there was no way her mana regeneration would be able to keep pace with the fights. Only two of the spiked dogs survived to reach the palisade. There, two of the human warriors captured their attention, while Max and a human swordsman cut them down quickly. Regina wasn't sure if they'd used skills or not, but they didn't get much time to rest. The next group of monsters, a mixed pack of hyenas and feline monsters, was approaching already. This time, the soldiers took fewer of them out at range, probably because their more powerful abilities were spent or needed to recharge. Half a dozen of the monsters charged at the fortification at once. One got stuck in the ditch and three tried to scramble up the palisade, but one large black cat managed to vault it with a leap supported by a sudden gust of wind. Regina thrust with her spear, but the monster dodged. Then Tim caught it in the side with his sword, almost ripping it open, just before a human warrior appeared at his side and skewered the monster. Regina assumed Tim had used his new skill. He'd chosen to go for strength of the hive, and even with only one other warrior present, the baseline buff wasn't so bad. Max used the shield he'd been given to bash a hyena off the palisade, and the rest of the pack was quickly killed as well. But more and more monsters approached the fortifications. Just as Regina considered moving her position, two black forms fell from the sky, quickly growing bigger, and resolved into large birds of prey. One falcon opened his beak and spewed a fireball right at their defensive emplacement. Regina cursed and dodged to the side, wincing as a rush of air and heat shot through the space beside her and barreled into the side of a building. Shingles flew and tendrils of smoke curled into the sky. She narrowed her eyes and focused on one of the birds, gathering her mana. Fiery falcon, level? Her magic missile hit it in the wing and sent it plummeting downward, only to be engulfed by the firebolt Janus sent up. The other bird was struck by an arrow and tumbled to the ground some meters away. Regina stepped back and leaned against another wooden wall, taking a deep breath. The frontline fighters were fighting off the current group of beasts and seemed to have it well in hand, even if they fought half a dozen at once now and were clearly pressed harder than before. She frowned and absently poked at the feeling of the mana in her body and whatever else she could sense. There were the three eggs, hopefully safe deeper in the village. It would still take some time until the eggs hatched, but they could use the reinforcements. The more the better. Experimentally, Regina poked at the feeling inside her that was the call for new eggs. 
A system prompt popped up, and Regina grimaced, feeling the exhaustion from before again. Congratulations, you have unlocked a new template, Drone Scout. You are able to lay another egg. Choose carefully what you will add to your hive. Drone Warrior. Drone Worker. Drone Scout. She still felt drained and knew that even if she could push through this, that wouldn't be a good idea. So she focused on closing the window and took a deep breath, regaining her mental equilibrium. Apparently, there wasn't a system-enforced limit on how many eggs she could lay at a time, but a soft limit imposed by her own biology. Or the mana drain. Regina frowned as she considered the message. She didn't think a scout would be much use at the moment, even if she was curious about how one would look like. This also indicated that unlocking new templates for her drones wasn't just a matter of reaching the right level, but that there were other prerequisites. Probably something like having three or four warriors for this, if eggs counted. Just then, a system window popped up with a new notification. You have leveled up. Regina blinked and shot upright, looking at the palisade. Max was just removing his axe from the corpse of a large crow monster, with what looked like pebbles stuck between its feathers. More monsters were approaching, she smelled several new scents she hadn't encountered before, and another hyena just vaulted the palisade while something big and heavy crashed against it. Regina jumped forward, trying to help where she could. Thoughts of how this confirmed that she got experience from her drones were pushed to the back of her mind as the fight continued. As time wore on, the number of monsters coming for the village seemed to increase instead of leveling off. She occasionally heard sounds and saw flashes that showed the other positions were also having trouble, but she focused on the problem in front of her. Regina had been given a spear with a fancy steel spearhead, which she suspected came from someone who'd died in the castle. She mostly used that, since it wasn't a limited resource like her magic. Fighting in a group, if not quite in formation with others, was a new experience for her. She rarely got a hit in, since most of the human fighters were faster and better coordinated. Max used the new ability he'd chosen, warriors charge like Tim's, a few times to get a strike in and take on a monster that might have attacked her, too. The palisade didn't survive the fight for long. A bigger troll than she'd seen before started ripping out posts, and some small level 6 dirt elemental actually produced earth to fill in the ditch. Most monsters were only slowed down by it, anyway. Slowly, the human and hive defenders retreated, seeking the shelter of the narrow opening where the street led into the village. Regina took to using spark to light some wooden scraps she found on fire, mostly from the houses, which were a little worse for wear, and tossing them at the monsters. She managed to distract them and even singe a level 8 shadowing stalker, burning some of the darkness covering it off and letting a human defender cave its head in. That almost cost her a hand when another fireball from overhead crashed down into the group. Regina yelped and jumped back, stumbling over a broken tile on the ground. She glanced at the fiery falcon overhead, but it was already winging away and disappeared over the village's houses. A stone crashed into her shin and Regina fell to a knee, gasping in pain. She pushed herself upward, just in time to dodge the charge of a lionet like the one she'd seen in the forest. Regina thrust with her spear, but it retreated and she only scored a shallow gash along its back. Then Tim charged at it, throwing it back with a sweep of his blade arm and sword at the same time. Regina retreated a step. Then she saw another black form darting at Tim from the side and jumped forward, thrusting with her spear. She didn't manage to arrest the panther's momentum, but the cat's lunge missed Tim. The warrior retreated. The lionet tensed in preparation for another pounce. A moment later, Tia's work limb swung at it and it turned on her, growling. Regina watched the other monster carefully for a moment, then thrust out with her spear again. The panther was just dodging another swipe from Tim and ran into her thrust. Regina put all her strength into it and twisted. She'd caught its shoulder, but the wound bled heavily. Tim stepped in and, with another combined swipe, stabbed into its heart. Then Regina felt something like a cold breath on her neck and turned. Her eyes widened. Tia. The worker was stumbling to the ground, blood flowing heavily down her side. The lionet shook its head, teeth dyed red, and followed. Regina's spear caught it in the side and it hissed, turning. 
She smashed the magic missile she'd just formed into its head and it lurched to the side, where Tim waited for it. Regina didn't wait for him to stab it in the heart. She hurried over to Tia. The young drone was lying on the ground now, pressing a hand to her side. Regina fell to her knees beside her, wincing as she saw the cracked shell and bloody mess beneath it. It's okay, just hold on, she told her, tearing a strip from Tia's dress to press against the wound. We've got this. The worker looked pale. She hadn't even known they could do that. Don't make yourself a target, my queen, she gasped. Shush, Regina answered, the others have it in hand. A quick glance to the side confirmed that. They were holding the monsters off for the moment. Regina looked at Tia's injury and reached for her mana. She would not let one of her drones die like this. She inhaled deeply and focused, trying to direct her mana through her hands into her. It was the only thing she could think of. A gut wound like Tia's might be lethal even if it didn't become infected. She didn't have any medicine or even bandages. So Regina ignored the smell of blood and worse and focused on what she could tell of her drone's anatomy. She knew a lot more about how the body worked than she'd even realized. Granted, mostly the human body, but some things couldn't be too different. Regina focused on the tissue and cells in the affected area, trying to visualize them. The various organs, liver, kidney, spleen, intestines, the smooth muscle cells, the nerves, the endothelial cells of the blood vessels and their counterparts in the intestines. She lost herself in trying to remember how they regenerated from injury before she pushed that aside and just visualized them whole. Natural healing couldn't deal with this, she needed magic. Regina felt the little bit of mana she had leaving her, and suddenly grew dizzy. But she didn't stop, eyes fixed on her target. She focused on the tissue beneath her hand, trying to shape mana and make it make her vision a reality. Was the blood flow slowing? A section of the wound slowly grew closer together, but it was such a small one. Regina swayed on her knees. It needed to be more, but it was so hard to focus. Then suddenly, someone grabbed her shoulders and pulled her back. Regina blinked. It took her a long second to process what her senses were telling her. When she did, she stiffened up immediately. Two men had grabbed her. They wore heavy plate armor, with visors covering their faces. There was another man looking at her, holding his helmet under his arm. His eyes were narrow, and she had a feeling it wasn't just the scar running down the side of his face that made his lips curl. Egon Trito, level? Blade of Light. So, you are the little monster blood they told me about, he said. Then his gaze moved down to where Tia lay, still gasping. It seems you had a turn of bad luck. Regina gritted her teeth. What do you want? She started struggling, but the two others, presumably Delvers, going by what she'd heard before, didn't move a centimeter. I want to protect the people of this village, their leader answered seriously. Against all threats that may have come to them. Oh, fantastic, she snarled. And that gives you the right to come and harass the people who were protecting them? She jerked her head back, trying to headbutt one of the men holding her. But she only struck something hard and unyielding that sent a stinging spike of pain through her head. A commotion to the side made her look up. More of the Delvers were holding their weapons at Max and Tim, who had turned towards her. The two bristled, but kept standing where they were. Probably more because they didn't want to endanger her further than because of any danger to themselves. Don't struggle, Trito said. If you want your underling healed, stop distracting us. Regina stilled. Then heal her. Trito held her gaze for a moment longer, before Regina made herself look at Tia with an effort of will, breaking the staring contest. Then he crouched down beside her. His gloves lit up faintly as hazy light spilled around and over the wound. Regina took a deep breath, watching as the wound started closing before her eyes. She could sense his mana at work, but only very faintly. It took at least a minute until Tia looked like she was in reasonably good shape, although there was still a lot of blood. She sat up and he stepped back. While Tia struggled to stand, Mia rushed forward, finally let through by another fighter. Gather them up, Trito commanded. He looked at Regina again. Don't resist. She stiffened as she realized what he intended. 
After a moment, she started gathering magic. Don't, he warned her, coming closer and grabbing her chin. You only risk your followers getting killed in a fight, and you couldn't defeat us anyway. Regina looked at the drones, breathing hard. What the hell does he think he's doing, anyway? Is he holding them hostage to get me to cave in? Would they kill them? Don't be stupid, girl, one of the men holding her spoke up. He sounded annoyed. The weakest of us is twenty levels above you, there's no way you could fight us. You might be a monster blood, but I'm sure you're smarter than that. After another long moment, Regina sighed and nodded slightly. She swallowed bile in the back of her throat and her pulse still hadn't calmed down, but she knew she really couldn't fight these people. She just needed to find a way to either convince them that they shouldn't mess with her or to escape. The two warriors started dragging her down the street. As they turned, she caught sight of the remains of the palisade. The bodies of monsters littered the ground. None of them moved. Chapter 25, Suspicious Activity Regina paced up and down the room, feeling like the proverbial caged animal. Or caged monster, maybe. It was small and cramped, but no more so than the house they'd been quartered in before. Still, she had to take tight turns to continue pacing. Rather than a dedicated cell, she was in a ground-floor room of the biggest and fanciest house in town, built of stone. It was where the baron and his family lived. Presumably, they just didn't have a proper prison in this village. A door opened from the room onto a sort of veranda outside, and she'd seen the Delver stationed there. She still smelled him and heard whenever he moved. The doorway to the rest of the house had been bricked up at some point, leaving the room inaccessible from there. These men were reasonably competent, she had to admit. She'd looked over every part of the walls and door, but not found any weaknesses. Not competent enough to put a guard in the room with her, or split her hive up completely, though. She could still sense the others, and knew they were together in the house they'd been assigned before. She suspected that with this group of fighters coming, the village didn't have much room. Maybe they thought they didn't need anything fancy, because their prisoners were so low level. Why are you doing this? Regina called to test their reaction. I haven't hurt anyone, you can't just keep us imprisoned without cause. You will be dealt with fairly, she heard the voice of their leader, Trito. Regina paused. She'd almost missed the sound of his footsteps approaching. He seemed to stop in the corridor outside the room. It certainly doesn't look like that, from where I'm standing, she replied. Look at it from our point of view for a moment, if you're capable of that, he answered, soundly faintly amused and still condescending. A group of strange and heretofore unknown demi-humans, if that's even what you are, come out of the forest, before a monster horde. And right after that, the beast horde is stronger and more vicious than normal, almost suspiciously focused, and overruns an entire castle. Somehow, the demi-humans survive unscathed and show up at the settlement that's the next target of the monsters. Suspicious, wouldn't you say? Regina bit down on a curse. I don't see anything suspicious about us being driven out by a vicious monster horde, she answered, trying for a calm tone of voice. You can't prove anything, and how would we even have done anything like that? Is it even possible? There have been recorded instances of a horde being guided by an intelligent monster, another voice chimed in. Baron Neralt. He was coming closer as well. However, I do have to agree that this is all very speculative. Sir Egon, Lady Regina has fought at our side without any indications of betrayal or mischief. Regina took a deep breath. She had no idea what was going on with the horde, although she would really like to know but she was glad that Neralt didn't seem to be fully on the Delver's side. Still, it was worrying that Trito seemed to have enough power to work around a noble on his own land. Even if he was just a baron. From the little she'd heard about Delvers in the village, they sounded more like an adventurer's guild, if one only open to humans and with some obvious prejudice. I didn't suspect her of being an idiot, Neralt. Trito sounded annoyed. But she is just a monster blood. Be careful of your words. There was a faint sigh, then she heard the baron retreating. I need to see to the defense of the village, Trito said more loudly, clearly to her. You will be held here until the monster horde is dealt with. I suggest you wait calmly, it will certainly be taken into consideration if you are quiet and cooperative. 
A moment later, she heard his steps receding as well. Regina sat down on the straw-stuffed mattress of the narrow bed, tugging on her mandibles. She did not want to just sit and wait quietly until they decided whatever it was they wanted to do with her. So she closed her eyes and reached out to her drones. They were all together, in the main room of the one-story wooden house. Regina mentally grabbed for Max's mind and dove into his consciousness, sinking into place behind his eyes. It took her a moment to parse his senses, but she quickly gathered herself. Taking a moment to adjust, she turned his head, looking around him. The other drones must have noticed something, since they had all stopped talking and were looking at him, or rather her. Regina pulled his lips into a smile. Hello, guys, it's just me, she said, or tried to. The words came out a little garbled. Mother? Tim jumped up and leaned forward. Are you all right? Regina nodded with Max's head. After a moment of consideration, she withdrew a little, giving him back sole control of his body, even as she still got the information from his senses. Max sighed and stood up as well from where he'd been sitting. I don't get the feeling that she's hurt, he said. He looked around again, focusing in on each of his companions for a few seconds. My queen, we are all unharmed, except for Tia's injury, as you can see, he said, talking quietly to himself. There is one guard in the house, and at least five outside. Some of them appear to be normal soldiers instead of delvers. They're probably busy fighting the monsters. He glanced at the others again. Anything else? We've still got the, you know, Mia said, glancing around. She clearly didn't trust that the humans couldn't listen in. Where we put them before. If we manage to escape, we can bring them along. They went through our stuff, but I don't think they recognized what they saw. I got the impression they thought it was food, Tia muttered. Regina smiled to herself where she sat in her own cell. It was good to know that the drones were all right, at least. She made Max nod and smile again, then withdrew to hang back in his mind, just enough so she was aware of what happened around him. There was no point in controlling him all the time, after all. Just as she was considering whether talking to the guard outside her room, or at least talking at him, was worth it, she noticed another change in their surroundings. Max shifted and moved to look out the window of their room. It was too small for even one of the drones to climb through, but they'd opened the wooden shutters to let fresh air in. Regina tensed as she realized what he saw. The house was built close by the water and they had a good view of part of the river. Now, there was a boat gliding down it, moving remarkably quickly. It looked bigger than the one she'd seen before and appeared to have been built of a single piece of wood, with elegant curves. It didn't surprise her much to recognize sharp-eared figures in it. About half a dozen else in total. After Max stared at the scene for a moment, their descriptions popped up. It felt strange for Regina to see system notifications through another's eyes. All of the elves were higher level than him and, judging by the class names, probably reasonably strong. She even recognized one, the forest ranger called Anuus, who they'd met in the forest. Max followed them with his eyes as long as he could, but they moved out of his field of view quickly. Regina could tell the other drones were all staying extra quiet and listening hard. Luckily, the walls of the house didn't isolate sound very well and it was built right next to the center of the village, so what was happening wasn't far away. They could hear the sounds of the boat coming to a stop and people climbing out. Then there came the muffled sound of conversation. Regina got enough to guess that the elves were exchanging greetings with the locals and were being welcomed into the settlement. The voice's position changed slightly as they walked further away from the river, and incidentally passed closer to the house her drones were kept in. With a start, Regina realized that Anuus was asking about them. She was talking to Nerald and Trito. Yes, Regina and her companions came here, Nerald said. They are still here, although Sir Egon is concerned about a possible betrayal and is keeping them confined. There was a moment of silence, before she replied, her voice tight, I see. I do not see what concern it is of the elves, Trito replied. They are not of your people, I should think, and I will not compromise on ensuring these people's safety. Regina frowned to herself at the Delver's tone. She hadn't really considered it in depth, 
but she wouldn't have expected him to treat elves the way he did demi-humans, or monster bloods. Since they were, well, humanoid. Maybe she was missing something. Their voices grew weaker as they moved on, and Regina leaned back on her narrow cot, with a sigh. She wasn't quite sure what to think of the elves. They had undoubtedly been helpful. On the other hand, there were too many unexplained things in this whole situation. Well, she already knew the elves had extensive defenses around their home, so it didn't come as a surprise that they weathered the monster horde well. She'd also expect them to keep an eye on it and the human holdings, and the fall of the castle would have been hard to miss. That they came this early suggested that they really weren't very concerned about their safety when it came to the monsters, though. After maybe an hour, when Regina was considering taking a nap to keep her strength up and escape the boredom and unhelpful musings, something moved near the drones. She sat up again and focused on her connection to Max, which she'd left half open in the back of her mind. His obvious agitation now bled into her sense. Regina blinked in her own body. There was suddenly a person standing outside the house, right by the, the window, probably looking at the drones. She, or rather Max, couldn't see anyone, but they smelled them, the soft scent of leaves and an almost electric tingle she'd come to associate with the elves, and heard them clearing their throat. Please don't be alarmed, the elf said softly. The voice sounded female, but wasn't familiar. She spoke quietly enough that the human guards probably couldn't hear. We simply wanted to make sure you were all right. Regina took control again and tried to answer, but her words came out slurred. Frustrated, she retreated a little again, letting Max back in. When we're out of here, I'm going to practice speaking through all of my drones, she resolved. I should have done that before. We are fine so far, thank you, Max answered instead. However, our queen has been separated from us. Do you know where she is? Max hesitated. Regina nodded his head and pointed his finger in the exact direction where she was kept. Then she jumped into Tim, enduring the disorientation for a moment, and moved his arms to draw a rough map on the ground. Luckily, Max caught on quickly. She's in the manor house, in a room on the ground floor to the northeast, he said. Regina couldn't see the elf's expression, but from the short pause, it was clear the woman was surprised at what they did. Well, she finally said. Is there anything we can do for you? Regina switched again and scribbled on the ground with Mia's work limb, thankful that it was just packed dirt and not stone or anything. She knew she was showing the elves one of the cards she'd kept up her sleeve, but under the circumstances, that seemed worth the risk. Can you please help us escape? Max asked. He looked at her and widened his eyes, putting on an expression that abruptly reminded Regina how much like a kid he looked. The elven woman again remained quiet for a few seconds before answering. I cannot promise you much, children. However, we have little love for the Delvers, and this would not be the first time we are helping someone unfortunately caught in their clutches. If you are able to act alone well enough to have a chance, we might be able to assist you. Regina smiled. She didn't have a finished plan, but she did have a few ideas, and a few assets she could leverage. It was frustrating trying to communicate them via short scribbles, and took longer than she wanted but finally she thought she was getting the key ideas across. I see, the elf replied, and Regina pictured her nodding decisively. We should certainly manage to distract them for you, if nothing else. She paused for a moment. I will have to check with the others, you understand, but I am confident that if you are able to get out, we can also take you to safety from there. There is more to talk about, but Annuus will speak to you if this endeavor succeeds. Thank you very much, ma'am, Max replied politely. Regina stood up, taking a moment to find her balance, with most of her attention still tethered to Mia's consciousness. That promised to be interesting. Chapter 26, Ready to Go The sun slowly moved across the sky, and although Regina didn't have a clock, she could tell the passage of time by the activity of the people in the village. There was a guard shift change at some point and it seemed like more delvers trickled into the central part of the settlement. And then, of course, there were the elves. Luckily, they had no intention of leaving soon. Regina had to stop herself from pacing and checking on their progress all the time. While she kept half of her attention with the drones, she tried to be unobtrusive and let them work, 
rather than taking control of one. The only ones really working were the drone workers. Mia and Tia had been at it for what felt like hours already and were clearly feeling the strain, but they grimly persevered. The key to Regina's idea was their ability to dig. Their class skill, ground evacuation, was perfectly suited for the task. So, the both of them were making a tunnel, trying to dig as quietly as possible. It only had to be wide enough for one of them to crawl, but that meant it did still have to fit a person. They were also careful about the floor of the room they were in and trying to stabilize the tunnel so it didn't collapse. You had to reach a certain depth for that. Not to mention avoiding the foundations of the house. So far, they'd managed to keep their efforts secret from the guards. It helped that those didn't seem to be professional soldiers, or at least not used to keeping prisoners. Regina had the impression they were distracted by the visit of the elves and their comrades' fight against the monsters. She'd heard the occasional sounds of combat, but only rarely, and only for a short time. Given that that noise was probably only what reached her across some distance, the sounds had to be deafening close up. She wouldn't bet against monsters with sound-based attacks, though. In any case, this told her that the fighting was still ongoing. They were still only a few days into the monster horde, and it would probably continue for a while longer. Under the circumstances, she was almost glad of it. If they tried to escape and were stopped, it would only make things worse. But she'd heard the way Trito spoke of so-called monster bloods. She didn't trust in his professionalism, and objectivity would be a pipe dream anyway. No one seemed particularly interested in finding facts or proof of anything. Why would he let a little thing like lack of evidence stand in his way? She heard a loud noise from the others and froze, focusing more of her attention on them. Currently, she was watching through Tim's eyes. That left Max, as the unspoken leader of the group, free to talk and act, while still giving her a close viewpoint and not bothering the girls at work. At least Tim didn't seem to mind at all. None of them did, now that she thought about it. There was another crash outside, and then loud voices. Someone else came, a higher-pitched voice. The conversation faded as they moved farther away. Then Regina realized with a start that the loud argument was coming towards her. She could now hear it more clearly with her own ears. Frowning, she shakily stood up and crossed the room to the door, trying to see whatever she could and listen closely. At least she was getting better at handling input from different consciousnesses at the same time. Then the shutters on the small window in her room moved. Regina's eyes widened, and she rushed over to quietly open it a little. They hadn't been closed completely, presumably to let in some air, so it was easy. She took a deep breath and listened hard. The guard was obviously distracted, and the loud argument of people moving down the street right by the house covered for any suspicious sounds. An elf stood in front of the window. She could smell them. It seemed like the same woman who'd visited the others. Presumably the rogue or spy of the group. Regina smiled in her general direction and nodded slightly. Then a roundish brown object appeared. She blinked in surprise as it moved through the window, then quickly grabbed it. Regina mouthed thank you at the elf, but the woman started moving away immediately. Frowning, Regina looked down at the object. It was about the size of a small apple. She closed the window carefully, then held it up and looked closer. After a moment, she bit into it. It was pretty ingenious, really. A way to store and consume potions that didn't leave any traces behind. The outer layer reminded her a bit of a cracker in taste and consistency. After she carefully started eating away at it, she saw the blue liquid inside. Regina sipped on it, but it only tasted like water then resumed eating the covering. This wasn't very sanitary, but she had bigger problems. Maybe this wouldn't work for everyone, but so far, her people seemed to be able to eat pretty much anything. Regina finished it off, then called up her status and watched as her mana started climbing upwards. After a while, it was almost full again, at 150 out of 160. She grinned to herself. She felt a lot better already. Then she turned around and checked out the room once more. She quickly ruled out the door into the building as an escape route. It was barricaded too tightly. Even if she could open it up, it would attract too much attention. That left the window and the back door to the outside. 
The door was locked, but she had ways of getting around that. Regina focused on her mana and quickly cast a lesser basic conjuration. The spell gave her a small, thin rod of iron about as long as her hand. She grinned and started poking around inside the lock of the door. They clearly hadn't used any kind of magic to secure it, and technologically advanced, this place was not. That affected things like locking mechanisms as well. Regina knew that a modern lock from the world of her memories would have been impossible for her to pick like this, but this one should be doable. She still had to poke around in it for a bit before realizing she wasn't getting anywhere. Then she withdrew her bit of iron and focused for a moment to conjure a second, smaller one. This one she formed so it was vaguely T-shaped, with smaller bits on the end, which made it look more like a key. She had a good enough idea of the dimensions of the lock to make it fit. Then she inserted it and carefully tested to see if she could open the door. Once she was sure she could get out, she paused and listened. The guard might not be a professional, but he'd notice when she opened the door. So she took a mental step back and focused on her hive. The guard in the other room of their house still hadn't moved, and from his regular breathing, he was probably taking a nap. She would call it unprofessional, but given that this was one of the actual soldiers, probably one of the baron's men, and not a delver, that would be ironic. She appreciated it anyway. Tia and Mia were just putting the finishing touches on the tunnel. Regina smiled and slipped deeper into Tim's consciousness again. I'm ready to go, she said. This time, it was even vaguely understandable. The drones looked excited. All right, let's do this. Max was clearly trying to psych himself up, or maybe the others. He insisted on going first, and Regina didn't stop him. He crawled through the tunnel, then carefully poked his head out. Seeing that the coast was clear, he scrambled out, with Mia following him right away. They picked a spot where a side alley dead-ended along the walls of some houses. Given the current situation, no one should be paying any attention to it. Regina still waited with bated breath as her hive climbed out of the tunnel. The hardest thing was taking the eggs out. They were still growing and almost bursting the seams of the bags they'd put them in, and trying to push them through a narrow tunnel wasn't easy. But they managed it in time. Once the drones were safely out of their prison, Regina took a deep breath, then turned back to her door. She waited, frowning to herself. If the elves abandoned them now. But a tense minute later, the real distraction started. She heard raised voices, wordless shouts and exclamations. The roar of a monster, which sounded deeper than a wyvern, followed. And a few seconds later, the raised voices from closer to her own position escalated into a shouting match. Regina opened the door, trying to be quiet, but mostly going for speed. She only took a moment to grasp the scene outside before she rushed through it. The guard outside her door had looked away to watch the brewing fight between two of the elven guests and some of the delvers. He was just turning back towards her, but Regina didn't give him any time to react. She barreled into him, pressing the shaft of his pole arm between them so he couldn't use it. Then she got her arm around his throat and started squeezing. The delver was wearing his helmet, but no gorget. He bucked and tried to get her off, but although he was clearly much stronger than her, he couldn't use his strength to his full advantage like this. Regina kept choking him out, dragging his body backwards once his struggles started slowing down. Killing him might have been easier, but she didn't need to make the humans any angrier than she had to. Once she was sure that the man wasn't just feigning, she released him and propped him up against the side of the building, taking his weapon. It looked a bit like a war axe, combined with a normal spear. Regina slipped into the alley beside the building, breathing a sigh of relief. That could have gone worse. Then she froze. There, further in the alley, stood another person. I knew I heard something, Jana said. The villager slowly moved closer, frowning at Regina. It was the same expression she'd worn when considering a magic-related question. Stop right there, Regina said. If you don't want this situation to get worse, you'll just let me pass. No one needs to know you ever saw me. Jana stopped. Why would it get worse? Because I can kill you before any of the Delvers get here, if you yell for them. Janice made a face. I wouldn't have done that anyway. 
she took a step to the side, pressing herself against the wall of the alley. You should probably hurry, milady. Regina hesitated for a moment, before she got moving again. She paused as she passed Janice. The girl's demeanor had changed a little. Now, Regina inhaled a deep breath. There was something about her scent that felt weird, or at least not like the other humans in the village. Why, Janice, she asked. Janice shrugged. Of course I'm on your side. These delvers are prigs, and you don't deserve the way they've treated you. She frowned. Not that others do. All right. If you really want to help, then go down the street to the other delvers, make sure they're distracted. Regina hesitated for a moment. Once I'm established somewhere, maybe we can continue that talk about magic. Jana smiled at her, then bowed her head and turned away. Regina heard her leave and the sound of her steps speed up as she started jogging, while she did the same. She tried to stay out of anywhere people might be watching, but it only took Regina a minute to reach the spot on the outside of the village where her hive was waiting for her. She untensed slightly as she joined them. A quick look confirmed that everything was as it should be. Catch up later, she said. We need to hurry. Let's go. The drones fell into step behind her seamlessly, with Tim and the girls carrying one of the bags each. They reached the river at the edge of the village quickly. Two cloaked figures already waited for them there. Once Regina approached, they lowered their hoods and Regina recognized two of the elves. Good, you're here, the man greeted them. A forest scout called Bionorn, according to the system. Get in. The others will catch up quickly. A shimmering in the air suddenly appeared and faded after a second, and Regina got the faint sense of magic being present. Then a small wooden boat became visible in the river, pulled up on the shore right between the elves. The first one jumped in without waiting for a reply. Regina followed him in, then helped Mia climb in as well. The boat was packed full with all of them, but the elves didn't seem to care. The second man pushed it off the shore and it quickly started moving. A faint wind began to rise, and Regina sensed an intricate layering of mana as the boat got moving upriver. Then a shout came from behind them. She turned around and froze as she saw the people standing on the riverbank. A few delvers, and Trito's scarred face in the lead. He started running, and even as the distance to the village visibly increased, he kept pace with the boat. Just as he left the outskirts of the village, a dark form dove from the sky. Regina winced slightly as she watched the wyvern crash down on the man. The delver lit up with light just before they collided. Regina scooted closer to the edge, trying to make out more details, although the boat was turning as it followed a bend in the river. Just before they got too far away to see clearly, she watched the wyvern shudder and fall to the side, where it lay unmoving. The sword of light, still glowing faintly, still stood. He didn't continue chasing them, and she quickly lost sight of him and the other delvers. Chapter 27, Strategic Advantages and Space to Grow Regina kept glancing back, looking for anyone who might be following them. The boat slowed down, not going quite as fast as during their escape. Everything seemed still and silent behind them except for the monsters. After a while, when the trees made it hard to see anything, she came to the conclusion that they weren't followed. Or if they were, she wouldn't be able to detect their pursuers anyway. So she turned her full attention to her more immediate surroundings. The boat was cramped, with the drones almost sitting in each other's laps. The elves clearly tried to keep some distance, even if it was hard under these circumstances. Thank you for that, Regina said. What about the others? Your companions, I mean? They shouldn't be far behind us, Bionorn, the elf who'd spoken before, replied. The boat slowed down further, and eventually drifted to the side until it almost beached on the riverbank. Regina frowned and glanced around. They were in the outskirts of the forest now, and while she still saw monsters around, none of them got close to their group. Maybe one of the elves was using a skill for that. After a few minutes, she jumped as something bumped the boat. Regina blinked in surprise when she saw the figures coming out of the trees. I was only looking away for a moment. The elves on the boat stood up, and Regina followed suit after a second. Hesitantly, she stepped out of the boat and onto the rocky shore of the river. 
She stumbled and hurried a few steps away, where the ground wasn't as wet and slippery. The elves backed away enough to keep the space around her open. It's good to see you all made it out unharmed, Anuus said. She stood at the front of the second group, her bow slung over her back and her hood up. Her posture and bearing were more confident than it had been in the village, as if she was in her element now, here in the forest. Regina glanced at Tia, who was just climbing out of the boat as well, taking one of the bulging bags. She still moved a bit stiffly, but her wound seemed to be healed well enough not to cause trouble. We shouldn't linger here for too long, Bionorn cut in. The Delvers might still be following, and we can't keep the beasts away forever. True, another male elf agreed. He looked tired. The sooner we get to the outpost, the better. Outpost? Regina asked as the elves all hefted their packs and prepared to leave. We're not going to your settlement? Anuus shook her head. No, we are still in the middle of the monster horde, which makes trying to get you into the city tricky. But do not fear, you will not be in undue danger in our company. And you will want to see where I am taking you. Regina nodded and started walking as the elves did. One woman stayed behind with the boat, presumably to take it back to wherever it came from. She noticed that the drones stayed close to each other. After a moment of hesitation, Regina fell back to walk among them. She reached out to squeeze Max's shoulder softly and took Tia's arm for a moment. They both seemed to relax visibly. She made herself smile at her hive. We're going to need to have a long talk once we have some privacy. Where exactly are we going, then? She asked Anuus after a few minutes of walking through the forest. An old outpost that is rarely in use anymore, the elven ranger answered. In the forest's light, the brown streaks in her hair seemed more like gold, reflecting the sunlight oddly. It is reasonably close to a spot where we once thought to build a settlement before some unfortunate circumstances coinciding led to the project being abandoned. But it is still a good spot, at the edge of a bay in the forest. Regina raised an eyebrow. Oh? Anuus glanced back and gave her a smile. It is still somewhat close to human lands, and more exposed to danger, she said. Further out in the open than our kind typically prefer. But I'm sure having lots of space to grow would not be a problem for your hive. Regina paused. This sounded good. Remarkably good. Is that so? Forgive the blunt question. But if you let me build my hive there, what is in it for your people? Anuus chuckled and shook her head. I'm not the one who makes these decisions, child. But even I can see that having some people we are friendly with settled there would be strategically advantageous, in order to cover our flanks. Of course, that does presume your group will be strong enough to hold the place. Regina nodded, but didn't say anything. Anuus was looking at her with a clearly speculative look, a curious gleam in her eye. She decided not to risk revealing anything more than she had to. Still, while the elf's words made sense and she could see the potential benefit of such an alliance for them, it presumed that they saw her as someone who could build a true settlement up, or even a client state of sorts. That implied they had some knowledge of her capabilities. The thought made Regina's heart beat faster and she wasn't entirely sure whether it was from anxiety, excitement at a possible lead, or something else. The journey through the forest took several hours. They mostly followed some narrow, winding game trails. Anuus appeared to know exactly where she was going, even if there was no proper road here. There were still monsters in the forest, more than she'd seen before the horde, but still considerably less than there were in the thick of it. A few times, their group got attacked by monsters. Anuus and the elves were nice enough to let Regina and her drones fight some of them. She stayed back, biting her lower lip, as she watched Mia and Tia take down another black panther. The monster was only level 6, which made it good experience for them. Max and Tim had already defeated its companion and were now trying to skin it, with one of the elves looking on and giving tips. The panther lunged, but Mia managed to dodge and cracked it over the head with her work limb while Tia scraped it with the sword she'd borrowed. It was only a shallow cut, but the monster drew back, hissing. Tia followed it, charging forward, and managed to score another cut with her sword. Mia sidestepped to keep it pinned between them. When Tia drew its attention again, Mia swung at its hind limb. 
She didn't seem to do much damage, but she distracted the panther enough for Tia to stab it again, in the chest this time. The panther tried to retreat, but clearly had trouble keeping its feet, and fell down eventually. Tia stabbed it in the throat, then stepped back, grinning broadly. I reached level 6, my queen. Tia told her. Me too, Mia added. Well done. Regina congratulated them. Let's get these taken care of quickly, then go on, I don't think our new friends want to wait long. Only ten minutes later, they encountered another pack of monsters. This time, the elves didn't even warn them. The ranger guarding their right flank simply stepped aside, grinning slightly. Max charged at the red-striped snake, level 8, before Regina could even say anything. Tim followed a moment later, capturing the attention of the second snake, which was a level lower. Regina gathered her mana and prepared to throw a magic missile. She waited until she had a clear view before loosing her attack on the third snake. She couldn't see its level, and her attack almost seemed to bounce off its scales. While it paused in its tracks, it didn't seem very hurt. Mana, 108 out of 160. Before she could continue the fight, another elf stepped in, drawing the higher level monster away from the rest. Regina didn't protest, and instead turned her attention to the other two. Tim was pushing his snake hard, while Max had adopted a more defensive style. Regina gathered the mana for a second missile, then loosed it when it looked like Tim might be overextended. The attack caught the snake in the jaw it had just opened and caused it to jerk back. That proved to be its downfall when Tim quickly skewered it through the mouth. Then he pivoted and slashed at the other snake, which Max was keeping still. The two warriors quickly ended that one, as well. Regina glanced around. Most of the elves seemed to have vanished into the forest, but Anuus was just coming back towards them. You're finished, good. We're almost there. Let's hurry, we still need to set up camp before nightfall. Regina nodded. A part of her wanted to keep fighting until the next level up, or at least until Max and Tim leveled up. They had to be really close to it, considering the fight against the monster horde in the village. But there'd probably be opportunity enough for that later. After only a few more minutes of walking, they finally reached the outpost. Regina paused and took it in. I probably should have expected a treehouse. Although calling it a treehouse was like calling the castle a walled hut. The outpost spread over several trees, anchored to broad branches and secured with intricately knotted ropes as well as wooden planks. Some parts of it looked like they'd grown naturally from a single piece of wood, but in impossible shapes. It was situated on top of a hill, and if Regina squinted, she could just see the end of the tree lean further down. The elves all seemed to cheer up as they reached it. They nimbly climbed up and even offered to help the hive with their bags, but Regina refused. She didn't want them to see the eggs quite yet. Instead, she climbed up with one hand, holding a bag in the other. Once on a wooden platform, she found a secluded spot in an oversized knothole to deposit them for now. The others can set up camp for the night, Anuus said, dropping down from above to appear beside her. I thought we might take a look at the place I mentioned earlier. Regina tried not to wince and nodded. She glanced around at her drones. After a moment of consideration, she called, Mia, with me, please. The rest of you, help the elf set up camp. She wanted to have a worker along to help her assess the space with an eye to construction and planning a settlement, and Mia seemed like the best choice. Mia smiled as she jumped over to join Regina and Anuus. The elven ranger didn't comment, but simply jumped down to the ground, barely touching the rope hanging down. Regina suppressed a sigh and chose to climb down the trunk of the tree, using her claws for better handholds. Mia copied her. The young drone worker stuck close to her as Anuus led them through the forest, ducking behind trees and crossing game trails as she went down the hill. Regina heard some sounds from the canopy above that didn't quite sound like birds. If she had to guess, a few other elves were accompanying them, but she didn't comment on it. Finally, the three of them emerged from the trees into open ground. They stood on another hill, where the forested slope gradually gave way to a meadow. She could see what the elf had meant by calling it a bay, the forest almost surrounded the place in a rough semicircle, and there was a small lake to the east, which probably connected to the river. 
I can see the strategic relevance, I think, Regina said after a moment of looking at it. Then she glanced northeast, with a frown. But it is still pretty close to Forrest's watch, isn't it? Anuus nodded with a sober expression. That it is. And I don't suppose the Delvers have forgotten about us, she continued. They might not go after us right away, but I doubt we've heard the last of that. Most likely not, the elf agreed. I cannot promise you that my people will protect you from all threats, either. We have other commitments and conflicts. Regina shook her head. I wouldn't want that, anyway. We need to stand on our own, and be able to hold our own. No offense, she added after a moment. Even relying on the elves as much as they already did didn't sit well with her. She tolerated it because this offered her the opportunity to build up her hive, to grow her own strength. That didn't mean she was prepared to trust them unconditionally, or to trust her safety and that of her hive to them. Well, in any case, you don't need to decide this right away, Anuus said in a gentle tone. Let us go back to the others. Regina nodded and turned to go after a last look. She'd confer with Mia privately later, or better, bring her here again tomorrow, to take a closer look at the whole valley. But she still felt like the decision was already made. Even if it would be dangerous, what were their alternatives? Go try to settle in the elven city? Try to find other human communities to take them in? She snorted to herself. No. She needed space for her hive to expand, if nothing else, and she and her hive wouldn't bow to anyone but herself. Chapter 28, 2 and 2 The monster horde had already lasted for several days, but it would go on for a few more. Tim had managed to get that information from one of the elven rangers in the group. He didn't mind it much, since it would offer him and his hive the opportunity to gain more experience and, hopefully, levels. But listening to the constant sounds of monsters from the forest around them wore on his nerves, even if he did his best not to show it. He and Max both reached level 8 the day after they arrived at the elven outpost. They fought another pack of lionets, with the elves watching them. One of the monsters was higher level than them, but they were never in real danger. Regina leveled up again in the same fight. After that, she took Mia and followed Anuus and a few others into the forest again, heading for the site where their new hive would be built. She hadn't said so in so many words, but Tim was sure of it anyway. He might not be as smart as Max or his queen, but he tried to keep his eyes and ears open, and he could put two and two together. They were only gone for a minute when Tia sought him out. She crouched on a branch half a meter above the wooden platform some distance from the main structure where he was practicing with his blade. Teach me how to fight, she asked. Tim nodded and tossed her the wooden sword he'd begged off Bionorn to practice fighting with different kinds of blades. He wasn't too surprised at this request. He'd seen how fervently she'd thrown herself into the fights with monsters lately. Hold the sword like this, he told her. No, a little tighter, you don't want it to slip out of your hand. The wooden sword was a short one, roughly carved out of a piece of wood in a way that made him suspect that the elves had just made it during the trip on a whim. But it worked well enough. They'd had to leave their weapons behind at the human village, so he appreciated it. He led Tia through some exercises, mostly about how to hold the weapon and some basic movements. This was all instinctual to him, and teaching someone else often made him pause uncertainly. He'd never received any training himself. But he did his best to convey what he knew about fighting, and it even helped him better understand what he was doing. Even if he probably wasn't the best teacher, but at least this way, he could help Tia. He wouldn't put it past her to sneak off and try to train on her own. Tim watched her closely, trying to see if she was overexerting herself. Her injury was mostly healed, but he could tell that it still bothered her. Besides, why else would their queen have left her behind? So he focused on basics that weren't physically demanding, just holding the weapon and a few stances. All right, he said after a while, when it was clear she was getting frustrated. Give it back to me, please, then we can work on some exercises using your work limbs. For all the good they are, she muttered as she handed the wooden sword back. Tim frowned. They are, he said. Besides, if you have to fight and we're not there, it'll most likely be when there's a surprise attack by monsters, so you probably won't have any weapons on you. 
Tia mirrored his frown. But, dash, she hesitated. They were interrupted by Max jumping onto the platform from a neighboring one. He landed with a thump and straightened to his full height. What are you doing? he asked. I'm just showing Tia a few things, Tim replied. Do you want to join in? We could do a bit of group training. The other warrior looked at both of them for a moment, narrowing his eyes. I'm not sure that's a good idea, he said. Don't we have better things to do, and what if someone gets hurt? Tim paused. It hadn't occurred to him that Max might not approve. He opened his mouth, but he wasn't sure what to say. We'll be careful, and why not? Tia asked, putting her hands on her hips and stretching her work limbs a little to the side. I need to fight better. Max shook his head. You're doing fine, and you're a worker, not a warrior. Maybe you should focus on what you can do in that area. But Max. I need to learn how to fight. I don't want to keep being useless. Oh. Tim took half a step back before he caught himself. You're not useless, he said. He had felt pretty frustrated trying to build the shelters, but he wasn't sure how to say that, and he didn't really want to talk about that. So he just said, so what if you're not as good at fighting as us? We're higher level and warriors. I'm sorry I wasn't able to protect you from that monster. Max's tone was a lot gentler now, and he brushed the side of his blade limb against her shoulder for a moment. I promise I'll do better from now on. He glanced at Tim, who nodded. We both will. But we've been fighting all the time, and we needed to level and grow stronger for the hive. You won't need to fight to level, Max countered. If Mother had wanted only drones who could fight, don't you think she would have laid only warrior eggs? Tia hesitated for a moment before she responded. But that was before the monster horde. Which will be over soon. Tim cleared his throat. He interjected hesitantly, maybe we should ask our queen when she gets back. Max paused, then nodded. You're right. In the meantime, he glanced around and raised an eyebrow. We should patrol the perimeter. And someone needs to move the eggs to a better spot, and Tia should study the treehouse to see how the elves built it and assess if we could do something like that. You're not going to argue that you're obviously the best suited of us for this task, are you, Tia? Tia winced and stood up straighter. I'll get right on it, Max. Then she turned and vaulted over a branch to the next platform. Tim nodded at Max and grabbed one of the ropes to descend to the ground. He'd start looking for signs of monsters around the base of the outpost. Glancing up, he caught an elf watching them, who quickly turned once he caught his gaze. Tim winced. In the future, they really needed to make sure conversations like this were more private. Maybe our low wisdom stats are a problem after all. Their queen returned after several hours, looking tired, but also smiling slightly. Mia, on the other hand, was looking more excited than he'd ever seen her. Granted, that wasn't saying much. Tim hopped onto a branch near them and sat down, waiting for the rest of the hive to gather. As he did, he glanced at his status sheet again. Tim. Drone Warrior. Level, 8. Mana, not applicable. Con, 11. STR, 13. Dex, 10. End, 11. Int, 13. Wis, 9. He'd gained another point in STR with his newest level. The next one would probably go to Con. His Int and Wis hadn't risen since he hatched, so he had no idea when their turn might come. Although he felt like he was smarter now than when he'd just hatched, so how well did they really describe someone's intelligence or wisdom? Max and Tia showed up shortly, and Regina smiled at them all. We're going to be staying here, she announced. In the place they showed me, I mean. We'll wait out the end of the monster horde with the elves, then we'll get started on building a proper hive. They'll leave by then. I also got promises for a bit of help, so it should hopefully go better than last time. Tim smiled, and saw the others grinning, too. He couldn't help but feel excited. A real hive. A place to stay and build, at least. He knew it would mean a lot of work, but he didn't mind that. 
and if his queen thought they could handle the humans they would undoubtedly have to deal with, that was a bit of a relief, too. What can we do to prepare? Max asked. Regina chewed on her lower lip. Try and learn as much as we can from the elves, I guess. We can also keep fighting monsters, but we'll have to do that once we're on our own, anyway. What about the eggs? Tim asked in a low voice. That bothered him. Did they trust the elves enough to show them new drones hatching? It would probably be pretty obvious what was going on. Regina glanced around, presumably checking to make sure they were alone. He couldn't hear or smell anyone else close by, though, and that was probably a more reliable indicator. We'll take them to a secluded spot in the forest, she replied. Then we'll just come back with a few more people. I kind of already told Elena's that would happen, and they'll probably figure it out soon, no matter what we do. If they haven't already. Tim cocked his head. The way his queen was frowning slightly, the way she spoke that last sentence, implied that she suspected they did. And considering what he'd heard Anuus say, that made sense. And if the elves had, could the humans figure it out as well? He shook his head and made himself focus on the conversation. Tia was asking about getting combat training. Sure, Regina answered easily. If you have the time, I don't see why not. Actually, she frowned thoughtfully. I guess I could make that a rule, once we have more workers. They all need to get some self-defense training, at least. And more advanced training if they want, as long as it doesn't interfere with everyone's work. Tia gave Max a pointed look. He glanced away, scratching the base of his right blade limb. Mia, on the other hand, looked apprehensive, if anything. Go take a nap or something, Tia, I don't like your color, their queen said. Mia, go see about tools like we discussed. Max, I'd like to go on a patrol around the camp with you. Tim, do what you do, I guess. Tim felt his chest puff up a bit before he made himself stop. He'd seen the small smile on his queen's face before she turned to jump to the ground with Max. He felt gratified that she didn't feel the need to give him any specific instructions. Gods knew, if they were real, she had more than enough to deal with already. He didn't want to add to her burden. Even this crap with Tia and Max arguing over combat training. Tim shook his head and resolved then and there to solve problems, not make them. He knew that he would probably end up in a leadership position once they had more, younger warriors. Even if he would rather act on his own, fight without having to worry about others, he'd do his best. He climbed to the higher platform where most of the elves had set up camp to talk to Bionorn again. Maybe he could get him to make them some more training weapons. They could use those. Or even real weapons. Anything was better than a stone axe. Chapter 29, New Beginnings The monster horde ended the day after her new drones hatched. If Regina had known that, she might have just tried to hide them in the forest. When Max brought a group of three level 1 drones into the outpost, the elf seemed just a little nonplussed. Regina watched them closely. She saw Anuus' eyes narrow in what might have been realization or intense consideration, and Bionorn glanced at her with a look she found difficult to read. But at least none of them made an issue of it. She managed to deflect their questions, hopefully. For the most part, she just told them that she didn't really know where her people came from, which was at least a half-truth, since she had no idea where she had come from or how exactly whatever biological or magical process made the drones worked. She also said that there were some issues she would rather not speak about, as they were sensitive for her and her companions. Regina didn't get the impression that they were satisfied with it, but the elves didn't press her too much. Instead, they focused on packing up their camp. The number of monsters in their surroundings had decreased, and when Anuus declared that the horde was over and they were leaving, the forest seemed about as safe as it had been before, if not more so. It's usually quiet after a monster horde, Bionorn told her when she mentioned that observation. Many strong monsters have been killed. Those that survive generally retreat and lick their wounds. That is why I'm confident you will be safe even without us, Anuus said, stepping up to where they were standing at the base of the treehouse. She inclined her head towards her. It has been a pleasure, Regina. I wish you the best of luck. Regina mirrored the gesture. To you as well, Anuus. Safe journey.
The others quickly made their goodbyes as well, and before she knew it, the elves were walking down the trail, leaving them behind. Regina stood looking after them for a while. After a minute, she heard someone shifting behind her and turned. Her hive was gathered in a small clearing, looking at her expectantly. She paused for a moment. Seeing them like this, the difference between her old companions and the new hatchlings was apparent. Not so much physically, of course. Max was just a bit taller than the new warriors, and Tim might be as well, and they might look just a bit sturdier and more muscular, but that was all. No, it was in the way they looked at her, in the way they held themselves. She could tell that Max, Tim and even Mia and Tia kept a small bit of their attention on the surrounding forest. The others just looked kind of eager. She smiled at them. How have you been settling in? Ben exchanged a look with his brother Dan, before he spoke. I don't think we've had much settling in to do, my queen. She chuckled and nodded. He wasn't wrong. Regina considered them for another moment. Ben had started with the same stats as Tim, while Dan had one point less in dex and one more in end. B, on the other hand, had stats like Mia's, but with a point in STR, traded for one in con. Is there anything else we can do, my queen? The young worker asked now. Pack up everything if you haven't already, Regina answered. We're going to move to the new site immediately. The others nodded and hurried off to gather what supplies they had. Fortunately, the elves had been kind enough to leave them some camping equipment, and they had meat from the monsters they'd fought. It didn't take long for everyone to be ready to leave. Regina glanced back once, then led her expanded hive through the forest. She shook her head to herself. This was probably a big enough group not to have to worry about monsters, but a part of her still wanted more. She'd let her mana fill back up, use it for the most necessary tasks, wait until it was full again, then lay more eggs. At least a scout or two this time. Maybe another worker. There was probably a lot of work in front of them. Once they reached their new home, or rather where it would be, Regina felt herself smiling. It was a nice summer day, with a fresh breeze tempering the heat from the blazing sun overhead. The lake's water glittered in the sunlight, and it smelled of grass, fresh earth and new beginnings. What now? Max asked, glancing around. Regina had given it some thought. We should build some shelters first, like we had before, just to keep the rain off when necessary. Then we'll get started building proper structures. There's clay by the water, but we'll probably have to just let it bake in the sun instead of firing bricks properly. We'll also use the wood of trees we cut down. Do any of you have anything to add? She looked around, but they all shook their heads. Good. We'll probably have to experiment a lot. I was thinking we might even try building two different houses in two styles, a log cabin and one with bricks, so we'll see what works better and how much effort it takes. We'll need a lot more than two houses anyway, Mia commented, frowning thoughtfully. But it's not like we have a time limit, do we, my queen? Regina shook her head. I'd rather get a settlement going as soon as possible, but no, not really. What about defenses? Max asked. We can build a ditch and a palisade, she answered. I don't think we have the means for anything more, but it should be enough to at least keep some monsters off and help us fight the ones who'll attack anyway. But our biggest defense is probably going to be you warriors. You'll also do the bulk of the hunting for food and level that way. There are also fish in the lake, Tim noted. And if it comes down to it, we can just eat grass and leaves from the forest. Regina nodded, then looked around. She suddenly saw their surroundings in a new light. Has anyone actually tried eating grass or leaves yet? After a moment, Tia raised her hand. I tried a few juicy leaves, just out of curiosity. They tasted kind of odd, but I didn't have any problems. Regina just shook her head. Fucking weird alien biology. We really could be an apocalyptic swarm if we tried, couldn't we? Well, at least I won't have to worry too much about food supplies. She looked at the others again, noting that the new drones had remained silent so far. That wasn't surprising, since they simply lacked the experience to contribute much. But her hive was still bigger than it had ever been, and the additional hands, and other limbs, would be useful. 
All right, she said. Let's get started. They went to the edge of the forest, about 200 meters from the shore of the lake, to build their shelters. Regina sent Mia and Tia to look for the same kind of vines they'd used before, while the rest of them started cutting and gathering branches. Building the shelters went a lot more quickly now than it had before, since they had some experience with the process. Regina also didn't need them to be too fancy, since they were just temporary structures. It helped that her hive had some pelts from monsters they'd killed over the last few days. Those would help keep them warm at night, at least. Although she'd learned that the drones liked sleeping curled up together, Regina preferred less elbows getting in her face. She was ripped from her thoughts by a familiar low growl. Regina stood up, dropping the branches she'd been holding, and squinted into the forest. After a moment, the system showed her the designation of the monster stalking them. Black Panther, level? It was at least level 10, and quite a bit bigger than the other monsters of its kind she'd seen before. After a moment, when it apparently realized that she'd seen it, the branches of the tree rustled and she heard it getting closer. Hatchlings and workers, get back, Regina commanded. It's too strong. Max, Tim, we'll take it together. I have the center. Max and Tim arrived by her side in a flash. They advanced on the panther together, and Regina kept half a step back. She was glad she'd brought along the pole arm she'd taken from that human guard. The panther tried to swipe at Tim, but he deflected it with one of his blade arms. Then Max attacked, getting its attention. Regina and Tim waited for an opening, trusting in his defense. When it came, Tim stabbed at it from the side while Regina aimed a blow at its legs. The panther dodged to the side, but she still managed to catch its right hind leg and make it stumble. That was all the opportunity Tim needed. He charged forward, thrusting his blade into the joint of its other leg. The panther made a yipping sound and folded. Max bashed it over the head and Regina prepared another strike. Then Tim sidestepped with the motion of the panther's turn and stabbed it in the neck. That ended the fight. Regina took a deep breath and stepped back, glancing at the forest. I leveled up, my queen, Tim reported quietly. Good job. Regina smiled at him, then looked at Max, but he was simply staring at the dead monster. After a moment, she cleared her throat. Would you get started on harvesting it? Teach the new guys how to do it. They still didn't have consistent access to metal, except for her conjuration spell, but Regina had been thinking they might be able to make use of monster parts. High-level ones were quite strong, and their fangs and claws should be more durable than mundane animals. Probably good enough for some spearheads, or arrowheads, or even to make things like needles, or awls. She went back to gathering branches and weaving them into the walls for the shelter she'd been working on, leaving the gory work to the drones. By this point, she no longer felt bad about that. Her main strength, besides making more drones, was in magic, anyway. She glanced at her status. Regina. Hive Queen. Level, 9. Mana, 170 out of 200. Hive, 725th, 0. Con, 12. STR, 12. Dex, 12. End, 12. Int, 14. Wis, 14, plus 1. She'd used some of her mana earlier, to conjure stuff they needed, and it was filling back up. Her physical stats hadn't risen since, ever, actually, as far as she knew. She didn't think it would stay that way for long, but clearly her mental stats would keep ahead of them. Regina frowned and sighed to herself. She should reach level 10 soon. She had the feeling that something interesting would happen when she did. She hadn't gotten a new spell in a while. And she should really practice making firebolt some more, she knew she was close to getting it. But it was more than that. She suspected that level 10 would be some kind of threshold. Already, she could feel a weird kind of tension in her body, as if it was preparing to do something new. How many of these shelters are we going to build, my queen? B asked hesitantly. Regina blinked, then looked at her and smiled. At least three, I think. I have a feeling our hive might be growing quicker than we can keep up with building housing, soon. B smiled, as did Tia, who had paused in her work to listen in. 
Mia was still bent over the entrance to the shelter, measuring something in order to put in the door she was somehow putting together, and appeared immersed in her work. Regina grinned and got back to work again. She felt more relaxed than she'd been in what seemed like a long time, surrounded by her hive in their own territory. Chapter 30, Types and Abilities The hive settled into a new routine quickly. Very quickly. Clearly, Regina wasn't the only one who felt good about finally having a bit of space to call their own, and the drones were working hard to develop it into something approaching a real home. She'd had a long discussion with Max and Tim about their security and defensive measures. In the end, Regina decided that their fortifications would have to wait a bit. Not because they weren't important, but because they wouldn't be able to finish them quickly, anyway. She wanted a proper palisade around their homes, and since she expected rapid growth, that meant they'd need to reserve space inside it. There was just no way they would be able to chop down and process enough trees for such a large wall, at least not with their current strength. That left the warriors free to assist the workers and to hunt. Regina had laid more eggs the same day they arrived here. Two drone scouts and a drone worker. The scouts should be able to help the warriors hunt, as well as help guard their hive. Her hive was growing by leaps and bounds, but it still felt small. Regina wanted to start a proper settlement, and that needed manpower. She also needed to level up. Max had quickly followed Tim in reaching her level, which meant that even if the two of them fought enough monsters to earn another level up, they wouldn't be able to get it. A higher level would also raise Regina's limit for her hive and possibly speed up her mana regeneration, if nothing else. She was probably gaining experience for establishing herself like this, but it hadn't been enough to put her over the threshold yet. A part of her wanted to wait and see if the hatching of her three next drones would do so, but without any way to chart her progress or experience gain, that was probably not very helpful. So she set out to hunt monsters, accompanied by Tim and the two lower-level warriors. Max was staying behind along with the higher-level workers in order to protect the hive. Regina had considered what might go wrong during this trip and resolved to stay close enough to get back quickly and take whatever they could use for first aid. She had not considered the possibility that she wouldn't find anything to fight. This is a little ridiculous, she huffed, plopping down on a fallen tree trunk as they crested yet another hill. I can't believe there aren't any strong monsters around. Tim glanced at Ben and Dan, who were breathing heavily and clutching their makeshift weapons. They'd both had several fights, with low-level monsters they had encountered. Tim had held back and only stepped in when they seemed to be in real danger to help them level up. It had paid off, since both were level 2 and could probably reach level 3 quickly. There are still monsters, he noted. But they're no challenge for me, and I doubt I'll get real experience from them, Regina retorted. That is why I left them to Ben and Dan. The two warriors exchanged a glance. Ben looked like we wanted to say something, but then closed his mouth and looked away. Bionorn did say that the stronger monsters are either dead or have retreated, my queen, Tim reminded her. I know. Regina sighed. Do you think we should keep going or head back? Tim frowned, glancing at the sky. We've been out here for several hours, and even if we'd been walking in an arc around our territory, I wouldn't go too much farther. You're right. Let's go back. Maybe we'll see some monsters on the way. On the way back, they encountered another small pack of flame-tongue wolves, none of them over level 4. Tim joined in and helped Ben and Dan fight them, taking on two of the wolves to leave them one each. Regina hesitated but didn't join the fight herself. She didn't have a real weapon at the moment, and she was more focused on using magic, anyway. But with her mana Regan limited, she didn't want to use any mana she didn't have to. It took longer to get back than she'd thought, especially since they waited for the younger warriors to gut and clean their kills. Regina lent a hand in carrying them back to the camp. When she finally walked out of the forest and saw that everything appeared to be calm, the same as when they'd left, she breathed a sigh of relief. She set the carcass of the wolf she was carrying down with a thump and watched as be hurried over to take it. Her hive couldn't afford to waste any materials they got. Still, as Regina walked away and looked out over the field and the sparkling water of the lake, she felt cautiously optimistic. They just needed some time to grow. But we might not get that time.
That night, she slept in the first of the completed shelters, using wolf pelts as mattress and blanket. Her sleep was more restful than it had been in days, and she went about her day with new energy. By her count, it had now been about three weeks since she first woke up in this world. Since she hatched. And a week since the monster horde started. It had been relatively short, but apparently vicious. Her hive would have to be strong enough to face the next one in five years, whatever else happened. Regina didn't worry about that, though. Five years were a long time, especially to someone with her class, or template, or whatever made her a hive queen. She helped the workers finish up the last of their provisional shelters and helped with preparations for their real building projects. The boys were set to work chopping down trees, passing the one good axe they had between them. Regina and the workers went to what she would optimistically call a clay pit and started experimenting with the material. They would probably need wooden frames to form proper bricks of the same size and shape, and from what she vaguely remembered, mixing in straw would be good. Maybe they could also try just using the clay as a binding material for walls with a structure of woven branches. They didn't get a lot done that day in terms of building, but they made good progress in figuring things out. Regina felt motivated to get it done quickly. The next day, she woke up early, took some of the cooked meat they had left from dinner, and set off to the location. She wasn't the first one to arrive, though. Mia was already there bent over the frame of rough wooden planks they'd prepared the day before, apparently immersed in her work. I hope you got enough sleep, Regina commented. She'd had to almost drag Mia away last evening, too. The drone started, looking up and reflexively drawing in her work limbs. After a moment, she relaxed. Oh, my queen. I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. Yes, I slept well, and I feel rested enough. Good. It's nice to see you so engaged. Regina put down the water skin she'd taken along and started poking at some clay they'd dug out. Do you think this is more promising than the log cabin idea, then? I don't know. We probably won't know until we really get started. Speaking of, where should we try to bake the bricks? I was thinking just setting them up over there. It's a clear space and the sun will shine directly on it. It's going to be a warm day, too. Let's see. They both dove into their work and didn't talk much except to point out issues or suggestions. Tia was at the forest's edge today, trying to get wooden beams prepared for the actual building. Ben occasionally showed up and she saw Dan patrolling around the field, but she didn't pay them much attention. Regina was so engrossed in her work that when it was interrupted, she felt disoriented for a moment. She blinked and looked up then paused as she realized what it was that felt different. That sense inside of her, not quite her mana but connected to it, had shifted. If she focused on it, she could feel three presences more clearly. But her moment of realization was interrupted by the system. You have leveled up. You may now select your first ability, Regina gasped and crouched down. She felt dizzy for a second, and there was a warm sensation in her body. It spiked until she she felt a stab of heat through her core. It took her a moment before she could focus on the next screen the system showed her. Congratulations, you have reached level 10 as a hive queen and unlocked your second type of drones. You may now create swarm drones. My queen. Are you alright? What's happening? She felt Mia's hands on her shoulder. Regina took a deep breath, pulling her attention from the system to her surroundings and answered, it's okay. I leveled up and apparently unlocked a new type of drone. She paused and grimaced. I think we're going to see what that means quickly. A pressure grew in her abdomen, one that felt familiar, though slightly different. Regina closed her eyes, focused on the agitated mana in her body, and tried not to worry as she let her biology run its course. When she was finished, Regina straightened up and took a step back, breathing deeply. She felt tired, though no worse than last time. Which was interesting, since there were five eggs laying in the grass this time. They had the same swirling brownish-gray coloring as her other eggs. But these eggs were a little smaller. Regina carefully picked one up, turning it in her hands, thoughtfully. It felt slightly warm, almost alive, like the others. Then she glanced at Mia. Well, let's get these into the shelter. 
Mia nodded and carefully gathered up the eggs. The two of them headed back to the edge of the forest, where they'd built their shelters. It wasn't a long trip. Once they arrived, Regina put the eggs into a small indentation on the ground in one of the shelters, braced by twigs and cushioned by leaves and fur scraps. Only then did she step back and look around for the former inhabitants of this space. Max was talking to the three new drones a short distance away. They and Tia had all stopped what they were doing and were watching her, but clearly didn't want to come and bother her. Regina eyed the two new scouts for a moment. They looked like leaner versions of the warriors, for the most part. Although, interestingly enough, one of them seemed to be female. Like the other scout, one of her lower limbs extended into a blade like the warriors, but shorter. The other one instead was a more complicated, multi-pronged tool, and Regina couldn't make much sense of it with only a quick glance, but she turned her attention back to the system. It felt like it still held information for her. As soon as she thought about it, it showed her a new screen. Hive, unnamed. Total, 11. Inner hive, 10 25ths, plus 0. Swarm, 0 out of 10. Warriors, 4. War drones, 0, plus 5. Workers, 4. Scouts, 2. Regina whistled to herself. It sounded a bit higher pitched and yet more scratchy than she would have liked. So, she now had a new type of drones, swarm drones, with one new template, war drones. From the name and the eggs, she could guess that they were intended to be weaker, but more numerous. Still, that couldn't be all of it. War drones sounded very generic, less like a proper class than something like drone warrior. Regina blinked and turned her attention to the next notification screen the system was showing her. She'd finally unlocked her first ability, and she was curious to see what that meant. You may now select your first class skill. Please choose one of the following. Hive Locator, you can sense the location of all of your Hive members. You will now be able to pinpoint their coordinates and distance more precisely as well as receive more detailed information on their status. At higher levels of mastery, you will be able to project the location of your Hive as or into a fully visible map, including information on Hive member status. Enhanced telepathy, your mind is the mind of your Hive. Your psychic connection to your drones deepens, enabling closer communion. Telepathic contact is easier and may include broader targeting. At higher levels of mastery, you will be able to use your psychic power outside of the context of your hive. Mage's focus, your path is one of magic. Your rate of mana regeneration will be improved, as you will get an effective bonus to your wist stat, the size of which depends on your int stat. Learning new spells will be easier for you. At higher levels of mastery, you will have greater control over casting your spells and be able to cast two at once. Regina couldn't help herself and whistled again. All of these abilities sounded very good. Even if she had to wait 10 levels, they seemed a lot more powerful and complex than what the drones got. But she knew what she wanted as soon as she saw the option. Mage's focus was very tempting, especially since the reduction in her mana regeneration rate was one of her greatest issues right now. But its main effect was something she would get anyway as she leveled up further. It was the only choice that focused on her own power, not her hive. But she wasn't just any mage. Regina knew that, while her path might be one of magic, her greatest strength was her hive. She should choose something that would help her strengthen it further. Hive locator would be cool, but what really called to her was enhanced telepathy. Besides, it sounded like she could get most of the effects of the locator option with that, too. And if it strengthened the psychic connection between them, it might affect not just herself, but her whole hive. It might even allow the drones to talk to each other eventually. And while Hive Locator's map might be a great strategic asset, the prospect of using psychic power on people outside the hive was what really convinced her. If she could just walk up to an enemy and make them surrender, or stand still while her drones killed them, that would be a real game changer. Even if actual mind control wasn't possible, it sounded very promising. Resolved, Regina tapped on the middle option. The screen disappeared with a small shower of sparks. For a second, she just stood there, wondering if that was it. But after a moment, she could tell that something had changed. 
her sense of the drones was clearer. Not really any different, but it felt a bit deeper, for lack of a better word. She wouldn't be able to describe their locations any easier than before, but it was far more profound than that. For an instant, she felt like they were a part of her in a way that she hadn't noticed before. Smiling, Regina turned and started heading to the cluster of drones, who were still not so discreetly watching her. Time to meet the new drones, and maybe try out her new ability a little. Interlude, Embers. The monster roared, shaking the leaves of the nearby trees, but she could tell that it was a roar of pain. It crouched, blood dripping from the lion at side. Janice took a step back, her focus narrowing on her opponent. She breathed deeply, feeling her mana spread through her body and forcing it into shape. It twisted, almost slipping through her mental fingers. A drop of sweat dripped down her forehead and she blinked. Then she was ready and she cast the spell. A magic missile shot out of her hand, slamming into the wound in the monster's side. The lionet made a high-pitched yipping sound as it was thrown off its feet. It struggled for a few moments more, but finally lay still. Janice raised a hand to rub her eyes. You have leveled up. Gods yes. She stumbled to an overturned rock and sat down, stretching out her legs, still grinning. She'd done it. She had learned magic missile, and she had reached level 10. Janice sat there for a minute, recovering her breath. She felt too elated to care about her tiredness, the blood on her dress, or the badly wrapped gash in her left forearm. She had been stuck in level 7 for what felt like years, even if it had only been a few months in actuality. Then she'd finally reached level 8, helping defend the village against monsters. That had been the day the Delvers came. Her grin slipped from her face at the memory, and she took a deep breath and made an effort to release the tension in her body. She'd gone out frequently since then, hunting monsters, at first near her village and then coming into the outskirts of the forest. Janice shook her head at herself. After she'd lost her parents, she'd promised herself she would never become an adventurer and look at her now, but it had paid off. In only a week, she had gained two levels. Of course, she knew she'd only gained that last level because of magic missile. Most people might not know, but one of the benefits of leveling without a class was that the system would reward you for various things, not just accomplishments in line with your class. Learning a spell by herself must have brought her a nice sum of experience. Jana smiled again. Now that she'd reached level 10, it was time to finally get her class. With a shift of her attention, she pulled up the message. You may choose your class. This choice will define yourself and your path forward. It cannot be be undone. Choose wisely. Based on your racial characteristics, past actions, and personal accomplishments, the system has selected the following classes for your consideration. Below that was a list of classes. Janice whistled silently as she read through it. There were more choices than she had expected, at least twenty. Focusing on any of them made a new screen expand, giving her a bit of information on it. But she quickly breezed past them. There were a lot that she didn't care about, from Baker's Apprentice, probably because she'd helped out at the village bakery a bit, to Hunter, these fights against monsters, presumably, to disciple, she couldn't even guess where that came from. But she'd finally gotten the choice she wanted. Janice hesitated as she saw that the system offered her the option of fire mage as well as mage. For a moment, she wavered, tempted to choose it. But then she shook her head. Old, almost forgotten advice from her father rang in her ears, warning her not to overspecialize. Besides, she didn't want to restrict herself not when it came to this. It might be childish, but she daydreamed of being able to fly. She'd need air magic for that, not fire. And she remembered the old adventurer who'd passed through forests hunt years ago, who she'd talked to for hours and persuaded to test her magical talent. She had an affinity for air magic as well, not just fire. With her choice made, the system sheet dissolved in a shower of colorful sparkles, and her bones thrummed like someone was blaring an inaudible trumpet. Jana shivered, feeling a warmth spreading throughout her body. She sensed her mana rise and vibrate for a long moment, before it calmed again. Then she stood up and flexed her hands. She felt much better now, as if all of her prior pain and tiredness had been swept away. 
Grinning again, Janice called up her status sheet. Janice. Mage. Level, 10. Mana, 250 out of 250. Con, 10. STR, 9. Dex, 10. End, 12. Int, 15. Wis, 14. Janice nodded to herself, happy with what she saw. Then the echo of a far-off howl brought her back to reality. She stood up, glancing at the corpse of the monster she'd killed and at the sky. Usually, she would skin and harvest it here, but the sun was sinking and night would fall soon. She didn't like the thought of leaving it behind, especially since the pelt and teeth would make her a nice profit. But as her mother used to say, you couldn't spend any money if you were dead, and she didn't fancy the thought of being in the forest at night, even if she was not far in. So she grabbed her hunting knife, secured her pack, and set off back to the village. She felt her excitement drain out of her with every step and chided herself for it. The village might not be where she wanted to be, but it was her home for now. And her aunt might actually be worried for her, even if the old shrew wouldn't show it. Janice emerged from the forest quickly and crossed the fields towards the village, putting her newfound energy to good use. It was still getting noticeably dim outside by the time she reached it. Janice frowned as she saw the soldiers standing by the entrance on the main road. The Delvers had finally left a few days ago, but things still hadn't gone back to normal. At least she could finally walk around the village without feeling like she was constantly being watched. She pulled the strap of her pack tighter as she remembered what happened a week ago. She'd often found her thoughts straying to Regina, the strange hive queen, over the last week. And not just because she was the reason Janice had learned her new spell. The girl had shown her something she hadn't seen in all the years she'd lived in the village and barely realized she missed. It felt odd to think of her in that manner, since she was only a 15-year-old girl, whatever her class. But she hadn't acted like a girl, she'd acted like a woman. A confident, if not quite regal, woman, sure of her power and her responsibilities. Janice was no idiot and realized that Regina had seen her as a useful contact at best. An illusion of friendship was not why she'd headed out that day, resolved to do what she could to try and free her from the Delver's clutches. It was for the best that there had been no need for that, of course. Janice hadn't told anyone about her encounter, but she had been pondering it. Although going out to search for a mysterious demi-human with unknown intentions in the wilderness sounded a lot like adventuring, and there was the way Regina had looked at her in that alleyway. Assessing for a moment, Janice thought she'd seen what she'd rather not let people know. Janice frowned to herself at the thought, then glanced around at the village. She had reached level 10 far more quickly than someone without a class should. Still, she didn't think any of the villagers would notice or realize anything. If the Baron heard of it, he might, but she didn't think he would say anything. As far as she knew, no one in Forest's haunt suspected that she was anything but completely human. He, Janice. She glanced up and started. Ty, the smith's son, was carrying bags of ore out of his father's shop without a shirt on. When he caught her gaze, he set his bag down and waved, tensing his muscles a bit more than was perhaps necessary. Janice returned a small wave and quickly hurried on, forcing herself not to make a face. She knew that her aunt had been talking to Ty's mother about arranging a betrothal. Janice could already hear her nagging her again about finding a husband and settling down. Yes, the boy was strapping and had a secure future, but it would take a lot more than that for her to let anyone tie her to this village, to a life like this. Besides, his family was most likely only interested because she had high end and with stats. By the gods, most of the people in this village could barely read and write. At least Janice had had the benefits of a real education, before. Her parents hadn't been the most successful of adventurers, but they'd done well enough. Her life in the city sometimes felt like a pleasant dream, separated from her current life by almost a decade of dirt and drudgery. Janice occasionally felt it would be hard to find a more backwards place. Not that she was going to tempt fate by saying so. Still, a voice in the back of the head was questioning her resolve. At least adventuring was one of the few careers where women could act almost equal to men. Janice paused as she finally reached her aunt's home, surprise pushing away her dark thoughts. 
After a glance at the black courser tied to the wooden post, she opened the door and entered with a smile. Janice. Good to see you. You look healthy. Uncle Rich. Janice closed the door and returned his hug, before she stepped back and looked the man over. Her great uncle had reached a high enough level that his aging had slowed. Although she knew he was at least sixty, he still looked like a middle-aged man. His black hair showed some gray, but he was still tall and broad with muscles, instead of fat. His clothes were dusty from travel, but still of finer make than hers, as expected for a night in the service of the local marquis. Are you staying for dinner, Sir Richard? Her aunt asked, bustling out of the small attached kitchen. A few strands of red hair had broken free and were dangling down her face, and she'd rolled up the sleeves of her old dress slightly. No, thank you, Madame Marion. I won't be able to stay for long. Janice, go stoke the fire. Aunt Marion barked. And make sure you clean your shoes properly this time. Janice rolled her eyes and went to do as she was bid. With spark, it didn't take her long, and she returned to the main and only room of the house quickly. Then she sat down on the chest opposite Uncle Rich. I've got news, Uncle. But first, what brings you here? I was sent to talk to the Baron, and I wanted to check on you, he replied. His smile quickly faded into a sober expression. Janice sat up straighter. She hadn't seen him in almost a year and was looking forward to talking to him, but this seemed serious. Has something happened? You could say that, although it's nothing that concerns you directly. But the conflict between the elves and the Nerlian kingdom has escalated. Janice paused. You mean they're going to start a war? He let out a small sigh. The war has already started. We just got word from the capital. The Nerlians have already mustered their armies. They're most likely fighting their first battle as we speak. Janice drummed her fingers on her thigh, trying to remember everything she knew about the situation. A cold shiver trickled down her spine. But that means we're going to be called on to join them, doesn't it? The king is married to a princess from Nerlia, right? So. Her uncle shook his head and leaned forward. I can't be sure, but I would guess that is likely. My lord has already implied that I would be given command of some levies we'd send to Nerlia. Janice grimaced. They're calling up levies? He sighed again and shrugged. We need men to defend against any major threat that might come from the forest not to mention that we are close to an elven city. They won't strip too many from the march. His lips twitched into a small smile. Besides, I may have mentioned that the Marquis likes the king just as little as the reverse. Janice snorted. He had mentioned that before, though she hadn't paid much attention. It was the kind of gossip knights liked to pass around just as much as washerwomen, they just pretended to be more discreet about it. I even heard him say that if His Majesty orders him to move out in force into the forest against the elves, he's going to mysteriously lose the missive, Uncle Rich added in a conspiratorial tone. Janice shook her head, but she couldn't help but smile. Was he drunk or something? If Uncle Rich was telling her this, it was probably all over the castle. Well, it wasn't her problem. Janice glanced up to see her aunt standing by the doorway. When their gazes met, Marion didn't glare at her or move away. She just looked concerned. We'll simply have to wait and see, Uncle Rich continued in a louder voice. I just wanted to see you before I left. Now, what is this news you have got? Janice smiled, feeling some of her excitement return. I got a class. He raised an eyebrow. You mean you got a class, or dash? I chose a class, she quickly corrected. I'm a mage, level 10, now. Congratulations, Janice. I have to admit that I half expected something like fire mage, though. That was an option I considered, she admitted, ignoring his teasing smile. She hesitated for a moment. But I was hoping you might help me find a position with it. You said mages are always in demand. You're bound and determined to get away, aren't you? He frowned. You know mage classes are usually something for nobles and people from families with means. Books, for spells and such, aren't cheap, not to mention the issue of leveling safely. 
I know, you've told me before. Mages are weaker and more vulnerable at lower levels, although they're powerful later. But I've already reached level 10, and I learned three spells on my own. Well, one of those was Spark, which barely counted, and she'd had help from someone for another, but it was still nothing to scoff at. He nodded slowly. You clearly have talent. And my lord wouldn't turn his nose up at the chance to get more mages. Most nobles wouldn't. All right, I'll talk to a few people. Just don't expect instant results. Janice grinned, barely containing herself from jumping up. She knew she'd still need to be patient and that there might be issues, but she found it hard to care. She was confident she would finally get out of this village, hopefully to something better. Chapter 31, Swarm Drones It started to rain the day after Regina reached level 10. A light drizzle at first, that slowly turned into a pounding rain pouring down on them as the day wore on. Regina and her drones gritted their teeth and continued with their work. Lots of animals seemed to seek shelter from the rain, and it hampered visibility as well, so Regina kept the warriors close. With the additional help, despite the weather, work on their log cabin proceeded quickly. They cut down trees and prepared logs to use in building it. Max and Tim's higher con stats seemed to have made their blade limbs tougher, enough that they could use them to chop down trees relatively well. The rain continued through the night, but their shelters kept the worst of it off them. Regina heard the wind howling through the branches of the trees, but it never quite turned into a real thunderstorm. By the time the sun started to rise, the rain was tapering off, and the clouds parted to let some sunshine through. The western horizon showed a truly breathtaking rainbow that made Regina wish she had a camera to capture the sight. Their meadow had turned to mud in a few places, but overall, it was in pretty good shape. They were far enough from the river not to have to worry about any flooding, and the little lake wasn't going to be much of a problem even swelling with runoff water. Regina told herself that it could have been a lot worse. She wanted some proper walls by the time a real storm came, though. She took a break from working in the woods to go to the lake and try to catch some fish with Tia and Tim. It turned out that her magic missile worked just as well underwater, so even without proper equipment, she could contribute. Tia used one of the crude spears they'd fashioned, while Tim preferred to dive. He was really good at crouching at the bottom of the lake's shallows, still and hidden, then pouncing on an unsuspecting passing fish. His stats probably had something to do with it. My queen, maybe we should start trying to smoke some meat or fish, Tia suggested. Winter is going to come eventually, and there might be times when we don't have time or opportunity to go hunting. Regina nodded. That's true. And we can't rely on just meat for long. I don't want to overhunt the area. Or even on the greenery. We don't know if we can really sustain ourselves on that long term. Tia cocked her head, looking thoughtful. Do you want to start cultivating crops? Regina sighed and shrugged. We'll have to. I just wish we knew how best to do it or had some seed grains. Maybe we can gather some wild grains, but I'm not sure how well that'll work. Is it even the right time of the year for that? Tim asked. I don't know. I'm sure there are some crops that you can plant in the summer. Regina stretched where she was sitting on the grass, glancing around. It was a nice day, even with the smell of rain still in the air. She couldn't bring herself to be too worried about food or crops. They'd get by, and they were still only starting out. Besides, she was sure she could trade something with the elves eventually. Then she made herself get up. She ripped out some grass and ate it, just to try it out. It tasted surprisingly bitter, and she had to chew it a bit, but it wasn't so bad overall. Regina started walking up and down the lake, assessing her surroundings. The lake wasn't large, but it would let them build and test boats later on, and the connection to the river would be useful for transport. Just as she returned to the spot closest to the forest, Regina paused. She felt something shift again. The sensation was different from last time, but she still had an idea of what it meant. Although it had only been two days, not three, she briefly dipped into the connection she had to her hive as she turned and walked back, checking on everyone's position. Max and most of the others were still working in the woods not too far from the shelters, though Ben as well as Ace and Ada, the two new scouts, were out patrolling. 
By the time she arrived, the new hatchlings had apparently managed to free themselves of their eggs and stepped out into the open. There, they simply stood, still except for the way their eyes, antennae, and occasionally heads tilted to take in their new environment. Regina paused, coming to a stop a few meters away, and scrutinized them. The war drones were clearly smaller than the other drones, and built somewhat differently. While their upper limbs had blades similar to the warriors, their middle ones seemed to be designed to let them walk on four legs as easily as two. They had something resembling hands, though they were stubby, covered in their shell material and four-fingered. But the most significant difference wasn't in their physical appearance, but in their minds. Since she picked her class ability, Regina had been more aware of the drones' minds and found it easier to sense them. She didn't even need to try with these swarm drones, they didn't seem to have much of a barrier and almost automatically linked with her. And what she found was both easier and harder to interpret. They had the same senses and carried information just as easily, but the drone's own cognitive processes were basic. Frowning, Regina picked one at random and dove deeper into it. She sensed what it sensed, the wind, the ground under its feet, the movement of the leaves of the surrounding trees, and more. But its feelings were erratic and transient, and barely went beyond hunger, warmth, companions, and something she found hard to put into words, but the closest would be duty. There was no real, higher-level thought. No awareness of itself as an autonomous entity. Regina gathered herself and took a step closer. Move forward, she told them. At once, the war drones obeyed her command, walking a few steps forward. All of their attention was on her. Regina frowned. This was quite interesting. Then she focused and sent a mental command to the leftmost drone. On cue, it started stepping back, then circling the others, then jumping into the air and finally cutting down a thick branch from a tree. She took a moment to direct her attention to her telepathic sense again and focused on Max, sending a short message. She couldn't really communicate with actual language and detailed thoughts, not yet. But it worked for simple ideas like, come here. Sure, she could have just called him over the normal way, but she was trying to practice. In the meantime, she focused on one of them again and tried to focus her attention in a way she'd come to associate with accessing the system. Right away, its status screen appeared. War Drone. Level, 1. Mana, not applicable. Con, 8. STR, 8. Dex, 8. End, 8. Int, 4. Wis, 4. Regina frowned. It looked like they had considerably lower stats than other drones, or people. 40 in total, instead of 60 and obviously low mental stats, although that raised the question of whether they could get smarter if they leveled up. Still, they weren't so weak that they couldn't be dangerous with superior numbers. My queen? Max asked as he came to a stop beside her. So, the new drones hatched. You called for me? Regina nodded and glanced at the swarm drones. Order them to do something. Max frowned, but he turned his attention to them and took a step forward. War drones, form up in two ranks, he said loudly. The war drones immediately formed two lines, although they were a little uneven, since they were an odd number. Max looked back at Regina, who shrugged. Then he continued, stand on two legs, and jump into the air. All right. Uh, patrol around this clearing in pairs while one of you stays here. That took a moment longer, and Regina felt an echo of more frenetic mental activity. But in the end the middle war drone stayed in its place while the other four walked off straight away from it. It seems like that's about the limit of what they can handle, Regina noted. Max looked thoughtful. They're not like us, are they? No. They don't seem to be sapient, as far as I can tell. And, well, I can definitely tell, with the telepathic connection. To be honest, I feel like maybe I was supposed to get access to them first and your kind of drones later but who knows? What does this mean for us? For starters, I'm going to lay another five of these eggs as soon as my mana refills. Regina shrugged. I think this development increases the hive strength a lot. Max nodded. The two of them turned and slowly started heading back towards the others through the trees. 
They paused as they passed two of the war drones patrolling in a rough circle around the clearing, walking side by side on four legs. Forgive me if this is out of line, but you seem pretty happy about this, Max observed. Regina blinked and looked at him, then shrugged. To be honest, I feel a little relieved. They're quickly produced and don't take as much mana out of me, and, not being self-aware, they're expendable combatants. More expendable, I mean. If we have to fight, I'd rather risk some of them than one of my warriors. Max nodded. They'd stopped, close enough to hear the others at work, but still surrounded by trees. All of us would gladly risk our lives for you and the hive, but I definitely agree, for what it's worth. Regina ran a hand through her hair, which was still little more than stubble. I know. They stood there for a few seconds, looking at the war drones and listening to the sounds of the others. Regina wasn't in a hurry to move. Instead, she tuned into their minds with half of her attention. It seems a little weird, doesn't it? Max finally said. To me at least. I can't imagine how it must feel like to you. It does feel odd, she said. I mean, I laid their eggs. They're your children, he said, tilting his head. Yeah. Although it feels really weird to think of them like that, having children that are non-sapient. She exhaled and shook her head. I mean, I know I haven't been the best mother, but... Max shifted uncomfortably. After a moment, he laid a hand on her shoulder. Don't be too hard on yourself, Regina. She looked up, met his eyes. That's a case in point. You're calling me by name because I'm not comfortable being called mother. Max winced a little and withdrew his hand, but he didn't look away. There will be too many of us, there already are, for you to act like a parent in your human memories, he said after a moment. This time it was Regina's turn to look away. I know, she said quietly. The underbrush rustled as Max stepped forward. The knowledge you have and that our hive has is a huge advantage, and I'm sure it colors our view of the world. But presumably our species must do things differently. I know, she said, looking back at him. In his eyes, she read an unspoken question. Do you know? But Max was too respectful to say it. When did you grow up so much, she said with a light smile, breaking the tension. Come on, let's join the others. They resumed walking, while Regina tried not to dwell on the conversation. She focused on the link to the swarm drones in her mind and called them back. She should probably feed them first, and then they could be useful and help with the work. They reached the other drones quickly and caused a bit of a stir with the arrival of the war drones. Regina watched with a smile as the work got abandoned and they started admiring and testing out the new troops. Then she glanced at her status screen to distract herself. Regina. Hive Queen. Level, 10. Mana, 176 of 270. Hive, 10 25ths, 0. Swarm, 5 tenths, 0. Con, 12. STR, 12. Dex, 12. End, 12. Int, 15, plus 1. Wis, 14. It now showed not just her sapient hive drones, but also her swarm drones. Her mana had also increased a bit with the new drones hatching. It could still rise further, although Regina wasn't quite sure how many slots she wanted to fill in the hive. She'd probably level again before she could reach the limit, anyway. Regina shook her head and mentally ordered the war drones to get to work cutting down trees and hacking off branches. She'd have to experiment to see how detailed her commands could and would need to get, and how well her other drones could mimic it. They were presumably supposed to lead parts of the hive swarm. Chapter 32, Visitors, News, and Questions Whatever Regina might have been in a previous life before she came to wake up in the egg of a hive queen, she was pretty sure it hadn't been something practical. Like an architect or engineer, she felt the lack when she looked at the buildings they directed. Her hive finally had two log cabins and was in the process of building the third structure. They were bare, rectangular things, with no decorations or finesse. As Regina compared them to the skeleton of the next one, she couldn't help but wonder if they would collapse. Then she shook her head and turned away. She was being too negative. 
Besides, she might have been someone in the medical field, she did seem to have a bit of medical knowledge. That could be useful. She walked over to Tia and B, who were working on the other project. They'd already dug a ditch that was at least 15 meters long, with a corresponding mound of earth behind it. That was where they'd put sharpened stakes to make a palisade. It was about the best defensive fortification they could build under the circumstances. Still, it would take a while to finish. How is it going, girls? Regina asked. Tia looked up. I think the amount of dirt I can remove when I use my class skill is increasing slightly, my queen. But it is still going slowly. Regina nodded. That's interesting, and don't stress yourself too much about it. We knew this would take some effort. It would also be helpful if you could finalize and mark out where you want the line to be. I'll talk to Max and the others about it. Although you should probably be part of that conversation, as well, Tia. Regina glanced up at the sky to gauge the time, a habit she'd found herself developing. Let's say, today at dinner? Whenever suits you, my queen. Is there anything else I can help you with? Tia asked. Not really, I'm just making the rounds. Keep up the good work. Regina nodded at them, then turned around. While their new home wasn't quite the makeshift camp it had been, calling it a settlement would still be a bit of a stretch. Things were going well, though. They'd only been here for a few days, and that it was taking shape already probably said good things about her drone's competence and motivation. Regina strolled away from the two workers and in a curve around the perimeter of the camp. She found herself a little lost, unsure what to do in general and how best to put her skills to use. She didn't even have a clear picture of what her skills were. She had been considering it and concluded her main issue was that she didn't really have a clear goal. She wanted to build up her hive, sure, but how and what for? There was the question of how she'd come to be in this situation, but she didn't exactly have many leads in figuring it out. In a way, things had been easier when they were running from the monster horde or trying to deal with the humans. For now, Regina determined that she wanted to get a clearer picture of the state of affairs in this world, and she would feel safer going out and trying to get information with a stronger base, a stronger hive. Which kind of puts me back at square one. Ugh. Maybe I just need to wait until it's large enough to actually need a queen. Her thoughts were interrupted when Dan, one of the younger warriors, ran up to her. My queen. Ace just came back with news. Regina turned and glanced toward the forest. Did he say what he found? He said that we're going to have visitors from the forest, my queen. Regina nodded, then started hurrying towards the trees, Dan falling into step behind her. Max was already there, talking to the young scout. I hear we're getting visitors, she asked as she arrived. A group of elves, Max said. They were going to come sooner or later, weren't they? I saw five elves but there might have been more, my queen, Ace reported. They were all armed. That was about ten minutes at a run from here. That meant they were coming quickly. Regina nodded, then stepped forward. All right. Dan, go get Mia and Tia. It's probably best if we keep the drones who have dealt with them before here. You're not going to try to hide the rest, my queen? Max asked. Regina hesitated for a moment, then shook her head. That's not going to work, at least not in the long term. She frowned, considering if she should at least hide the war drones, but then decided it wasn't a good idea. Besides, it would be foolish to assume that they didn't already have a scout with stealth abilities check in on us. If not before, then on this trip. They didn't have a lot of time to prepare, and Regina didn't see the point in doing much. If anything, this just showed her that she needed to have better eyes on her territory and its surroundings. They could have easily missed the visitor's approach completely. The elves came out of the forest a few minutes later. It was a group of three men and three women, which meant they had indeed had at least one more person somewhere else on the way, maybe in the treetops. Welcome, Regina greeted them. She stepped forward and smiled. It's nice to get visitors. I know our little settlement isn't much, but we're working on it. The man in the lead bowed his head slightly. It wasn't anyone she recognized, although Regina had taken a look at what the system showed her for all of them. 
unsurprisingly, they were all higher leveled. Thank you, Hive Queen, he responded. You seem to have made good progress in a short time, simply judging by what I can see here. Thank you. Regina stepped back to invite them to come closer. We can at least offer you some food and water. I have to admit I'm curious to hear what brought you here. They walked further inside, to the fireplace at the center of their camp. She saw the elves looking around curiously. Curiosity is what brought us here, in the main, the leader answered. According to the system, he was named Leonon. We wanted to check up on your group and perhaps give you some help if you needed it. Regina nodded. She gestured at some seats around the fire, little more than some grass that had been pressed down and a few monster pelts, and sat herself. That is appreciated. You represent your government, then? He tilted his head slightly. We do, yes. Well, I think what we need most at the moment are good tools, and perhaps weapons. Unfortunately, I don't think we have much to trade for them with, at least not yet. The elf nodded. I understand. We may be able to provide some tools to help you get started. Unfortunately, weapons are a different story. I'm afraid our government will not be able to spare those. Regina narrowed her eyes. She glanced at Max, who stood beside her and was clearly listening attentively, then back at the elves. As I said, I am happy to have you visit, but why now? We have not been here long, and I was under the impression that it was not a trip of just a few hours. Leonon looked undecided for a moment, before he nodded. The journey would take several days ordinarily, yes, although that can be shortened for those with higher levels. That was an interesting fact, which Regina tucked away in her head carefully, but she didn't want to get distracted. So there is a reason you are coming to visit now? Another elf spoke up now, a woman with orange eyes, who was apparently called Neos. Yes. We have also come to warn you. Events are afoot that might impact you. In any case, we are to inform you of them, and see if there is perhaps even something you could contribute. I'm all ears. What is this about? Leonon answered, about three months ago, there was a raid on an elven enclave near the Brightverse Forest. It is located several weeks' travel roughly northwest of here. The locals found evidence that the local human kingdom we share a border with, Nerlia, was involved. The border has been disputed for a while, and we have had disagreements on the ownership of the silver mines nearby, as well as the management of the monster spawning grounds in the area. In retaliation, the local detachment of the guard raided an outpost that served as a base for adventurers and soldiers, trying to secure evidence. Unfortunately, the son of a local human noble was caught up in it and maimed in the fighting. To cut a long story short, there were several escalating incidents, and our attempts at diplomacy failed. The Nerlian king has officially declared war and mustered his armies. Regina sat back and crossed her arms, contemplating that. So you are at war? He inclined his head affirmatively. Well, that's, interesting news. Regina frowned. This made her see a lot of what had happened with the elves in a new light. No wonder they didn't want to send weapons, they probably needed all they had for themselves. I have to admit I'm not very familiar with the local geopolitical landscape, she said. How big of a threat is this? Nias grimaced. We could handle Nerlia alone. Unfortunately, they have an alliance with the local human kingdom here, Cernlia. They might very well join the war soon. Regina glanced out over the lake. This is the kingdom to which the village and the castle that fell to the horde belong? They have retaken and are rebuilding the castle, Leonon said. But yes, indeed. Regina looked at her drones. They all seemed concerned. How much danger are we in? Max asked. Leonon and Neos exchanged a look. We cannot say, Leonon answered. I do not think they will send soldiers here, but if they do, your settlement might be at risk. It is simply too close. And if they learn of our, well, relationship, they may consider you targets. Well, thank you for letting us know, Regina said, not voicing what else she was thinking. She fell silent for a moment, then shook her head. We might be able to help, if not now, then soon. 
but I cannot make any promises. This was just bad timing. If they had even a few more weeks, she'd feel much better prepared. As it was, sending just a few war drones wouldn't be more than a token gesture. Leonon nodded. We understand. And thank you for your understanding. That seemed to be all that the elves had wanted here, and they quickly prepared to leave again. Regina wondered if she should feel offended that they hadn't even accepted any food from them, but then she realized that she had no idea what else ate, they might all be vegetarian, and most of what her hive had was monster meat. She accompanied them back to the edge of the forest and exchanged polite goodbyes with the two leaders. After that, the elf set off back into the trees. Regina turned to leave, then paused. There was something else here. She couldn't hear or see it, but there was another scent in the air. She turned and frowned at the space to the side of where the elves had stood, where an old tree's thick branches offered a good perch. And who are you? The air shimmered and another woman appeared. She floated down to the ground as if gravity didn't mean anything to her. Oh, shoot. I must be losing my touch. Too long since I dealt with a race with such an enhanced sense of smell. Regina frowned. The woman's scent was odd. The closest she could compare it to was the charged feeling in the air during a thunderstorm, before lightning struck. That comparison didn't make any sense, but it was weird. At first, she thought the visitor was just another blonde elf, but on a closer look, she wasn't so sure. While the woman did have pointed ears, her skin still looked just a little shimmery, her features seemed more human than elven, and her eyes were a very light gray closer to silver, without the reflective quality of elf's eyes. Regina focused on her for a long moment, but the system refused to pop up any information. I don't mean to be rude, she said, taking a step back and glancing at the warriors stepping up beside her. This person was obviously powerful. But I'd like to know who you are and what you're doing here. Watching you, of course, the woman replied lightly, as if it didn't matter. Don't worry, I was just leaving anyway. I just thought it would be interesting to see how you reacted to the news of a war. Tell me, are you thinking of participating? Regina resisted the urge to clench her hands. A part of her was really not happy about being questioned by a stranger showing up uninvited in her territory, and only their obvious strength kept her from showing it. I don't think so. Do you think I should? You're asking for my advice? The woman clapped her hands together once. Interesting indeed. I suppose alien eyes might be onto something with you. That didn't sound like she was going to get an answer. Regina paused, unsure what to say. Alien eyes? Oh, you're just precious. The strange woman grinned again, then turned to go. Chow for now, little hive queen. Then she looked back and winked. I wouldn't depend too much on divine favor if I were you, kid. Benaren might have stuck his fingers in, but you're just as likely to get burned as given a parasol, if you catch my drift. She disappeared. In an instant, none of Regina's senses could detect her anymore. For a moment, she just stood there, staring at the spot where the woman had been. Regina shook her head, not sure what to think at all. Chapter 33, A Hive Structure Regina was obviously living in a fantasy world now something that could have come out of a story or movie in the vague memories she had of her former world. She hadn't processed that fact well enough, hadn't realized what it meant. Now, as she considered the visitation by the woman that was clearly implied to be some kind of divine being, she cursed her short-sightedness. And her ignorance too, while she was at it. She'd known that the people of this world, or at least this region, believed in several gods. Given that elves and demi-humans obviously existed, she should have considered that maybe physical gods did too. And here she was, if not the only hive queen in the world, then clearly the only one in a large area. Even if you disregarded whatever was up with her mind, memories, or soul, it shouldn't come as a surprise that she would be noticed. For all she knew, powerful wizards with far-seeing or clairvoyant powers had taken notice, too or maybe psychic dragons, or super-spy demi-humans. She just didn't know what was possible in this world. She really needed to find out more about the names the woman had mentioned, presumably, two gods, given the comment about divine favor, and both of them apparently interested in her. 
although she didn't know why, how much or what for. For now, there was little she could do but keep an eye out and try to prepare. Regina had already decided that the next time elves came to visit, she would send at least one of her drones back with them, maybe even go herself. She wasn't confident that she could find their city on her own, but the previous group had said they'd send tools. Then there was the war. A part of her was irritated that they'd brought her in just when they were clearly gearing up for a big conflict. It felt like she was getting played, and she did not like that. But Regina didn't let that anger get out of hand. She would have probably done the same in their place, and they hadn't even asked her for anything yet. Now, if she actually got drawn into this war, that would be a different story. In the meantime, she focused on preparing and growing her hive. She'd already decided that she would focus on making more war drones for now. Given the current situation, they could reliably and productively have several of them put to work under the control of one of her sapient drones. Once she had a few dozen of them, she might focus more heavily on increasing the sapient drones' numbers. Regina went out a few more times to hunt down monsters, accompanied by a few of her warriors. They even took along a few war drones. It seemed those could level up just like any other person or monster. Sending them in groups against the weakest of monsters proved to be the best strategy to get them past the first level, although it took more fights that way. She'd already noticed that the system must adjust how much experience one gained for a fight based on several factors, like whether or not one was in a party and everyone's relative levels. Regina reached level 11 a few days later, which increased her hive limit for sapient drones to 28 and the limit for swarm drones to 16. She got the feeling that with a bit of practice or some more levels, she might actually be able to influence which of the caps got expanded. Although she didn't have anything concrete to base that supposition on, it was just a hunch. For now, she filled up her limit of war drones while the hive continued their expansion. They finished a few houses, though those were honestly little more than huts with four walls and a thatched roof. They also kept working on the defensive palisade, though that was slow going. Regina had marked out the part of the forest they would clear first, and started burning out the stumps of trees they'd felled. At least they were in no danger of running out of trees anytime soon, and clearing the forest further would give them more space to build on or to use for other projects. She used her conjuration magic sparingly to create a few things they needed. Mostly, that meant small amounts of metal, which she already created in the basic shapes that were needed. She talked with Mia and made plans to start making charcoal and build a proper forge. Although that would need to wait a little, since they had more important projects to tackle first, and not enough metal or or to make it worthwhile. But she was starting to realize that what they needed most was still knowledge, and not just in the abstract sense, but practical know-how on how to make and use stuff on a medieval technology level. They could muddle through a bit with experimentation and the workers' instincts, but that would only take them so far. And while Regina might know a bit about electronic and more advanced technology, they simply had no basis for building it. They needed to make the tools to make the tools to make something like an electrical generator. Although a proper old-fashioned water wheel would probably be more useful at the moment. That was what convinced her to call the current meeting, as she gathered around the fireplace with her original four drones. We all understand how much we need more knowledge and understanding, my queen, Mia said after she'd told them what she was considering. But how much could we realistically hope to learn even if we sent someone to the human village? They probably know at least some things that would be very useful, Max said. I think the issue is whether they would agree to teach us. The others nodded. We don't know anything about the situation there, Tim said. To be fair, that's one reason that I do think we need to find out more. But it's possible the Delvers are still there and would attack any drone they find. It's even possible they've turned the previously helpful humans against us so that those would do the same. So, it's risky even if it might be necessary, Regina concluded. Yes, my queen, Tim answered. And not just for whoever we send, that's not why I'm concerned. But do we want to tip them off that we're still in the area? Especially since we probably have much better odds of learning something useful from the elves, Max added. We'd just have to wait for their next group to come. It would make us even more dependent on them, though, Tia said. Regina sighed and tugged on her mandibles. 
they all had good points. For now, we need to get a better idea of what's happening over there, she finally said. The elf said that they're rebuilding the fort, but I'd like to confirm that. Then it might be helpful to even just watch the village from a distance, and scout out the area a little more thoroughly. The drones nodded. As you say, my queen, Max said. So who do you want to send? I was going to ask one of the scouts. Max and Tim exchanged a look. Then we should pick at least a few warriors to go with them, my queen, Max said. There are still monsters around. Regina nodded. Right. Not either of you two, though. I need you here. And she didn't want to risk them. Even without considering her personal attachment, they were her most experienced and highest level warriors. Neither of them looked happy, but they didn't protest or point out that they were the only ones who'd actually been there. Then I suggest Ben and Dan, my queen, Tim said after a moment. They're the highest level after us. I'd put Ben in charge, he has a good head on his shoulders. All right, she said. Make the arrangements, then. Half an hour later, the scouting group set off, the two young drone warriors accompanying Ada. Regina had debated sending a few war drones along, but decided against it. They were too weak to be of much use, considering they'd need to level up a lot just to have the same stats as a normal level one and she didn't want to send too big a group. With that matter taken care of, Regina tuned her attention to the next important point she wanted to consider, the structure of their settlement and the hive. She met with Mia and Tia again while Max and Tim went off to help the other warriors hunt or cut down trees. You can probably guess what I wanted to talk about, she began. Do we need or want an underground part of this hive? Mia frowned thoughtfully. The three of them sat around the low-burning campfire, and she perched on top of a tree stump, dangling her legs. In contrast, Regina sat on a small pile of monster pelts, which had to be more comfortable. The boys would probably say that it would have a lot of defensive potential, Tia said when Mia didn't speak up right away. Especially if we have actual tunnels and stuff. Regina nodded. I know. But how feasible is it? Can we do a proper underground hive system? If they could build something like that, it would be great, but so far, she'd hesitated. At least log cabins weren't likely to collapse if someone didn't dig correctly or to get flooded. It should be possible, Mia said. I wouldn't like to dig too close to the lake, though. But farther up, especially in the direction of the rocky hills we saw before, it should be better. So, would it make more sense to wait until our base is a little better established and we can expand? Regina asked. Mia and Tia exchanged a look, then shrugged. If you want my recommendation, my queen, I think we can start right away, Mia said. We'll just have to keep working on it and expand it further in time. Besides, having longer tunnels that connect different places would be one of the advantages of something like this, right? I'll defer to your expertise, Regina said with a small smile. All right, let's do it this way, then. I'd like one of you two to take charge of that project. Maybe I could do it, my queen? Tia offered. Then Mia could keep working on the houses and other buildings. Mia nodded, seemingly agreeing with that suggestion. Okay. Then you're responsible for the fortifications and the underground part, Tia and you for the rest of the work, Mia, Regina stated. She paused and considered the situation for a moment, while Mia and Tia left to get to work. Her hive was starting to get something like a real organization. It was probably inevitable that the older and more experienced drones would end up in charge of their fields. The need to allocate the war drones just reinforced that. At least she hadn't noticed any signs of resentment from the other drones. Regina glanced at their budding village. She was living in one of the cabins at the moment. The drones had insisted on giving her one to herself. They shared the others, and, from what she heard, they were happy with it and wouldn't have wanted their own bedrooms anyway. The war drones usually slept outside in the old shelters, though there were always a few drones on watch at night. It was probably about time to suit actions to words and organize some regular self-defense training for all of the workers. They should work out more of a schedule, too. Regina liked having dinner with all of her hive. 
It gave her the opportunity to see all of them, even though she hadn't talked to much. She sighed, stood up, and stretched. It was time to do some more training. She'd rationed all of her magic, but as she had a little spare mana right now, she was determined to finally get that firebolt spell worked out. She wanted to learn a healing spell, too. She felt like she'd been close. That would need someone to be injured, though. Unless she could practice it on some monsters or animals that were injured in a hunt and not killed. Who knows, maybe making them capture something alive will be good practice for the warriors, anyway. Regina smiled to herself and walked to a tree stump she'd chosen as a target. On her fifth try, she finally managed to set it on fire with her new attack. Shaping the mana correctly wasn't easy, but her control had improved, and she still remembered the pattern precisely. Regina grinned, focusing and forming another spell. She had a headache already and felt like she'd run for a few hours, but she wouldn't let that stop her. After a moment, a new streak of fire flew from her hand and crashed into the tree stump, making it smolder. She pulled up her spell's window, basking in the accomplishment. Spells. Spark. Magic Missile. Lesser Basic Conjuration. Firebolt. Regina smiled to herself and staggered off to find something to eat. Learning more spells would probably get harder from here. Chapter 34, Scouting Mission Ada stepped out of the forest, slowly, carefully. She glanced around, looking out over the vast field. She'd never seen that much grass before in her life, but that was not important to her right now. There was a lot that she hadn't seen before. She listened carefully and tried to parse all of the scents she could catch. The wind was coming from the east, which was helpful. After a few minutes, when she was convinced that there really wasn't anyone else around, she turned and called back. It's okay to come out now. Ben and Dan stepped out from behind the trees. They looked around just like she had, their eyes wide with curiosity. Did you find any points of concern? Ben asked. Ada shook her head. No. The only monsters probably aren't close enough to bother us, and I couldn't find any traces of other people. Still, this area is pretty exposed. Let's move through it quickly, okay? Ben nodded, and they set off together, Ada a few steps in the lead and the two drone warriors behind her. They'd traveled some distance through the forest already, and only encountered two monsters that they had fought off. Mostly the warriors, really. Ben had even gained a level and was level 6 now, while Dan and Ada were both level 5. Ada might be younger than them, but she'd been leveling quickly, probably because she'd done a lot of scouting. Her brother Ace might have reached level 5 first, but Ada had been the first one to speak up and volunteer when their queen asked for one of them to go as part of this little expedition. She wouldn't let her down, but she knew this wouldn't be like the scouting she'd done before. The human dwellings were situated in areas that were too exposed, and there would probably be people actively looking for any potential threats that came near. It was one of the reasons she had decided not to follow the river. That would have been too obvious, and they might be watching it more closely. Still, the human castle was built in the middle of it, so they couldn't go too far. At least Max, Tim and Tia had drawn her maps of the area, as detailed as they could make them, and told her what they'd seen. It was almost as good as if she'd been there herself. And while Ben had been put in charge of their group, he let her do her job and followed her decisions when it came to the scouting part of their mission. Which was really most of their task. They moved slowly, trying to keep low, and use the cover of the high grass. Ada had to suppress a wince occasionally, when one of the warriors' steps would make an especially loud thump. They weren't that good at stealth. But it should be okay, considering they were alone. Anyone close enough to hear their footsteps would know they were there anyway. She just didn't want to be unprofessional. The castle came into sight quickly, making them slow down even more. Even from a distance, Ada could see that its walls had been damaged. There were some discolorations in the stone it was made of. It looked like they'd rebuilt the walls, though, at least the basic structure. Small shapes still swarmed over it, humans at work. A wyvern perched on the roof of one of the corner towers, its head tucked against its back. It looked like it was napping. From what she'd heard, it might mean that wyvern riding mage was here, or someone at least equally powerful. 
she changed course, keeping the distance to the fort open and starting to circle around it. They were definitely watching, and she didn't want them to get discovered. It was probably better to just check on the village and then go from there. Ada told Ben and Dan what she wanted to do, and they nodded. Just check our surroundings carefully, Ben said. I don't want to stumble upon hidden humans. Or hidden monsters. You can keep your eyes open, too, she responded. I may be a scout, but more pairs of eyes are better than just one. The same goes for ears and noses, too. Dan snorted softly, but he didn't say anything. They kept moving in silence. They had deliberately left the forest on the side of the river where the main part of the village was located, so they didn't have to cross it here. The river curved around, anyway, heading off roughly to the northeast. Ada occasionally caught a shimmer or a dark shape moving through the water, showing there might be aquatic monsters. She was glad they didn't have to try and swim in it. This is pretty interesting, Dan said after a few moments. Do you think we'll meet many monsters? Ada resisted the urge to look at him. Keep your voice down, please. And is that why you volunteered for this mission? We didn't volunteer for it, he said. Tim volunteered us. Ada glanced back and raised an eyebrow. She caught Ben thumping Dan in the arm. Then they continued on in silence. The village looked exactly like she'd expected, but she did have good descriptions to go on. It was basically just a cluster of simple homes, not much better than their hive settlement, even if it was much larger. The main road leading there from the castle, and probably further on into the kingdom, was the only one that looked like it would support wagon traffic. There were no paved streets, and the others all seemed to have been built with few right angles. From out here, they couldn't see much. The fields around the village mostly still sported crops, especially grain, but it was trampled in many places. That had to be the effect of the monster horde. There was a pair of men standing at the entrance to the village, wearing a kind of heavy cloth-based armor and metal helmets, and carrying weapons and shields. They didn't look all that fearsome to Ada, but she couldn't read their system descriptions from this far away. Do you see them? Ben asked in a low voice. I can barely make out anything. Ada nodded and started walking to the side, keeping the distance open. I can. There are two guys standing watch. She described what she saw. She was thankful for her first-class ability, keen sight. It was a passive ability that improved her eyesight, especially at long distances. The other options had been improvements to her hearing and sense of smell, but she hadn't picked those because she knew they were already quite good compared to humans, or probably most people, while potential enemies wouldn't expect her eyesight to be this keen. Besides, vision was the sense that covered the longest distance, under most circumstances. They moved around for a few hundred meters, getting a new angle on the village, but didn't really see anything new. Ada wasn't sure whether they should try to get closer from a new direction, where there might be fewer people watching and get a closer look. But she didn't know how many men were keeping watch or where they were stationed, and it was possible some were hidden in a position where she wouldn't see them. We could maybe get closer, if we move away from these soldiers, she said. But it would be a risk. I'm also not sure how much we would really see. Ben nodded. He looked thoughtful. Do you see any indications that there's something important further in? Not really but I'm not exactly an expert on human villages, you know. Let's do it, Dan suggested. I don't want to go back empty-handed. Ben frowned at him. Our pride doesn't matter, Dan, only the good of the hive. It wouldn't be good if we get discovered. At least we've confirmed that they've rebuilt the fort. We could just keep watch on the village for a while and see if we catch sight of anyone who might be a delver. Ada nodded. That sounded smarter to her too. She crouched down, trying to make her presence as inconspicuous as possible, and settled in to watch and wait. They didn't have a hard time limit for their mission, and it was understood that it might take a few days. Absently, she wondered if there'd be new siblings when they got back. After a while, she shifted her weight and glanced around, scanning the fields around them and the horizon to make sure that they were still in the clear. When she came to the forest, she paused. Ben, Dan, she hissed. 
there's someone approaching from the forest, heading towards the village. The boy started and looked backwards. Crap, Ben said. What should we do? Ada glanced at the village. They were still a good distance away from it. We could move sideways, she said, keeping away from the village and away from the other human. We'll have to double back to get back to the village or to where we came from, but we shouldn't encounter any dangerous monsters, at least. All right, Ben said. Lead the way. At least the human probably couldn't see them. They all tried to keep close to the ground as they started moving again. Ada glanced back occasionally. The human was moving quickly. Running at a steady pace, she realized after a moment. They'd already come close enough that she could make out more details. It was a pretty small figure, with a brown cloak and long red hair. Unfortunately, just trying to circle around the village would have them get too close to the river, so she was moving away in a straight line. She checked for monsters and smelled some coming from further ahead and to the north, so she adjusted course again. Wait, Ada said after a few minutes. She's changed course and is coming towards us. Shit, Ben cursed softly. All right, let's move more towards the forest, we might be able to lose her in there. And hurry up. Ada changed course again to follow his directions, but that only let their pursuer catch up more quickly. They started running as well, but they only managed to keep pace instead of opening the distance. Then they finally reached the cover of the forest. Here, Ada had to slow down. She picked her way carefully through the trees, trying to keep the noise down. But this section of the forest had a lot of underbrush, and the warriors were even noisier than her. By now, they could all smell their pursuer getting closer, although it was harder to see through the vegetation. She seemed to be able to track them pretty well, too. Let's stop and wait for her, Ben said in a low voice. Ada, circle around a bit. She nodded and picked up a few sticks, throwing them in the direction they'd been going one after another while she slipped around some trees. It didn't take long for the human to appear. Ada focused on her and looked at the system notification. Janus, level? Mage. She recognized the name from Max's stories, although she didn't know how common it was for humans. Carefully, Ada stepped out from behind her tree, to the side and slightly behind the human. Janice glanced around, then raised a hand in what might be a greeting. Hello. I apologize if you felt threatened, that wasn't my intention. Ben took a step forward, while Dan sidestepped, positioning himself better for a fight. Why did you follow us? Ben asked. I was just curious. You three belong to Regina's group, don't you? Ada managed not to stiffen or give any other tell, but unfortunately, the warriors did. What makes you say that? Ben asked. I don't think there are more of your people around, Janice answered. She cocked her head. You were spying on the village, weren't you? Don't deny it, it's quite obvious, considering where I saw you. We don't mean any harm, Ben said, but he sounded tense. Dan shifted. We should take her with us, he suggested. Our queen can decide what to do about her. Ada tensed. Ben narrowed his eyes, but he didn't immediately refuse the suggestion. Now, let's all calm down, Janice said, clearly trying to sound calm. But the way she glanced around showed that it might just be dawning on her how dangerous of a position she'd put herself in. Why would you do that? I don't mean you or your hive, is it? Any harm. You saw us observing the village, as you said, Ben said. We don't want there to be any unnecessary escalation. But you were in the forest alone, weren't you? I'm not going to go and accuse you of anything, Janice responded. Besides, I think you're a little too paranoid. The Delvers have been gone for a while, and no one in the village has anything against you. But if there was going to be a war, then the humans knowing that the hive was around and had new members might be dangerous. Ada glanced at the others, reading the tension in their postures. Ben was extending his blade arms. They don't know about her, she realized. Right, they were on patrol when Max told her and Ace the story of what had happened in the village, and when they talked about the mission later, no one mentioned any individual villagers. Guys, she said in a low voice. I think our queen might be upset if we tried to kidnap this woman. 
assuming they could even win in a fight. She helped the others. Ben glanced from her to Dan for a long moment, while Ada held her breath. Then he nodded and took half a step back. I apologize if we were rude, he said to Janice. Please just forget about this little incident. All right. Janice smiled slightly, her shoulders sagging in obvious relief. Clearly, she wasn't such a high level that she wanted a three-on-one fight. She stepped backwards. Please tell your queen that I'm happy she and the others got away, and I'd like to take her up on her invitation someday. But it might be best if you all moved deeper into the forest again. With that, she left. The three drones stood there and listened to her go. Ada frowned. Those last words, Janice knew about the war, didn't she? But she didn't tell them about it, just gave a vague suggestion. She certainly wouldn't earn Regina's trust that way, if she was trying to. And she might still talk about their presence here. Well, no one had gotten hurt, at least. Chapter 35, To Grow Stronger Despite Regina's fears, the digging seemed to work out very well. The workers' excavation skill was very useful, and they had a good intuitive understanding of how far and how wide to dig to avoid a potential collapse. She went to inspect the beginning of this more literal hive, the same day she laid more normal drone eggs. She'd decided on one of each template for now. While workers were more useful immediately, the coming war meant she didn't want to fall behind on warriors, and scouts had already proven useful. Tia seemed proud as she showed Regina around the small cave. They'd started it on a hill at the edge of the forest, which was probably good for making the entrance. So far, there was just a dim cavern, barely big enough for a few drones together, although that was probably a good thing when it came to defending it. Then they had the beginning of one tunnel leading away from it on a curving path, and a niche where a second tunnel would start. We intend to dig deeper here and lead a tunnel underground towards the center of the village, Tia explained. But we'll need to talk with the warriors about where best to place that entrance so we can hide it. Regina nodded. Makes sense. She looked around and smiled. There wasn't much light, but she didn't have a problem seeing in the dimness. The place felt cozy, even if the walls were just bare dirt. Keep up the good work, she told Tia and the other worker with her, Ina. Of course, my queen. Regina blinked against the sunlight as she climbed out of the cave, but her eyes adjusted quickly. She stepped away from the entrance, looking out into the forest. I think we should go hunting again, she said. Of course, my queen, Max responded. He had hung around outside, but he liked to keep an eye on her, especially if she was close to or in the forest. Do you want me to come? Regina considered it for a moment. Okay, she said. Just the two of us once again. Max was the strongest drone in her hive, Tim was busy training with the other warriors at the moment, and bringing lower-level drones probably wouldn't help much, especially when it came to experience. She still took along a single war drone, just in case she needed an extra set of hands, or hand analogs. Then they set out into the forest, heading directly away from the camp. The two of them walked quietly, trying not to spook any potential prey. Stronger monsters had begun slowly trickling back into the area, although from the reports she got, it still wasn't anything she'd have to worry about. Still, they had only walked for 15 minutes before they encountered the first level 10 monster, a flame-tongue wolf that appeared to be a loner. Regina gestured at Max, then stepped aside and crept forward. After a moment, he leaped at the monster, which was sitting in the sun in a small clearing. The wolf jumped up immediately, but Max's charge brought him there in an instant. Regina exhaled and launched a firebolt. The attack struck the wolf in the side, just as it was ducking a swipe from Max. Its fur sizzled and it jumped aside and shook itself. There didn't seem to be any major damage, though. Maybe she should have expected it to be resistant to flame-based attacks. Regina narrowed her eyes and stepped closer, then dodged to the side as a tongue of flame lashed out at her. She felt the heat on her right arm and side, but she'd managed to evade most of it. Max made the monster pay for it, cutting a deep gash into its side. The wolf started to back away, perhaps looking for an opening to retreat, but Regina stepped to the side and launched a magic missile at it. The attack hit its injured side, and the force of it sent the monster stumbling and losing its footing. Max pushed it down, then cut it again. 
Regina approached and thrust at it with the simple spear she'd taken along, ending its life. That was good, she said, grinning. I can have the war drone take it back to the camp and we can continue. As you wish, my queen. Perhaps you should summon a second one, then. Regina nodded. That would be more efficient than sending one back and forth. She focused on it and sent the commands out telepathically, which she found easier to do with the simple drones. Then they continued on. For the next hour, they didn't find any other monster worth a fight. They had to change course and head sideways because she didn't want to get too far from her hive. The forest was thicker here, the underbrush making it harder to move, especially without making much noise. Then, they finally found a level 11 troll. They crept closer slowly, since it seemed occupied with picking bugs from under a fallen log. But then it stopped and turned towards them, growling. Max jumped forward, capturing its attention. Regina circled to the side and did a few probing stabs with her spear. The monster wasn't very good at evading, though it had thick skin. They settled in for a long fight, as she cut the troll and opened several bleeding wounds while Max kept its attention and weathered several blows. Then Regina heard a soft rustle and smelled a new scent. She broke off and turned to the side. After a moment, she lunged forward, stabbing her spear into a bundle of darkness that was just on the side of another tree. The shadowing stalker hissed, its disguise fading. She hadn't managed to score a major injury, but the troll turned towards them, roaring. Max used the opportunity to send two swings into its neck in quick succession. The monster stumbled for a moment before falling. Regina retreated, holding the stalker off. A moment of focus showed it was level 10. Then Max used charge again, appearing at its side quickly and scoring a deep gash in its flank. The monster yelled and turned at him, but he ducked its swipe. Regina focused for a moment, then launched a magic missile. The magical projectile hit it right in the eyes, and it shivered violently, seizing up. But Regina didn't watch its death throes, as she finally got the notification she'd been hoping for. You have leveled up. Regina glanced at the system screen and frowned. She'd been hoping for another spell. Maybe having learned one herself had an effect? She shook her head and decided to think about it later. For now, she ordered the war drone to carry the dead shadowing stalker, then set off back towards their camp with Max. She hadn't been in this part of the woods before, and looked around, trying to imprint it on her memory. Which level are you now again? She asked Max. Still level 11 he responded with a sideways look. And you didn't get another ability? No, I'm hoping there'll be one for level 12. On the way back, they kept talking about their class skills, trying to speculate which ones Max and the other warriors might get later. He was hoping for something that increased his toughness and ability to defend others. She'd noticed he was clearly focused on defense. Regina was just curious to see how things like that would impact the way his stat points would be distributed as he leveled up. After a while, they neared the camp and she realized that there was more noise than she would have expected. Regina frowned and reached out to her telepathic connection, taking a look through the war drone's senses. Then she started running to get back, with Max following her. I really need to get into the habit of checking on the hive when I'm away. They had more visitors. This time, there was a wagon, standing on the field near the cabins, with two horses being unhitched from it. About six elves had accompanied it, including Bionorn and a few others she recognized. The drones all kept working as she returned, clearly unsurprised at her and Max's approach. B was helping a red-haired elf with the horses, letting them graze on the field. The other visitors turned to them. Bionorn stepped forward and inclined his head. Hive Queen Regina. It is good to see you. I apologize for dropping by unannounced. No need to apologize, we're happy to see you, she replied with a smile that was mostly genuine. In fact, there were a few things I wanted to discuss. Oh? The others started unloading the wagon or just looking around while he continued the conversation. We brought some things that should help you establish yourself. Chiefly some fabric and various tools. Is there anything we need to discuss right away? I don't think so. I was hoping to accompany you to your city, though, or at least send one of the others. 
Max tensed up a little beside her, probably unhappy with the idea that she'd be leaving. Bayanorn raised an eyebrow, but he didn't seem particularly surprised. We will need to adjust our defensive measures, as I believe Anuus mentioned to you, he said. Regina nodded. I know, but this is important. There is a lot of knowledge that we need, which I hope to find in your city. It's simply the best place for it. It will allow us to grow stronger. Which, I believe, is in your interests, considering what you told us of this war. Does that mean we have your promise to support us in the war? Of course not. Does it look like we have the ability to fight a war, even if we wanted to? Regina gestured at the surrounding camp. This was all they had, a few simple huts, and some low-level drones. But our people do grow in strength quickly, and we wouldn't just meekly go away if someone sent soldiers and tried to move in on this area. Well, if they were obviously outmatched, then she would probably cut her losses, even if her territorial side disliked it. She didn't point that out, but he probably expected it anyway. I see, Bionorn replied with a faint frown. He inclined his head. I will be happy to accompany one of your people to the city, in any case. Who should I be expecting? Regina glanced at her drones. A few warriors were hanging around. The older and stronger drones stood closer to her. Tim, she said after a moment. She hadn't missed the elf's look. While Tim might be a warrior, he was certainly no muscle head, and he seemed to have gotten along well with the elves when they had helped them previously. I won't disappoint you, my queen, Tim promised. He gave the elf a slight smile. I look forward to it, Bionorn. Likewise, the man responded with a nod. Regina sat back on her seat and took a moment to consider the situation. Her gaze was drawn to Ada, who stood waiting and watching with a serious expression on her face. She'd heard the scouting group's report when they got back, and had the feeling there would be consequences in the future. She didn't blame any of the drones. They'd acted pretty well in the situation they'd found themselves in. At least it hadn't come to violence, and Janice would probably not betray their presence to the Delvers or anything like that. Still, it was entirely possible that other humans had seen them, or that Janice would mention the encounter after all. In any case, it had caused her to rethink her idea of sending drones to the human village, to ask for knowledge, or training. She couldn't rely on them to handle things perfectly, which wasn't their own fault, just a consequence of their short lives, lack of experience and the situation. While she could give them directions, that would require her to know when to focus on them, so it wouldn't be very helpful for surprises. And even if they were perfect diplomats, things could still go very wrong. With the humans apparently preparing for war and maybe even to move into the forest, giving them information on her hive seemed like something to avoid. She hadn't seriously considered doing as Janice suggested and moving deeper into the forest. They'd built too much here for her to simply abandon it, and she wouldn't let the shadow of war chase her out of her own territory just like that. Regina glanced around at her hive again, smiling to herself a little. They were growing, and quickly. With more information on this world, she'd be able to guide her hive even better. And they needed to level up. Monsters were one thing, but the forest only had so many of them, and their levels also seemed pretty limited, at least out here. Regina had no desire to kill people, but maybe this war wasn't such a bad thing in some ways. She'd just need to play her cards well. But why shouldn't she look to strengthen her hive, and maybe expand her territory, if people were already going to war? Regina shook her head to herself. First things first. She didn't even have an army capable of playing any role in such a big conflict. Yet. Chapter 36, The City of Trees The wagon rumbled its way along the road, moving quicker now than it had at the start of their journey. Tim glanced back at a creaking sound, but none of the elves seemed concerned. To be fair, the wagon was well constructed and obviously suited to moving through the forest. It was long but narrow, able to wind its way through trees more easily, and its wheels seemed very broad. They were made of some kind of wood he hadn't seen before, that appeared springy and elastic. This road seems a little odd, be commented in a whisper. Not bad, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't look to be reinforced. If it saw heavy traffic or bad weather, it seems like it would devolve into mud. The road indeed barely deserved the name at first glance. 
It was marked by the absence of trees, cutting a straight lane through the forest. But the grass that made up its surface seemed perfectly even, and he hadn't seen any major bumps. They must know what they're doing, Tim answered. He was glad that B ended up accompanying him to the elven city. Not that he disliked the elves, but he couldn't help but feel nervous, and having another drone with him helped. Especially since Regina apparently wasn't able to contact them anymore. She'd been checking in on them regularly, but he hadn't felt the presence of her mind in a while. The last time, it had seemed muted, as if it was weakened by the distance. They'd been traveling for some time and should reach the city soon, at least. It was hard to measure the distance, but Tim estimated that his queen's range was about 50 kilometers. Judging by what Bionorn had said and a glimpse of the map he'd seen, the elven city should be about 70 kilometers from the hive. He didn't know how accurate his guess was, though. Well, there was nothing he could do about it. Tim shook his head and focused on the trip. They'd been traveling quite quickly since they broke camp this morning, at a steady pace that ate up the distance, with only a short stop for lunch. He was glad his end stat had risen with his last level up, even if he and B had ridden on the wagon for a bit here and there. We're almost there. Bionorn let himself fall back to join them and smiled cheerfully. As soon as we crest that rise, we should be able to see the city. Tim smiled back. He was looking forward to it. They weren't able to see much of it, though. The trees still blocked most of their view. But Tim saw enough to realize that the city was larger than he expected. It seemed to stretch on for kilometers, and he could catch glimpses of buildings and structures a large distance away. There didn't seem to be a single city wall, but rather several stretches of wooden wall. What do we need to do to be able to enter? he asked Bionorn. There's a small ritual, he replied. Just come with me and your companion can go with the other group. It shouldn't take long, but we'll need to take a detour. Apparently, they had to travel to a location some distance outside the city, to key in visitors. For security reasons, ostensibly. Bionorn and a few of the other elves left the wagon behind and jogged off into the forest, and Tim followed them. Finally, they reached a small wooden shrine. He couldn't sense magic but he had the impression that he would have felt quite a bit of it if he'd been able to. There was a small compound around the central building, with a stone wall encircling it. Just put a few drops of your blood into the bowl here and we'll take care of the rest, Bionorn said as they entered. Tim looked around. The room was bare and almost cramped. Another elf wearing a dark robe entered from a door opposite theirs, barely glancing at him. There was a stone podium in the middle of the room, with various odds and ends, including a small bowl. Tim carefully nicked his lower left arm with his blade limb and let a few drops of blood drip into it. The other man picked up the bowl, and Bionorn said, All right, let's head back. That's it? It'll all be ready by the time we get there. Tim shot a curious glance at the ritual space, but let Bionorn lead him out of the room. The elf took off without another word and he had to hurry to follow him back towards the city. B was there by the time they returned, and the group continued on their way. Soon, the forest lightened up around them, and when they walked down the slope of a hill, he found himself passing beside a wall and into the outer part of the settlement. Welcome to Aridel. Bionorn smiled at them. Their earlier glimpse hadn't done the city justice, Tim realized. There were a few buildings on ground level, but the elves had also built upwards, into the trees. It had looked like the city was mostly hidden by trees. Actually, there were simply a lot of trees making up the city, providing structure and buildings. It looked like a larger version of the outpost they'd stayed at, but more solid. There were proper roads on the ground, but also an equivalent higher up. It looked like they were mostly, like many of the building's walls, grown right out of trees. But as they traveled further into the city, he noticed that this was only one level of it, too. There were large holes, open shafts leading down below ground, usually with wooden structures leading out of them and upwards. They had staircases and bundles of ropes that were probably elevators. From the placement of these access points and the occasional glimpse below under a tree's root systems, he realized that the city simply incorporated an underground part. All of this made it hard to judge how large it really was. It covered a wide area, a lot bigger than the human village 
but the different levels meant there were probably a lot more inhabitants than the perimeter size suggested. And he could see quite a few of those out and about, walking on the roads and tree paths, occasionally swinging from ropes or heading down into the ground. Most of them were elves like those he'd seen before and dressed similarly, though most didn't carry weapons. But he also saw a few other races. There were some shorter people that might be dwarves or halflings or something, some he couldn't place, and even a few humans. As Bayanorn led them through the city, most of the people they passed looking curiously at them. They mainly stayed on a paved, wide road that was probably a main road and led straight into the city. As they reached what had to be the center of it, the city grew more open, with the buildings being farther apart. Finally, they reached one that seemed to be built entirely on the ground, with trees incorporated only subtly, but it still rose at least four stories high. There were a few elves standing outside, dressed in dark green clothes with a cloak that probably constituted a uniform, and carrying sheathed swords and bows. Bionorn exchanged nods with them, then led Tim and B inside one of the entrances, without pausing to talk. Tim followed quietly, turning his head to take in everything. The sounds and smells of the city were almost overpowering, but it was a little quieter here. They passed through a wood-paneled corridor and into a small atrium with a field of flowers planted on one side. A large table and some chairs stood to the side, and an elven woman rose from one of them as they walked in. Tim regarded her curiously. In eyes of Ari Dell, level? Mistress of the forest. She was the first elf Tim had seen up close, who actually looked old. Her hair was entirely gray and fell down to her shoulders, shorter than most elven women he'd seen. Her face was lined with wrinkles, though there seemed to be more laugh lines than frown lines. She had eyes of a dark orange color that still looked vibrant. Her posture was a little bent, though, and she had a cane in one hand. Tim didn't know how old she was, but given that elves were famously long-lived, it could easily be several centuries. Her class sounded powerful, too. Regina had told him to be polite. He gave a short bow, which Bee copied. Hello. I am Tim, and this is my sister Bee. It is a pleasure to meet you. The elf smiled at them. My name is Anise, and it is a true pleasure to meet you. Do sit down, please. I would have liked to meet your hive queen herself, but I suppose it was always a foolish notion. Of course she cannot leave her hive so easily. Tim sat down on one of the offered chairs, exchanging a glance with B. That's true, he replied. You sound like you are familiar with the concept of a hive and hive queen? Oh, not so much. She waved her cane airily. But that would be true for any leader in her position, I imagine. We are aware of how quickly your hive is growing. In any case, I imagine you must have questions. We have some things to discuss. Oh, and if you would like some refreshments, please help yourselves. Tim nodded, ignoring the glasses of water and plate of fruit and snacks on the table. Are you a part of the government, then? Yes, I am. She smiled again. I am a special minister, to be precise. That means I do not have an official portfolio, but I am involved in the governing of the state. It's a more common position for us than you'd think. At that moment, Tim wished Regina had a drone diplomat or drone politician to take his place here. He was a warrior, not someone you should send to talks like this. But his mother had chosen him, and he'd do his best. Thank you for all the help your people have already given us, he said. I have to admit there is still much we do not know, and we were hoping to learn some of these things coming here. I have already arranged for you to get tours of some crafters' workshops and the city's library later, Anise replied. If there is anything else you would like, please feel free to speak up. That will be very helpful. We appreciate it. He glanced at B, who nodded enthusiastically. If possible, we would also like to look at some maps, and perhaps have longer discussions about the history and politics of the region. Beyond that, we have questions about the system. Anise inclined her head. As expected. I will not ask where your hive came from on our first meeting, but information about the system, especially about classes and other specifics, is usually valued highly and losing guarded knowledge of this sort would be a dreadful blow to many groups. 
I do not think we will be able to help you much in that regard, though. Tim shook his head. Just some general knowledge would already be helpful. For instance, we are unsure if or how the quality of being a demi-human is based on the system. The elf pursed her lips slightly. A complicated matter to start with. As you likely know, elves are considered humanoid, not demi-humans. The difference is usually academic, or at most, a matter of designations and restrictions. The basic structure of the system is the same, although there are differences that underpin this distinction. And the difference between monsters and demi-humans? She raised an eyebrow and leaned forward slightly. An even more interesting matter. Despite what some might say, the line between monsters and demi-humans is broad and sometimes difficult to pin down. At least when we are talking about sapient monsters. They are rare, but there are more than just dragons. There is some debate in academic circles, but generally, the main difference is considered to be that demi-humans, like humanoids, choose a class, while monsters are simply born as whatever they may be. Tim exchanged a glance with B. That was interesting. All of the drones, even their queen herself, really, had been born with what she called their template. That would mean they were closer to sapient monsters than demi-humans on this line. On the other hand, they did have abilities called class skills. Monsters may evolve when they reach level 20, and eyes continued, similar to a humanoid's class evolution. Well, it is called that in common parlance, but the technical term would be class progression, to distinguish it. A monster's evolution seems to be more comprehensive and includes physical changes. Of course, demi-humans may experience those as well when evolving. She reached for a glass of water and took a sip, but didn't take her eyes from him. She must be wondering why he asked about this, and she was giving them a lot of information. Tim couldn't shake the impression that she'd seen through him. And could you tell us about the assignment and effective stat points, he asked, changing the subject. And I smiled slightly. Of course. I do consider myself something of an amateur scholar. The first thing you should be aware of is that the stat points in one status sheet are a reflection of reality filtered through the system, rather than some sort of causal mechanism. Tim leaned back and listened attentively to her explanations. He needed to commit everything to memory and bring it back to his hive. Chapter 37, Back Home As soon as she established contact with Tim's mind again, Regina felt like a rock she'd been carrying dropped from her shoulders. They hadn't been caught completely unprepared, of course. It was one reason Regina had decided not to send some war drones with Tim and B. She suspected there might be a range limit to her link with the hive, and she didn't know what would happen if they got outside of it. It was something to test, but not with the elves there and on an important trip that was supposed to be quick. And that caution turned out to be warranted. They'd been gone for a few days now. She'd tried to check in every few hours, and she'd felt the connection growing weaker as they traveled. At around 50 kilometers, she hadn't been able to talk to them or take control of the drones anymore. That limit would hopefully grow as she leveled up, but it was already not as bad as she'd feared. Are you okay? She asked first. She felt Tim nod. It was still hard to get a clear impression of his senses, although that was improving as he traveled closer. I'll just talk out loud, he murmured. That should be easier. He glanced back, and she saw that he was walking alone with B, ahead of a group of three elves, who were apparently escorting them back. Tell me what happened. How was the city? What did you learn? Tim hesitated for a moment before he began describing the city. Regina listened with rapt attention, only faintly feeling the heat on her skin from where she sat close to the campfire in their hive settlement. It really was a shame that she hadn't been able to see the city through his eyes, it sounded interesting. They brought us to a wooden building in the center that probably belonged to the government. There, we met alone with an old elven woman, one in eyes of Ari Dell, high-level mistress of the forest, a special minister of their government. She gave us a lot of information. I'll try to retell it as closely as I can. Regina frowned to herself as she listened to Tim narrate their meeting. That really was a lot of interesting information. She stayed quiet and simply tucked it away in her mind. We met her again a few times after that, but only briefly, Tim concluded. 
From what you said, it sounds like this Anais knew more than she was letting on. Tim hesitated, and she could sense the faint echo of a flash of uncertainty. He must have trouble parsing her message. Her telepathy still wasn't that clear. I think she did know a lot, maybe even more about us than she admitted, he said. I didn't think it was wise to push her, though. You're right. She wanted to meet the elf herself at some point. Hopefully, she'd be able to get more information. How did the rest of your stay go? Tim continued his tale as they traveled through the forest. There was a lot of interesting knowledge and observations in his tours of elven workshops, but even more in the library. They hadn't been able to bring any books with them, but Tim and B had both spent some time reading. Regina was already planning to gather other drones and have the two of them recount what they'd read in as much detail as possible as soon as they got back. If only they had proper writing materials. Making paper was something she'd thought about. Along with making a printing press. That shouldn't need particularly advanced technology. Who knows, it might even exist in this world already. I didn't see many signs of the war, Tim finally said. Of course, I'm not sure what I should look for, anyway. There were few soldiers in the city, or at least few elves carrying weapons. It's possible they are all somewhere else, maybe gathered at the border. I didn't have the impression that they were concerned about enemies making it into the city, and if those defenses they have are as powerful as they seem, I can see why. I would have to have been in the city before, to actually tell if there was more of an atmosphere of concern now than usual. Regina nodded. I understand. Good work, anyway, Tim. Did you find out anything more about their military strength? I didn't find much else, my queen. They didn't give us a close look at their fortifications or any defensive enchantments they're probably using. Most of the elves seem to favor bows and swords or similar weapons, and I didn't see any mounted soldiers, but they do have horses. Besides that, they also seem to rely on mages for fighting. Regina recalled what Anuus had said when they first met. That made sense. Then she became aware of a sudden clamor. It took her a moment to realize that it was not coming from Tim's surroundings, but that someone was yelling on her side. I need to go, she sent, but you two are doing good work. Keep hurrying back. She turned her attention to her own body, blinking as she opened her eyes. After a second, she realized that Max was calling for her. I'm here, she said, standing up. She felt a bit stiff, but it faded quickly as she took a few steps. What's up? Max looked relieved. He'd been hovering a few meters away. Now that she focused on it, Regina could see that a group of war drones and most of their remaining warriors were streaming towards the edge of the forest. The workers seemed to have encountered a problem, he said. We should hurry. Regina didn't ask any more questions, but started running towards where the drones were gathering. As she did, she briefly dipped into the consciousness of other drones in her hive, skimming along the surface to get a quick picture of what was happening. She never stayed long, since she needed to keep some of her attention on running. But it was enough to give her a general sense of the situation. You, go fetch our medical supplies, she called to one of the war drones. Then she slid to a stop in front of the entrance to the tunnel Tia and a group of drones had been digging. It was broader now than it had been, but still too cramped. Just as she arrived, Tia stumbled out, one of her work limbs hanging limply down and blood dripping down her left leg. At the same time, warriors tried to head in. Everyone back off, Regina barked. Max and I will go in first. Max, protect Ina and get her out. Max didn't hesitate but charged forward right away as the other drones immediately gave him space. Regina followed him in as quickly as she could. In the cavern beyond the entrance, she found Ace kneeling on the ground, cradling one of his arms. He must have been closest and been the first to respond. Beside him, Max slid in front of Ina, covering her, while the young worker was stumbling back, falling onto her back. She didn't manage to get up again. Regina took it all in at a glance, her attention focused on the threat. The creature Max had just pushed back looked a bit like a mole, but much bigger, with thorny spikes on the front of its body, large teeth, and claws that were clearly good not just for digging. Behind it, a group of several more crowded in where the cavern transitioned to the tunnel. 
After a moment, the system gave her its information. Tunler, fighter, level? She hadn't seen the system use such a clarification before, which implied that there were several types of these monsters. Of those she could see, a few were at level 10 or 12, which meant the others were hopefully only a level or two higher. Regina drew herself up and hissed at them, almost surprising herself with the action. It had been a while since she'd done that. The first tunnler scuttled back a step, but then stopped, and while the others shifted a little, they didn't seem inclined to flee, either. Ben and Dan, come in if you can, she called out, still keeping her gaze locked on the monsters. The two were the highest level warriors present after Max, someone get Ace and Ina out. She considered opening with a firebolt, but she didn't want to use that spell in these close quarters. She also didn't have that much mana. The monster had obviously had enough of waiting and posturing, and lunged forward. At the same time, its companions advanced as well, shrieking angrily. Max's blade limb crashed down on the first tunnler, sending it back half a meter and pinning it to the ground for a moment. Then his second one swept out to hold back the others. Regina gathered her courage and jumped forward. She didn't have a weapon on her, but she still had her claws, which were sharp enough to cut most monsters' skin. She jumped on the first tunnler, using its position and her greater size, to her advantage. Its claws skittered off the shell on the side of her leg, and she rammed her own into its eyes. It spasmed for a second, then went still. Instinct made her look up and she twisted out of the way as a second tunnler barreled at her. She managed to avoid the worst of it, but its claws sunk into her side and penetrated this time before momentum ripped them out again. Pain pulsed through her as she felt her cracked shell but she ignored it, dodging again and jumping onto the tunnler. She managed to pin it down, though it didn't give her a good angle to kill it. Then Ben was there, swinging down onto its head with his axe. Gore splattered as the tunnler died. Regina shoved it away and jumped up, turning to the fight. Max was holding off three other tunnlers by himself. Just at that moment, Dan stepped out from beside him and skewered one of the monsters. He didn't manage to kill it, though and another one used the opportunity to jump at him. But Max was there, shouldering Dan aside and intercepting the attack. The monster's teeth slid off the shell of his arm. Regina ran forward, watching for the right moment, before she swiped her claws at the injured monster, ending its fight. Beside her, Ben and Dan cornered the other one, cutting it down systematically with their blade limbs. Max was focusing on the last one. Regina sighed, then formed a magic missile and launched it at the monster. The magical attack threw it back against the wall of the tunnel, allowing Max to skewer it through its belly. That was all of them. You have leveled up. My queen. Are you injured? Dan hovered at her side, watching her with concern. She waved him off. I'm fine. But the others might not be. With a muffled groan, she turned around and hurried out of the tunnel. She knew Max would make sure that no new tunnlers would be able to slip in from where their tunnels must have intersected with the hive's tunnels. Ace sat on the grass by the entrance. She could see that while he was obviously injured, it didn't seem to be life-threatening. But a few meters away, the other drones had laid Ina out on the grass. The young worker looked pale, and the blood covering her made it hard to tell her exact injuries. Tia was trying to clean it up with a wet cloth while the war drone Regina had called earlier dropped off the basket they kept what served as medical supplies in. It was very bare, just a few rolls of cloth for bandages and a few dried herbs that were supposed to be beneficial according to what they'd heard from the elves. Regina knelt down next to Ina, pressing her down gently as the drone tried to rise. She took a deep breath. From up close, she could tell it wasn't quite as bad as she'd feared. Her left thigh showed several bloody gashes, her work limb shell had cracked, and she had a bloody but shallow cut on her head. Not as bad as Tia's injuries had been. But INA's constitution was still low. It's okay, she said, trying to sound soothing. We've got this. You're going to survive. Just stay still and let me take a look, okay? Of course, my queen, Ina whispered. Regina frowned to herself. She still had some mana left, and if this wasn't the situation to try to learn magical healing, she didn't know what was. So she placed her hands on Ayane's injuries and started breathing deeply, trying to focus on it. 
It was easier than the last time, perhaps because she'd done it before. She gathered her mana and tried to slowly push it through her hands. As she did so, she focused on the wound, trying to take in every detail and visualize those she couldn't see. After a while, her mana started leaving her in a trickle. Regina almost lost focus, but kept it up. She concentrated on the idea of Ina regaining the blood she lost, of her cuts closing up. She encouraged her stem and progenitor cells to divide, the cells of her muscles and skin to notice the emptiness beside them and work to fill it. Then she added the idea of her brain settling down into equilibrium, weathering the effects of pressure and mechanical trauma. Time once again lost its meaning as Regina fed her mana into the construct in her head and her drone's body. She commanded it to obey her will and heal. Finally, her mana level noticeably dipped, and the flow stopped. Regina blinked. The injuries had closed up. Not perfectly, but they looked a lot better. Blood had stopped flowing and they were mostly scabbed over. Regina exhaled and moved back. She focused on the notification the system held for her. Congratulations, you have learned a new spell, basic heal. Regina smiled. Make sure to rest. That goes for you, too, Ace and Tia. I'll heal you in a minute. The drones all nodded and stepped away, clearly understanding that she wanted some space. Ben helped Ina to her feet and led her off, towards the huts. Regina closed her eyes and just enjoyed the sensation of the sun on her skin for a moment, before she opened them again. She glanced around, making sure everything was okay, before she returned her attention to the system. There was something else to check out. Congratulations, you have unlocked a new template, Drone Harvester. You are able to lay another egg. Choose carefully what you will add to your hive, Drone Warrior. Drone Worker. Drone Scout. Drone Harvester. Regina smiled, stretched, then headed off to the closest shelter. She already had three eggs in development, but with her increases in her mana capacity and regeneration, and this new level, she felt she could do four. She was looking forward to seeing the new drone type. Interlude, Embers 2. Kiera Linz bent further over her horse's neck, feeling the wind in her hair as she thundered down the road. Her smile was unrestrained, free where no one could see it. After a long moment of enjoyment, she sat back and lightly tugged on the reins. Her horse, well-trained as she was, slowed down immediately, dropping from the gallop into an easy trot. Kiera sat deep in the saddle, weathering the bumpy gait with the ease of long practice. It was not a minute too soon. The area around them opened up, and after the curve in the road, they came upon the castle right away. Kiera glanced back at her escorts. They had fallen back a little during her wild gallop, but had caught up now. She slowed down further to a fast walk, straightening up. The men gathered beside the path and guarding the gate did the same as she approached. She noted that most of them saluted with the local fist-to-chest gesture instead of bowing, which she approved of. Maybe it was because of her own more martial appearance. She already knew some of the ladies in her father's court would be scandalized. Here she was, not just spurning the side saddle, but actually wearing trousers. Of course, if she did wear skirts, they would be either an annoyance, stifling in the summer heat or she'd risk more impropriety, especially at a fast gallop like before. In any case, Kiara did not care too much. She wasn't the only woman to act like this, whatever the sticks in the mud might think, and normal court life was far away. War tended to do that, she'd been told. She smiled to herself at the thought. She was wearing not just trousers, but also light chainmail over a thin gambeson, though her helmet dangled off the saddle for now. The short riding sword at her side felt comfortable, and while she was not hoping she would have to use it, she was confident in her ability if it came to that. The castle and its surroundings were still a bustle of activity, although Kiera knew that this belied how many people were actually here. She'd been to this castle before, of course, several times, and knew well that it was considerably smaller than her father's main seat in his capital. There weren't many more soldiers around than normal, and many of those men who had been called up in addition were with the king's army, gathering to leave for Nerlia, for the actual war. Most of the rest had been sent to various forts and holdings closer to the forest. Still, there were several hundred men gathered here, a sizable reserve force. 
she had heard the reports on the levee and the conditions of the roads and knew it would not take too long to reach any spot where trouble might break out, either. She was aware that her father, Marquis Linz, hoped that none of them would be needed, that they would not have to fight the elves, in the forest or otherwise. Although a part of Kiera couldn't help but think about the glory and valor that might be earned in such a case, she knew he was right. She had been raised to put her duty to the march before her personal desires as well as to support her father loyally, and she didn't doubt her ability to do that, either. He might not quite see it the same way, though. After she dismounted in the outer courtyard and handed the reins off to a servant, she looked around, hoping to catch a glimpse of her father. Instead, she saw the latest addition to his court, and her own entourage, come towards her. I hope your ride was pleasant, milady, she said, smiling tentatively. It was productive, Kiera replied. Then she forced herself to return the smile and continue in a more pleasant tone. We familiarized ourselves with the surroundings and checked on the progress of the fortifications nearby. Janice nodded seriously. Kiera peered at her for a moment, looking for a sign of aversion or confusion, but found none. Perhaps she should not use her usual standards, she chided herself. The red-haired girl was young, more than a year younger than Kiera, but she was a mage. And a largely self-taught one at that. There was her background to consider, too. Kiera was not blind to what it meant about the girl's talent and potential, or her usefulness. She still couldn't help but feel a little disgruntled that her father had foisted Janice off on her. The girl barely knew any spells and was still at a relatively low level, and hardly the knowledgeable, educated advisor you wanted in a court mage. But Kiera knew it could simply be that her father saw Janice's potential and wanted his daughter involved in cultivating it forming bonds early that might earn her the loyalty of a powerful asset later. And having a mage along was probably a good thing in these times, all else aside. It wasn't like they could just be found on the street. Milady, a high-level man arrived from the direction of the capital a few minutes ago, Janice reported, interrupting her thoughts. From his aura, I estimate he is at least over level 40, more likely 60. He came on a horse, but did not seem used to riding. I believe the Marquis is meeting with him either already or very soon. Kiera nodded and gave the mage a more genuine smile. That is good to know. Thank you, Janice. The other girl bowed her head, then fell into step with Kiera as she hurried around the other horses and men and towards the doors. The soldiers at the sides of the gate snapped to attention and pushed it open for her. She nodded at them before she stepped through. Showing respect to her men was one of the lessons her father had drilled into her, even if he had always done it with a bit of a strange look on his face. It wasn't hard to find her destination. A familiar servant greeted them and showed them up the stairs to a side room. The castle's main keep was in good shape, but not big enough to get lost in. Kiera slowed down as she approached and entered. It looked like her father was entertaining the messenger, and she saw a servant walk in holding a tray of refreshments. When she entered, she found that he was accompanied by two of his senior commanders and advisors. They all looked up as she entered, but Kiera was focused on the middle-aged man sprawled on a comfortable chair, his boots and clothes dusty from riding. Derek Zephyr, level? Thaumaturge. Kiera tried not to show her surprise. She recognized that name, although the mage appeared to have left his famous wyvern behind. She was a little surprised that Janice had apparently failed to recognize him, although she supposed that she would have had little opportunity to see or hear about him in her village. Kiera. Her father nodded at her. His clothes were immaculate, but she noticed the shadows under his brown eyes, and the gray in his dark hair looked more pronounced today than usual. Take a seat. She bowed her head and pulled out one of the chairs while Janice quietly took up a position at the wall of the room a few steps behind her. Sir Derek, it is a pleasure to meet you, she said. The man grunted. I'm not a knight. Kiera shrugged slightly. It had been a polite courtesy, but he was said to be blunt and not fond of honeyed words. She didn't let it faze her. This is my daughter, Lady Kiera, her father introduced her, rather unnecessarily. The heir to the Lynn's March. Oh, right. Derek sat up a little straighter, although his tone was still casual. I heard that there was bad news for your family. 
Lady Lynn's had a miscarriage, if I'm not mistaken. Again. The Marquis nodded, his expression a little stiffer now. Yes, that is correct. You have my condolences. It must be quite upsetting. Yes, we are all quite sad, but we will bear with it. Derek looked at her, and she saw a glint in his eyes, what might be amusement or irony, as he raised an eyebrow slightly. Kiara narrowed her eyes. She found it hard to pretend to be sad that her mother still hadn't born a son for her father. And why shouldn't she? She'd been raised as her father's heir since she was a child. If her parents had a son, he would inherit the title instead. A newborn babe would be considered her better, regardless of all those years of experience and expectation, just because it was male. Kiera certainly didn't want her mother to suffer, but she hoped she would simply have no more pregnancies. At least that was not unlikely at her age. Regardless, Derek said after a moment, turning his attention back fully to her father. I didn't come here for family drama, M. Lord. The king sent me. The Marquis sat up a little straighter, and Kiera felt her attention sharpen as well. It was an open secret that her father and the king did not see eye to eye. That he sent such a strong messenger was not a good sign. Of course, her father replied. If you brought a message, I would read it right away. No need. It's a verbal message. Derek's lips twitched slightly, but she wasn't sure if it was a smile or a smirk. Then, we're all ears. His Majesty wishes to inquire about the number of soldiers you sent him. It is known that there are far more fighting men in this march. He is dissatisfied with your contribution and expects you to promptly rectify the matter. Kiera saw her father stiffen slightly, although he kept his face blank. We need men here to cover the march. In case it escaped you, we share a border with the elves. I sent His Majesty the soldiers I could spare, and no fewer than many other lords, according to my correspondence. Of course your need for fighters to cover your lands is clear, although we expect most of the fighting to happen in Nerlian parts. Derek leaned forward slightly. Still, you should have more men. Is your march not well populated? Do you expect me to draft every village hunter? To use barely trained, underleveled conscripts? There was an angry glint in his eyes now. The harvest is not far off either. Men I send to the war are unlikely to be back and able to work during harvest season. Derek shrugged, casually leaning back. I am simply passing on His Majesty's words. There's more, isn't there? Kiera cut in. She frowned at the mage. What do we need to gather this many fighters for? He nodded, giving her an approving look that didn't make Kiera feel any less angry. She couldn't help but think that the king was deliberately giving them a greater burden, just out of pettiness, or maybe to weaken them and cripple their ability to rebel against him. You are correct, the thaumaturge said. His majesty also commands you to start pushing into the forest. You do, as the marquis just pointed out, share a border with the elves. While the major part of the fighting will be on Nerlia's side, it will be helpful to put some pressure on them from here. We want them to know they cannot expose their borders. To that end, you will launch some raids and a few deep strikes into elven territory. More will not be needed. The king is reasonable. Kiera's father stood up. Judging by the pulsing vein on his forehead, he did not find his liege particularly reasonable. You are asking for more men and also want me to send fighters into the forest after the elves? That will expose the march if we don't get any reinforcements. You are asking too much. Derek Zephyr stood up as well, slowly. It emphasized that he was taller than the Marquis. Slowly, he laid his hands on the table between them. Let us get one thing straight, Marquis Linz. I am not asking for anything. Your lord and king is commanding your obedience. The marquis sputtered. This is a brazen, dash. Kiera stood up as well, taking a step back before she caught herself. Zephyr suddenly seemed to loom larger than before. His hair stood up slightly and sparks crackled around him, off his skin and in the air surrounding him. The shadows in the room seemed to deepen as he appeared backlit by a menacing light in alternating brightness and darkness. 
but all of that was mere theater that only emphasized the magical aura emanating from the thaumaturge, which suddenly seemed to fill the room like a thick, cloying fog. Kiera drew in a shuddering breath. She did not usually consider herself a weak person and she was even proud of her magical senses, for a level 15 arcane warrior. But this moment showed her how very far she still had to go. You will do as you are told, the thaumaturge said, and his voice thundered through the room, shaking the tapestries on the walls, with an echo that grated in her ears, feeling like it ripped at her skin and the mana beneath it. After a long moment, the light brightened slightly and his voice was a little less thundering as he continued, or you will not like the consequences of your faithlessness. Silence hovered in the room, no less heavy than what had preceded it. Kiera's father and the king's man stared at each other. Until finally, the marquis reacted, moving his head in a jerky nod. Of course we will, he said. Good. The mage sat back down, smiling, suddenly cordial again. I will have to take advantage of your hospitality for one night and then leave tomorrow. My power is needed where the actual war will take place. Of course, you will not be left to your own devices out here, never fear. For the rest of the meeting, Kiera found it hard to focus. Luckily, it did not drag on for long. Her father and Derek Zephyr made some more strained conversation, before the thaumaturge excused himself with smiling eyes and a short bow. We have a lot of things to organize, her father finally said, glancing at the door as if to make sure their guest was really gone. We'll need to assemble the rest of the commanders. Let them know we will meet in half an hour. Kiara, please make sure the servants know to look after our visitor properly. Kiara nodded and turned around to leave. She'd almost forgotten that Janice was in the room, too. The young mage peeled off the wall and followed her out quietly. They walked in silence for a short while. Kiera took a detour to a small balcony that opened onto a walkway around the keep, taking a deep breath of the fresh air. You're from the village closest to the great forest, aren't you? She finally said, turning to her companion. How dangerous is it? Janice looked concerned. I've only ever been to the outskirts. Its stronger monsters were called in the monster horde, but they were already trickling back. Farther in, there are far more powerful ones. The elven city is also said to have impenetrable defenses. Kiera grimaced, but nodded. All right. At least we won't have to assault it. She shook her head. We'll send raiding parties into the forest, of course. We'll need to send quite a few fighters. But those might actually profit from the opportunity to earn levels. Jana still looked hesitant worrying at her lip as if she was trying to chew on further words. What is it, Janice? Kiera asked. If you have something else to say, please do so. The red-haired mage hesitated, then seemed to gather herself. Milady, monsters, and elves aren't the only things we might meet in the forest. Chapter 38, Information and Deliberation The discovery of monsters in the tunnel set back their plans, but it could have gone worse. A few of the warriors investigated, and Regina sent some war drones as well, since those were smaller and better able to fit through tight tunnels. It turned out that the tunnelers they'd encountered seemed to be either an isolated group or some distance away from their main group. The tunnels they had dug were a rather haphazard warren no more than a few hundred meters long in total. There were two very narrow tunnels leading farther off into the distance, but Regina simply had them closed off. The workers were easily able to handle it. With their ability, they produced some reinforced compressed dirt that they used to brick off these tunnels, melding it into the surrounding earth. Still, Regina insisted on some warriors staying close to keep an eye on things. From now on, there would be at least two warriors there whenever they worked on the tunnels, and several war drones posted nearby at all times. They could even help with the digging, so it wasn't a total loss, even if it did hurt the hive's productivity. Regina wasn't discouraged by the discovery of underground monsters, though. If nothing else, it indicated there could be more to find underground, not just danger, but also opportunity. Still, their levels seemed to be higher than those of the surface monsters in the area, unless they'd just had the bad luck of encountering an exceptionally strong group. Comprehensive exploration could wait until her hive was stronger. In the meantime, she got a bit more practice in with her new spell. 
She also used this occasion to finally ask the warriors to bring some injured monsters back alive if possible. Not only would that allow her to further practice and perhaps improve her healing, but it was worth trying if they could use it to level other drones. She was a little skeptical, since it seemed the system rewarded effort and true accomplishments more than just kills, but with her new healing spell, they at least had a safety net in case things went wrong. Of course, this was still easier said than done. The warriors were all eager to please, but bringing back injured monsters took some doing, and she emphasized that she did not want them to put themselves into unnecessary danger. Her eggs were still in development, which limited how much mana she could use, but at least she didn't need to conjure as much stuff now that they had some things to work with. The day after the fight, Regina spent some time walking around the settlement, checking on everything, making sure things ran smoothly, and taking note of what they needed. Max trailed along behind her for most of the way. He seemed content to leave the training of the other warriors and workers, to Tim. Regina didn't send him away, though. She liked his company, and he spoke up when he saw a problem. After she was done with her rounds, which didn't take too long, since their burgeoning village was still very small, she settled down by the main campfire and waited. She checked on Tim and B and could tell that they would be back very soon. Their elven companions had already departed, leaving them to return to the hive on their own. Regina used the time to glance at her status screen. Regina. Hive Queen. Level, 13. Mana, 203 of 420. Hive, 10 4. Swarm, 16 30ths, 0. Con, 12. STR, 12. Dex, 12. End, 12. Int, 16. Wis, 16, plus 1. Her mana had risen in tandem with the growth of her hive, especially with all the war drones. She still hadn't quite figured out how its cap increased. It probably depended on other factors, besides the number and types of her drones. Maybe there was a soft cap at certain levels. Still, she was pretty sure she had a large mana pool for her level. The caps for her hive were also rising, and the one for swarm drones was quickly catching up with the one for sapient drones. It didn't take long for them to hatch. Regina stood up as soon as she sensed the change and made her way towards the edge of the forest. They'd kept storing the eggs in the most sturdy of their old shelters, since they were still building more actual houses. Or at least huts. The drones had gotten free of their eggs and were already outside by the time she came. Regina paused, then grinned. There was one drone warrior, one drone worker, and one drone scout, as expected. But this time, the warrior actually seemed female. She paused to consider that development while Max started greeting his new hivemates. There seemed to have been a specific gender distribution, and she'd been quietly worried about that. It was good to see this apparently wasn't an absolute. Welcome, kids, she said after a moment, stepping forward and smiling at them. I'm Regina, and this is our hive. It's still quite new, but we're happy to have you. Your names are. She hesitated for a moment. Did she want to go with her current pattern of three-letter, single-syllable names for boys and two-syllable words for girls or for warriors and workers? Well, it really didn't matter. Amy, she pointed at the worker, Ash, at the male scout, and Zoe, at the female warrior. How long are you going to be able to keep that up? Max asked in a quiet murmur. Probably not long, she admitted. We still haven't named the hive, either. It could just be referred to as the hive or maybe Regina's hive, but a proper name would be good at some point. Max glanced around. Perhaps everyone could offer suggestions for a hive name? Don't you trust my naming sense? She mock pouted at him. Max opened his mouth, then closed it again. It's going to be hard to find a cool, meaningful name with just three letters. Don't be silly, Max, a hive isn't a drone. She watched silently as other drones came by to greet the new hatchlings. Max helped, as well, offering them a quick tour while he explained some things. Regina felt as if maybe she should be doing that herself but in truth, the other drones were probably better suited to it. It didn't take long for Tim and B to return. Regina went to greet them, 
then gathered around the fire with the two to listen to a more detailed recounting of their trip. Tim did most of the talking, with Bee taking over the more technical stuff related to her field. Regina listened quietly, trying to make sure she remembered it well. This is going to be very useful, she said as they finished. The political implications aside, we should be able to build up our hive better, and we need various crafts for it. I was already considering building a water wheel, anyway. I examined the one they showed us, my queen, B said, but I'm not sure that's enough to reproduce one entirely. We'll figure it out, Regina replied confidently. Or you workers will, anyway. Speaking of implications, Tim spoke up. They didn't have much on old history, but I noticed that there didn't seem to be any reference to anything more than a few centuries ago. A thousand years, tops. Regina nodded slowly. That is interesting. Although, given the cultural and technological level around here, I'm not sure if I would have expected them to develop writing or proper historical record-keeping that long ago, anyway. The elves do seem to have a democratic system, he said. For the most part, at least. Fair enough. Did you find out anything more about religion? Tim exchanged a glance with B, before he nodded. Yes. I did find a few mentions of the names you told us to look out for. Apparently, Alien Eyes and Benaren are both major gods in this pantheon. Although the latter is, uh, not exactly beloved, I think? Someone called him the god of monsters. Really? Regina leaned forward slightly. That sounds interesting. To be fair, I don't think that's actually his official title or anything. According to a section of a book I read that was written by a priest, he's the god of struggle. And there were like two different books that mentioned he's supposed to be responsible for the monster hordes, be added. Huh. Regina frowned. That does hang together, at least. This was just one more thing to ask about and try to find information on. At least, if he was a patron of monsters or something, it made some sense why he might be keeping an eye on them. Unless she was misinterpreting things. Although, having a god of struggle paying special attention to you might not be the best thing. She shook her head. And the other one? Alien eyes? Tim looked down. I didn't find anything specific, he said. She was mentioned a few times, but it sounds like everyone would know, and I didn't have the time to look for more details, since I also wanted to get other information. That's all right, Regina assured him. I don't think there's any hurry. Let me just call some of the others in, and then we can go over the information again in detail. She closed her eyes for a moment and focused on her connection to her drones. She contacted Max, Ben, the two older scouts, and the rest of the workers and told them to come. That would lead Dan, the new guys, and the war drones to keep an eye on things, like the tunnels. The drones came quickly, gathering close to the campfire. Regina smiled at them and stood up to greet them. Tim and B just came back from the elven city. They'll recount what they learned, especially about crafts. Please pay attention and try to remember it. Then we'll discuss what to do going forward. Everyone looked expectantly at the two drones. Tim glanced at B, who cleared her throat, then started talking. With little preamble, she dove into an account of the workshops they'd visited and what she'd seen and heard there. Regina listened closely again. From what she could tell, it sounded like the elves were indeed at a medieval level of technology in most things, but perhaps not quite. Maybe closer to Renaissance level in general? And it appeared the plastic-like substance she'd wondered about before was a special kind of tree sap they harvested from patches of the forest around the city. It had other uses in their crafting as well. They also used magic to grow wood in specific shapes and with specific properties. That seemed to be something the elves in particular specialized in, compared to humans, who preferred clay, stone, and metal, and a slightly different school of enchantment. None of that sounded very surprising to her. After that, they discussed what they wanted to do for their hive. It was mostly the workers who talked, while Regina held back and listened. There seemed to be general consensus that working metal in large amounts was out of their reach, but they should at least make some more use of the clay they had found, at least for things like storage containers. 
Wooden houses were working out well so far, and while they needed to think about long-term food production, it wasn't an immediate problem. We'll need threads and something to make fabric, at least eventually, Regina said thoughtfully. That means hemp or something. Growing that shouldn't be too troublesome here, and I'm pretty sure we can find seeds to get started. That leaves crops for food. Which ones do you want to try cultivating, my queen? Mia asked. Well, given that our metabolism is apparently a real cheat, we don't really need plants that are usually considered food crops. There should be lots of plants that grow quickly. I guess we have moss on the trees and stuff in the forest. Then there's things typically considered weeds people don't want. She considered for a moment. Maybe to start with, we should just mark out some areas where we'll let the fields grow wild and see what happens. Then we can help some of those plants along. She'd actually had two of the war drones eat nothing but grass, leaves, and weeds for over a week, and it didn't seem to have harmed them in any way. She was pretty sure their gastrointestinal tract was like that of the other drones, and probably herself, too. Hay should be easy enough to make and keep well over the winter if we have a dry place to store it, B said thoughtfully. And from now on, we'll start smoking some of the meat from hunts, Regina added, looking at the gathered drones pointedly. Mia, figure out how best to do that. We need to build a storage shed, anyway. And we can always feed scraps to the war drones. She knew that, when it came to monsters and animals they hunted, her drones usually ate pretty much everything, down to the bone marrow. Regina approved of the efficiency. In principle. She suspected they'd eat the skins, too, if the hive didn't have other uses for them. All right. Regina stood up again. You can get back to work. Actually, Tim, Ben and Ace, I have another task for you. Most of the drones dispersed, while the three she'd named remained, looking at her expectantly. I want you to take one or two war drones and travel away from the hive, she explained. It's probably best if you go roughly in the direction of the elvish city, but not directly there. Tim and Ace should be able to handle the navigation. I want you to test out what happens when war drones travel outside my control radius. Of course, my queen, Tim said. What should we be looking for, specifically? I'll give them some orders before you set out. I'd like to know if they'll keep on doing what they are, and if they'll still follow orders you give them. Plus, simply checking if the limit is the same in the first place. You can count on us, my queen, Ben said. We'll set out right away. Regina shook her head and smiled. No need, this can wait. Tim should get the chance to rest first. Besides, I want you to be at the top of your game. There might still be dangers in the forest, after all. But she didn't want to send too many warriors away from the hive, either. It was important information to get, though. And it might help her shed light on some other aspects of the way her hive and her bond to it worked like the passive transmittal of information the drones seemed to receive at the start of their life and how it worked for the non-sapient war drones. Chapter 39, Movements and Claims The nights were getting shorter. Not by much, but noticeably enough to make it clear that it was not early summer. The summer solstice was probably a few weeks past, at least. Unfortunately, a calendar wasn't one of the things Regina had thought to ask Tim and be to look out for. It was one more thing for the list. She was already planning on making a trip to the elven city herself, but before that, she needed to know that she could leave her drones by themselves if necessary. Tim and the others left with two war drones the day after he returned. There was no hurry, so she'd told them to go slowly and be careful. There might still be stronger monsters around. Ace had a detection ability that increased his hearing which should help them avoid monsters, along with their keen sense of smell, but it was better not to be reckless. Regina sat on the roof of their newest completed hut, looking out over the forest. It bore her weight without any complaints, a sure sign that her hive had gotten better at construction. The wooden shingles had been fixed in place with the worker's ability. The wind rustled through her hair, which was still short, but had grown a little in the last few weeks. She wondered if she should feel more reluctant to send her drones out like this. It might be a risk, but she felt it was worthwhile, so she hadn't dithered. They hadn't hesitated or shown any reluctance to take on the mission, either. And why would they? 
they're my drones. Regina sighed to herself. She tugged at her mandibles, then glanced down at her body. She took in the chitin-like shell, which had darkened slightly since her hatching, the vague outline of the wings folded against her body. It was easy to see why some people might call her a monster, although the real qualities that might evoke that term were mental. After her first few days, she hadn't felt like she had many problems with her hive queen instincts, or at least with integrating them with the human knowledge and impersonal memories she had. But now, this side of her felt more, prominent. That might be because she no longer had to focus on protecting her life against the monster horde or humans. It might also have something to do with establishing a proper hive. Or at least something close to it. Even now, she couldn't bring herself to be very concerned with the idea that she might be a monster. She was obviously sapient, a person, and it wasn't like she remembered a different existence to compare it to. However, the possibility that her hive queen inclinations might make her act in less than optimal ways was worrying. It was subtle. But whenever she thought about her little village and its surrounding territory, she'd inevitably feel possessive and inclined to fight whoever might try to take it from her. Actually, that feeling wasn't so different when it came to the drones. Although the very idea of someone trying to subvert them or lure them away was ridiculous. Still, she was probably a little more okay with the idea of making beings that were beholden to her than she would if she was still human. She still had some lingering attachment to the idea of humanity. Maybe it was that she knew how great they could be, capable of terrible yet also wonderful things, no matter how little the humans around here seemed to live up to that. But it was also quite easy to see them as enemies, or at least a threat. They weren't her people. And pretty much the same went for the elves. Regina shook her head again, then stood up and climbed down from the roof. She wasn't getting anywhere with these musings. She'd just have to keep them in mind and monitor her own condition and mentality. She didn't want to endanger her hive with some misplaced attachment to humans, but she also didn't want to restrict herself from what she might otherwise have or invite unnecessary problems. She focused on her connection to her hive's drones, checking up on them. Tim and his group were walking through the forest, not having encountered any monster that would be a concern to them yet. The rest of her drones were hard at work, for the most part. Regina paused as she looked through the war drones. She'd posted a few of them at various positions, to keep an eye on the hive and its surroundings. Now, she realized that one of them had moved. It was the one she'd posted the furthest from the hive, though still inside her control radius. It was at the edge of the forest, where it opened out onto fields closer to the human castle and village. She'd given it pretty detailed instructions. Now, after looking through its senses for a bit, she realized what happened. There were groups of humans around, ranging farther from the castle than before. Regina pulled back and glanced around. She mentally tabbed through her contacts until she reached Ada, then told her to come to me. It didn't take long for the scout to show up. Regina stood at the edge of the village outside a clear yard where the warriors usually trained, from where she had a good view of both the recent construction and most of the drones that were here. My queen, you summoned me? Ada asked, coming to a stop near her. Regina nodded. The war drone closest to the human settlements shows that there is increased activity there. Obviously, I only got a short snapshot of it, but it seems like there might be something more going on. Her eyes widened. You think they might be preparing to send troops into the forest? Regina shrugged. I don't know. What would you think about sending you there to find out more? Ada chewed on her lip for a moment. It would take me quite a while to get there, my queen, even if I traveled as quickly as I can. I'm also not quite sure what I could really do. In fact, it might be best to recall that drone, too. Regina frowned. You think that they might discover you, or it? I'm afraid so. They must have high-level people with powerful abilities. If they're sending teams into the forest, or just near it to watch it more closely, it would be hard to hide. Agreed. Regina rubbed at her temple and sighed. All right. I'll order it to come back as stealthily as possible. However, I'd still like you to go out a bit. Not too far from the hive. But take a look at the area facing Cernlia, and keep alert for any signs of visitors. 
Of course, my queen, right away. Regina shook her head as she watched Ada go. Left unsaid was that they couldn't hope to hide their presence here if it came down to it. If the humans actually started looking, they'd find them. She checked on Ada frequently as the young scout moved out. Ada traveled in curves and meandering paths across the forest and around the lake, in the general direction of the human castle. She didn't seem to find anything out of the ordinary, just the usual monsters going about their business. Even the stronger ones in the area seemed to have learned not to come too close to the hive by now. The rest of the day, Regina found it hard to focus as she kept checking on her drones outside the hive. Luckily, there wasn't much for her to do. She mostly observed the warriors' training and sometimes participated a bit herself. They'd found out that training did help you level, just not as much as actual combat for your life. Still, she usually sent out a warrior with a group of war drones to level them up fighting weaker monsters, although she decided to keep them nearby for now. The swarm drones were usually too weak to take on even a low-level monster individually, but as the name implied, they worked in groups. Regina had done some tests over the last days and realized that the way they shared experience in a group differed from the other drones. As best she could tell, a war drone would get experience from a fight its group was in even if it didn't fight at all itself, like a party experience share mechanic. They still wouldn't get as much experience if they took down a monster as part of a group as if they did it alone, but it seemed like there was a mechanic that would grant war drones, and possibly other types of swarm drones once she had them, some bonus experience from others. That made it easier to level them up than she had feared. A smaller group of war drones kept fighting monsters through the night, since Regina didn't want to lose any time leveling them. She woke up once in the middle of the night and checked on Ada, who had holed herself up on a good perch in the crown of a tree a few kilometers away. She'd leveled up again at some point, reaching level 8, probably from fighting a few monsters during her trip. The next morning, Regina checked the hive's tunnel system. It was growing quickly, and Tia had even started working on the tunnel that would lead back to the center of the village, although that would take some time to complete. It also needed careful thought, since they wanted it to be hidden, as well as protected against flooding and other problems. The sun had only just started getting some distance from the horizon when her newest scout, Ash, came to find her. He looked like he had run the whole way there from his patrol. On the training field not far away, Max immediately stopped what he was doing and started heading over. My queen, there are people coming, Ash gasped. Regina paused. She glanced in the direction he came from, but couldn't see anything else yet, just forest. Really? Where? Who? Roughly the direction of the human land, my queen. At least five humans, maybe more. I think they saw me. Regina cursed. She closed her eyes for a moment and focused on Ada. The other scout didn't seem worried, but kept walking through the forest, looking around. Ash says humans are coming. Did you see any sign of them? Ada stopped and she could feel her surprise. Humans at the hive? No, my queen, I didn't see anything. The animals might be a bit more agitated than normal, but I thought that was just my presence. They must have passed me. Regina shook her head and suppressed another curse, then turned her attention back to her surroundings. She noticed that Max had already sent a war drone to the other drones in the tunnels, and called the warriors to assemble. She picked out a few warriors, the two younger workers, and some war drones, and told them to hide in their buildings. The last of them barely got inside before the humans arrived. They traveled so quickly that Regina didn't have much warning before they'd emerged from the trees and were almost at their houses. She shook off her surprise and stepped towards them, Max at her side and the other warriors clustered around them while the workers stayed back. There were eight humans, most of them wearing some kind of armor and all of them carrying weapons, from swords to pikes to warhammers, small-looking ones, so they couldn't have absurd strength. They had different classes, mostly ones Regina hadn't seen before. There were only two people whose level she could see. One of them was a level 12 rogue but it was the other one that captured her attention for a moment, a young man in cloth armor with a patchy blonde beard. Gavin Barkel, level 13 cleric of alien eyes. One of the human men stepped forward, and her attention returned to him. This one seemed to be the leader. 
He was massive and had what looked like half an armory slung across his back and on his belt, above burnished plate mail. Ulrich, level? Weapon master. Hello, she greeted him carefully. He nodded at her, sweeping his gaze across them. Demi-humans, he greeted them curtly. As you might know, there is currently a war between the local elven tribesmen and the kingdom of Cernlia. We answer to the lord of the local lands, Marquis Linz. Nice to meet you, Regina answered. We did hear about that, however, we're not involved in this war. The man frowned. If you've settled here, you must have made agreements with the elves. Additionally, you apparently use some goods of elven make. Regina blinked and then looked at her drones. Some of them were holding the tools they'd gotten from the elves as improvised weapons. Then there was a bundle of cloth still lying at the entrance of a house, and some of their clothes made from rough cuts of it. And what if we had, she asked cautiously. I must inform you that you are occupying a spot of strategic importance, he informed her. She had the impression he wasn't used to speaking in that way. Furthermore, this place, like the surrounding area, is claimed by the kingdom, which means you are squatting. Regina frowned. Oh, really? She almost growled. Some of the humans moved their hands to their weapons. Others already half drew them. She took a deep breath and made herself calm down. Yes. Really, he drawled. We didn't see any indication of that, she said in a more even tone of voice. In fact, there hasn't been a human within kilometers of here at all, as far as we know. If this place was so important to your kingdom, you'd think it would be secured in some way. Ulrich frowned thunderously. I assure you, this is the case. Regina cocked her head. Why should we believe this? In fact, she was pretty sure the elves could produce some kind of claim on the area, too, though they had obviously given it to her hive. She didn't think mentioning that would help, though. Are you calling me a liar? The human pulled a sword half out of its sheath. Regina shrugged, trying to appear calm. I'm just saying that this is an easy claim to make. I don't mean to question your word. It's not personal. But anyone could come and say something like this. The humans muttered, clearly not mollified. You do not intend to leave, then, he asked. Now she stared at him, not saying anything else. Inwardly, she raged. How dare these idiots come and try to chase me out of my territory? I see. He met her stare for a while longer, before he looked aside and turned, holstering his weapon again. You will be hearing from the kingdom again. Regina released a breath she hadn't known she was holding as she watched the humans turn to leave. Most of them didn't release their grip on their weapons, though. She could sense her drones behind her relaxing, content the threat to the hive had been driven off for now. She turned and met Max's gaze, sharing a look. Then suddenly, something prickled at the back of her neck. Regina whirled around again, just in time to see that the humans had turned. One of them, a higher-level shaman, she vaguely remembered, had his hand raised and was clearly using some kind of spell or ability. Then she grew dizzy, and her vision spotty. Regina inhaled to shout a warning to her drones, but she couldn't seem to get enough air. She lost her balance, blinked and tried to stand up, but the ground rushed to meet her. Darkness crashed over her. Chapter 40, The Brazen Blades When Regina came to, it was like bobbing to the surface in a murky morass of water, still partly submerged. Somehow, she managed to not move and instead try to clear up the murk in her mind. Thinking felt harder than it should be, as if she was still dragged down by the aftereffects of her sleep but she felt intimately that she was in danger. Judging by the pressure and temperature she felt, she was clearly lying down, probably outside or in an open room like one of their huts. There were some sounds around her and a variety of smells. In her current state, she found it hard to sort them all out. She tried to keep her breathing regular while she got her bearings and didn't open her eyes to look. After a moment, she focused on the psychic link to her hive that connected her to her drones. She quickly realized that most of them were relatively close to her, and feeling agitated. To her relief, it seemed all of them were accounted for. She checked on those outside. Ada was moving, and a quick dive deeper into her consciousness showed that she was going back towards the hive. 
Then Regina switched to Tim's group. They were also moving. The war drones were with them, and since they were back within her radius, she could sense and control them easily. Be careful, she told Tim, feeling him freeze up for a moment. There were a group of eight humans coming to the hive, trying to tell us to leave. They attacked us somehow, and seem to be in control of the settlement right now. Make sure that they don't catch you. Of course, my queen, Tim murmured. She sensed his heart rate increase as the others with him sent him concerned looks. I'll be in touch. After that, Regina quickly contacted Ada and told her the same thing. She also gave the scout her best guess for the position of Tim and the others, although they were probably still a lot further away. Then Regina gathered herself and dove into Max's mind. Immediately, she felt the pain he was in, although it only seemed to come from bruises, no serious injuries. Max was with a group of other drones and currently staring at three of the human fighters. Regina recognized the outside of the huts, telling her everyone's position. Hey, she whispered into his mind. Try not to react. It's probably better if you don't try to talk to me, at least out loud. I just woke up, and I have little idea what's going on. Can you look around a bit for me? Max froze and held his breath for a moment as she contacted him, but it wasn't very noticeable, considering he'd been still before. Then he slowly let his gaze wander around his surroundings, giving her a better view of everything. At the same time, he focused on a few images and concepts. She could almost feel him willing them towards her. It was like trying to read a letter through a pane of milky glass, but Regina still caught some of the emotions accompanying it, at least. It was clear to her that the humans had managed to take the settlement without much of a fight, probably because of that knockout attack. It had to be either gas or some ability reminiscent of it. It was also possible that it had a shorter range, but that the humans had cowed the hive by essentially taking her hostage. Most likely a mix of both, they'd taken out the ones closest to her, including Max and the stronger warriors, and made the rest submit. If Regina hadn't been affected, if she hadn't been in reach of the humans, she knew the drones would have fought to the death to protect her. But they weren't berserkers and could weigh risks and danger. At least the war drones appeared to have followed the remaining one's orders and stood down. Although, now that she paid closer attention to it, she could tell that three of the war drones were indeed dead. She couldn't sense them in her hive, and she caught a glimpse of their bodies piled to the side. Regina internally shook her head and suppressed the surge of anger she felt, then focused on other drones. She picked out Mia's mind and dove into it. It's me, try not to show any reaction, she thought at her. Please carefully show me more of your situation. Don't respond aloud. Mia did the same as Max and moved her head a little, glancing over her surroundings. At the same time, she focused on certain images that explained what happened. All right, I'll be in touch again, Regina said. Be ready to move when I tell you to. Then she repeated the same with Tia, who had a harder time sitting still and not doing anything. After that, she moved to Dan and the other drones. Regina was still trying to work her way through the hive and establish contact with everyone when she was interrupted. She was just about to dive into the mind of the next drone, Ina, when she realized that there was increasing noise in her vicinity. She pulled back into her own mind and tried to sort out the sounds and smells, then quickly jumped her focus into Tia so she actually had a view of what was going on. A small group of humans were approaching her. She was still lying out in the open between their houses, with some of the other drones in her sights if she'd opened her eyes. Half of the humans seemed to be on guard duty, but two of them had turned their heads and were watching. Their leader, Ulrich, headed the group, accompanied also by Gavin Barkel and the shaman Oswald Oak. Under other circumstances, she might have felt sorry for anyone with such a name. Considering he'd knocked her out so they could capture her hive, though, she had to force herself to calm down and not try and jump them. She's still out? Oak asked. The effect doesn't usually last that long. You think their bodies are particularly susceptible or something? She's probably feigning, Ulrich said with a shrug. Then he kicked her. It was odd to feel while most of her attention was somewhere else. Regina still couldn't suppress a grunt of pain. She found her focus Jared back into her own body. She opened her eyes, blinking once, then sat up slowly while she glared at the man. 
At least Ulrich stepped back to let her up. Is this the kind of honor we should expect from you and your lord's men? She asked acerbically. Ulrich grimaced slightly and shrugged. As we informed you before, this land belongs to the kingdom. If you had complied right away, this wouldn't be necessary. You should be glad we're trying to minimize unnecessary loss of life. So you didn't kill any of the drones, she asked with a raised eyebrow. Three of the small creatures died, he admitted readily. Their own fault for attacking us. They're mindless animals, aren't they? Right, they don't have names in the system, Regina realized. She shrugged. They're valuable livestock, she lied. Considering their appearance and name, it was probably easy to see they weren't used as normal cattle, but she figured it didn't matter too much. Their loss is not trivial. I don't expect you'll compensate me. He snorted, and she heard one of the men farther away chuckle. Regina looked at them with narrowed eyes. There were only eight of them. She still had about twenty drones here, although admittedly, most of those were war drones. Still, in terms of pure stats, at least, she was sure they could handle the humans easily if they ganged up on them. She just didn't know enough about their abilities. And they would need a good opening to strike, if that really was the best idea. We haven't been given any real orders on what to do with you, Ulrich said. Which means it's up to my latitude. You're a curiosity, so it might be fun to take you inland and see what the lords and learned sirs have to say. I'm sure the Delvers might express an interest, too. If you behave, I might just set you free somewhere in the southern forest and let you run away. Regina glared at him. She was pretty sure he was overstepping his authority, at least in the spirit of his orders, if not the letter. Still, she didn't know how things worked with them in practice. You're just Sel's words, aren't you? Oak glanced away, but Ulrich just chuckled. We used to be the Brazen Blades, one of the best adventuring groups you'll find operating out of the march. The war had need for swords, though, so we found our patriotism and signed up. So, you see, we're not going to be the last people they send into the forest. You should count yourself lucky it was us that ran into you. Regina stared at him, not amused. I don't have anything to pay you with, if that's what you're looking for. He grinned and shook his head. Let no one say old Ulrich isn't an honest businessman. That's not really an option, though, is it? We wouldn't betray our noble lord to render aid to an enemy. Are you sure they don't have any valuables? Someone else called from a few meters away. A few of the other fighters chuckled. Stop messing around, the cleric finally spoke up. We're here for a reason. Right you are, Barkel, Ulrich agreed. He stooped a little to get closer to Regina's eye level. We need information on the elves. Tell us about your dealings with them. Regina spoke before she'd made any sort of conscious decision. Go fuck yourselves. There was a moment of silence. Ulrich grinned again, but there was nothing nice in it. Looks like our little lady isn't such a lady after all. What do you expect from monster bloods, right? A few of the others shot him dirty looks, including the shaman. Ulrich either didn't notice or ignored them as he continued, telling her, that's not an acceptable answer. He reached out and slapped her. It looked casual, but the force of it wrenched Regina's head back and stinging pain spread through her face. She could practically feel the bloodthirst coming from her drones. She had to take a moment to dive into the link and order them to calm down. Maybe some time reflecting on your choices will do you good, the man said. Belle, make sure she's nice and secure. Another man, an earthen shield she hadn't paid much attention to, held up a hand and Regina felt a bit of mana coming from him. Then the ground underneath her wobbled and she felt herself sinking down. She grit her teeth and simply observed what happened as closely as she could. After a long minute, she was entombed in the earth almost up to her neck. The hole conformed to her body roughly, but still left a gap, so she still had a bit of wiggle room. Not enough to climb out, though. The humans turned away from her and went back to whatever they were doing. Clearly, they intended to camp here overnight, perhaps for several nights. Regina closed her eyes and conserved her strength. She could be patient. The sun moved across the sky, while she and her drone stayed put. 
Regina put her war drones into what she called hibernation mode, which made them completely still, their minds almost emptying, but not actually asleep. The other drones had a bit more trouble, but at least they were able to move enough to let their blood circulate properly. The humans had tied up a few of them, the ones with the highest levels, but clearly hadn't had enough rope for everyone. With the drone's blade arms, Regina didn't think it would be difficult to free them. A drone warrior was never really disarmed. Well, unless they were literally disarmed. Then she sensed the slight sensation in her mana that told her another drone was awakening. Regina didn't move and hoped that their captors wouldn't notice. Unfortunately, her hopes were quickly dashed. One of the men stood close to the shelters and called out as soon as he heard the egg shell cracking. Hey, that egg is breaking. I think one of them is coming. Like those lizard monsters, you remember? As Ulrich and a few others hurried over, Regina sighed. She sent her mind into the new drone's mind, trying to establish a proper connection. Your name is Ivy, she thought with all the intensity she could muster. She repeated the thought firmly until she sensed the drone stepping out of the shelter. Don't struggle, she added. It seemed to work. There was some back and forth too low for her to make out, before the humans returned and dragged the drone to the others. Regina only got a look in passing. Ivy, drone harvester level 1. The harvester looked a bit like the workers, but the distribution of her shell seemed to be a little different. She had one scythe-like blade on one of her extra limbs. It looked a bit like the warriors, but set at a different angle. After a moment, Regina realized she could adjust it, making the blade have a sharp angle like a proper scythe or be straighter and more of a weapon. The other limb had a more complicated tool she couldn't make much sense of. The humans gathered again to discuss the just-hatched drone and what it meant, with some of their posted guards changing. Regina closed her eyes and pretended to ignore them while she actually listened in through the closest drone. They quickly resolved to report their finding to their superiors and Ulrich ordered a more thorough search of the camp to find any hidden eggs. The sun was starting to sink by now, and the air grew slightly chillier. Regina checked in on the progress of her drones. Ada had linked up with Tim and the others by now, and they were approaching the hive. They were pushing heavily, moving at a pace their two war drones could barely sustain. Finally, Regina made a decision and ordered them to leave those behind and hurry back. All of the sapient drones in the group had relatively high endurance stats, which meant they could cover the distance quicker than a normal human. The war drones would slow them down. The humans started a fire in their fireplace and started drinking some kind of alcohol they had brought. They still kept half of their people on watch at all times, though. By this time, Regina's legs had started to ache and she wished she could just sit down. Finally, at least a few hours later, their fire burned down and Ulrich and a few others visited her again. It was night now, the air chilly enough Regina wished she was closer to the fire, while her drones huddled together for warmth. But the stars in the cloudless sky, the mostly full moon and the fire provided her enough light to easily see. Have you changed your mind yet? Ulrich asked as he stood in front of her. Regina had to crane her head back to look at his face. I couldn't tell you much about the elves even if I wanted to, she said. You're not exactly making a case for your benevolence or trustworthiness, either, you know. He sighed and crouched down. You could either spend the rest of the night and tomorrow like this, or you could have a nice blanket and sleep with your clan, until we let you go far away from this conflict. Oh, this isn't so bad. He stared at her, as if he was trying to intimidate her with his gaze. Regina stared back. Finally, Ulrich shook his head and sat down. He still seemed to tower over her. If you insist on making this difficult. Barkel, you're up. The young cleric seemed a bit nervous, but he nodded and knelt on the ground next to his leader. A faint light started to rise from his hands. What are you doing? Regina asked. She allowed some of the nervousness she was feeling into her voice. If they thought she might crack, they might give her more information. Just a bit of divine magic to help you see things clearly, Ulrich said with a smirk. Why don't you just start talking? This isn't going to hurt her, right? Oak muttered beside them. Ulrich shot him a glare that clearly told him to shut up. 
The light in the cleric's hands intensified for a moment and he leaned forward. But then it suddenly exploded into a bright flash. Regina winced. She felt a sensation like her ears were popping under pressure, but it had a faint resonance in her mana senses, too. After a moment, she saw that Barkel wasn't leaning forward towards her anymore. He wasn't channeling the spell, either. Instead, he had collapsed to the ground, tucked into himself. What's this? Ulrich asked, standing and drawing a sword in the blink of an eye. Backlash, Oak muttered. After a moment of hesitation, he crouched down, beside the cleric. He's still alive. But, dash. He messed up the spell? That kid. Regina eyed him curiously. It seemed like her opening would be closer than she'd hoped for. The shaman shook his head. No, his channel was perfect. He hesitated and glanced at her. He gulped. From what I've heard, this is more like, well, I guess alien eyes didn't approve of what he was trying to do. Regina laughed. 